gushing, both gesturing with their hands in motions that look like maneuvers. There's a sheen of excitement in Rhiannon's quick smile, and I find myself mirroring it. She looks happy. Maybe they're finally going to let us fly farther than a half hour. You know, without making us hike up the cliffs of Draylor after, Riddick remarks. Gods, I miss flying. That would be nice, Sawyer agrees, shooting me a teasing smirk. Not all of us get to take a pleasure flight to Corden, you know. Hey, that joyride got us a luminary. I glance meaningfully at the sheet at his side, which holds an alloy-hilted dagger. One for one. That was the deal Brennan struck with the assembly when it came to supplying the drifts, and we finally made enough to equip every rider in Eurasia with multiple daggers. Listen up, second squad, Rhiannon says, looking over our group. Our mission is simple. You know the summoning runes Trissa has been working on with us? Even the first years nod. They might not be able to weave runes, but at least they know what they are which means they're a step ahead of where we were last year. There are 30 of them hidden within 20 miles along the Western Range. This isn't just a test for us, but for our dragons to sense them. Can you, Taren growls in response. Point made. Winner gets a weekend pass. No training, no homework, no limits. She glances at Bragan, whose lips twitch into a smile. We've been given permission to fly wherever we want. If your griffin feels comfortable flying the cliff wall, that means you can go anywhere. He looks at Kat, even Corden. Though you'd only have a few hours there before you'd have to start the flight back. If you win, of course. Oh, we're winning, Marin says, shoulder bumping Kat the same way Rhiannon does me. Good, you want that pass? We'll need to find and close more of those ruined boxes than they do. She nods back toward claw and tail sections. They return, Taren says as wing beats fill the sky. I look up, a slow smile spreading at the sight of Sigale soaring overhead with Crod and eight other dragons. But I only recognize the three bonded to Heaton, Emery, and Sienna. Zayden's home, with a full riot of ten. I'm guessing you got your way with the new structure, I ask Zayden as they land behind our line of griffins and dragons. Taren breaks away, as if we aren't about to be sent on a training mission. Bragan and I will divide you up into groups of four according to your abilities, Rhiannon continues. In a way, Zayden answers, executing a perfect dismount and walking toward us. My pulse leaps and the worry that seems to live in my chest lifts a fraction when I don't see any new injuries or blood. Sorengale, you paying attention? Re calls me out. My head swivels back to the front of formation, where she's arching an eyebrow at me. Teams of four, split by ability, I repeat with a nod, then give her a blatantly beseeching look that absolutely abuses her status as my best friend. We'll have an hour once we launch. Bragan says. Go, re mouths once the squad's attention is on him. I smile in thanks, then step out of formation and walk past Andarna and Fierge over the trampled grass straight to Zayden. The scruff on his jaw is thick with days of growth, and there are circles under his eyes as he reaches forward, surprising me by tugging me against his chest in front of all of Fourth Wing. The cold beard tickles as he buries his icy face in my neck and breathes deeply. I've missed you. Same. I wind my arms around his torso, sliding my hands in the space between the swords he wears crossed at his back and his flight jacket. Then hold tight to help warm him. I need to talk to you. Bad news? He pulls back and searches my eyes. No, just news that's best shared when there's time to discuss. His brow knits. Good to see you, Vi, Garrick says as he walks by, tapping me on the shoulder. You definitely need to make him tell you about the venom he took down just outside Drathus. You what? My stomach pitches sideways. Thanks for that, asshole, Zayden glares at Garrick. 
Just doing my part to help your communication skills thrive in a stable relationship. Garrick turns and walks backward, lifting his hands in a shrug. Like you have any room to talk about stable relationships, Imogen counters from behind him, the squad formation obviously having broken to ready for the mission. I'm gonna skip the obvious pun to be made about plenty of mares in my stable. He flashes a grin, then turns and heads toward the path at the end of the valley. Seeing as I'm no longer a cadet, but a mature, responsible officer. She scoffs as he walks by. We need to go, Sorengale. You took down a venom? I pivot, keeping my attention on Zayden. Outside Draethus? It's the last Peromish stronghold before the cliffs of Draylor. You have lengthy news to discuss, he replies, lifting his brows. Are you all right? I slide my hands to his face, scanning him like that tiny bit of exposed skin will tell me if the other 95% is unharmed. Being able to raise the wards won't mean anything if he isn't safe. At least it won't mean anything to me. News? His eyes narrow. Violet, Rhiannon calls. I have to fly out, I drop my hands reluctantly. And he catches one in his as I retreat a step. We'll talk when I get back. Tell me now. The wing leader voice doesn't work on me. I squeeze his hand and let go. His eyes flare. You figured out how to raise the wards. I blink, then scowl. I hate it when you do that. Is my face really that easy to read? To me, yes. He looks toward the rocky path that leads down to Ryerson House. We should go now. How long will it take to raise them? No, I shake my head and turn toward my squad, seeing Sloane, Vicia, and Kat clearly waiting for me. Guess I don't need to ask where I've been assigned. We'll talk about it later. Discussion paused. At least tell me what was missed the first time. Zayden quickly catches up to me. Dragons. I pat Endarna's foreleg as we approach the trio of waiting cadets. The six most powerful refers to dragons, not riders. In that case, I can have them up before you get back. No, you can't. I shoot him a glare. Are you two fighting silently? Kat asks, glancing between Zayden and me, her perfectly arched brows rising slowly. They do that, Sloane informs her. Zayden ignores them both completely, keeping his gaze locked onto mine as we reach them. And just why can't I? I lean up and brush my lips over his cool cheek. Because you'll need Taren. Now go warm up. I have a mission to fly. Without another word to him, I turn to my squad mates. Let's go. An excerpt from A Study on Signets by Major Dalton Cisneros. The art of imbuing comes naturally to only a handful of signets, and automatically only to one, the siphon. Chapter 53 Forty minutes later, the four of us are hiking down a steep, snow-covered ridgeline to a cave only accessible by foot in the sector our group has been assigned to. And lucky me is in the lead, which leaves Cat at my back. At least Andarna's there to protect it, should the flyer get any stabby ideas about how to get me out of Zayden's bed. This is not what I had in mind when I said I wanted to fly with you. And Darna huffs at the powdery snow, scattering a portion in a shimmering cloud of frozen misery. This is what the mission called for, and you need your strength to fly back, I tell her, trudging forward through the knee-high layer of fresh hell, and hoping I don't fall through into any older strata. The only one who isn't struggling is Kirillair, Cat's silver-winged griffin, who walks at Andarna's side. Only those two are light enough not to cause an avalanche on the non-existent path. Anything? Taren asks as he flies to the next peak, his voice tense. We haven't even made it to the cave you selected, I respond, spotting the mouth of the cave about 20 yards ahead, only because Taren pointed it out under the camouflage of the snowy outcropping above. 
The riot left us at the only fully stable section of terrain, an outcropping of rock left bare by the vicious wind. I still find this plan lacking, he lectures, leaving you on one peak to explore another for a possible energy signature leaves you in unacceptable danger. From whom? I tug my fur-lined hood closer to ward off the wind when it shifts, stinging the tips of my exposed ears. Do you really think any wyvern could? I'm coming back. It's entirely too easy to rile you, I laugh, and the sound echoes off the snow-covered bowl, making us all take pause. For fuck's sake, Sorengale, Cat hisses once it's clear the snow around us is staying put. Are you trying to get us buried in an avalanche? Sorry, I whisper over my shoulder. Her eyes widen. Did you just apologize to me? I can admit when I'm wrong, I shrug and continue forward. I'm fully present and capable of protecting her, and Darna snipes at Taren. You do not yet breathe fire. Fire would only serve to melt the mountain, she reminds him, and I glance back to see her carefully picking her path, her scales reflecting the snow in an almost silvery sheen in places. I still wield teeth and claw should the aristocrat bear her vitriol. Are you insinuating that I don't? Cat asks. Do you ever think you're wrong? Ever? I ask, pushing forward. I honestly think you might be worse than a dragon when it comes to confidence. Arrogance, and Darna corrects me. The flyer doesn't have the skills to back up a word like confidence. I snort, but bite back the laugh before it can endanger us. Ten more feet, and we'll be at the cave. If Taren locates a second while we're retrieving the first, we'll be ahead of Claw Section, who has already found three to our sections too, according to Taren. Dragons are nothing if not competitive. What? Cat asks. And Darna thinks you're arrogant, not confident, I tell her. She is, Sloane agrees. Just because your brother didn't like me doesn't mean you know me, Cat whispers at Sloane. No, I turn to face Cat, making her pause in the footsteps I've carved in the ridgeline. You want to pick a fight, you come at me. Cat cocks her head to the side and studies me. Because you feel guilty for her brother's death. It's not an accusation or even a dig, just the truth. Because I promised him I'd take care of her. So you can aim all that hatred right here. I tap my gloved hand to my chest. He was wrong to ask that of you, Sloane catches up, Visia close behind. Because Imogen would have been a more capable protector, I ask, only able to hold her too familiar blue gaze for a heartbeat before looking away. No, because you already carry the weight of protecting Zayden's life. It was unfair of him to burden you with mine, too. She huffs a breath into her cupped, gloved hands to warm them. I blink as my eyes sting from something other than the wind, then turn to continue trudging through the snow toward the cave, whose entrance is nothing but a narrow, icy ledge. It looks bigger than we thought from the air but still not wide enough for any dragon bigger than Andarna to squeeze into. There was a time my kind dwelled in every mountain of this range, Taren tells me. That cave is undoubtedly part of the network of chambers that runs throughout this range for a wintering den. This entrance would have been inhospitable to any approach but direct flight, to protect the young and the adolescent. I heard that. And Darna quips. Kirillia says our squad has another box in hand. Cat tells us as I finally reach the cave's entrance, stepping out of the wind. We're so winning that pass. Visia grins, and Cat walks out of the snow and onto the rocky floor of the cave. Does every griffin have lair in their name? I ask. Cat, hoping the subject change might change the aim of her sharp tongue from Sloan. Of course not. Is every rider named Sorengale? She folds her arms and bounces back on her heels like she's trying to stay warm. 
That right there is why I don't like you. Sloan crosses into the cave. Your Bissia slips and I lunge forward, catching her hand and tugging her into the cave as snow crumbles where she'd just been standing. You all right? I ask, pulling her farther into the cave and scanning her startled face. Of course she is. You never seem to have a problem saving her, Cat mutters. I'm fine, Vissia nods, dropping her hood and revealing the dragonfire burn scar down her hairline. <sighs> That's going to make it hard to leave. I shoot Cat a withering look, but she's too busy watching her griffin, Kira, stretch across the hole in the path, then safely squirm her way in to notice. Reason number two. Sloane holds up two fingers and walks past Cat into the dark cave. Needless to say, there are no mage lights in here. And I've never been that good at producing them. Anything I wield with lesser magic is going to be swallowed up in this darkness. I rest my hand over my stomach, as if that will help the instant rise of nausea from the smell of earth around us. At least it's missing that damp scent from the interrogation chamber but it's close enough to make me pause. You ended the one who kept you prisoner, Andarna reminds me, following Kira in, tucking her wings tight to fit through the opening. Fear isn't always logical, I glance at the other riders. Any chance either of you is a fire wielder? Because I don't think you want me wielding in here. Keeping the energy strung between my hand and the conduit for 15 feet puts me into a sweat every time, and I can only keep it going for a few seconds. No signet yet, Vissia responds. Me either, Sloan answers, peering into the darkness. You brought a dragon, Cat gestures wide, motioning toward Endarna. She can't breathe fire yet, I offer Endarna a smile. But she will. Remind her that I can sever her head with one bite, and Darna growls, the sound higher than Taren's menacing rumble. I will not. What does Taren tell us? We don't eat our allies, she mumbles, but there's a distinct tap of her talons against the rock floor. Great, why they stuck me with you three, I'll never know. You'd think one of us would have a good mage light down. Cat removes her bow, then swings her pack from her back and rummages past the full quiver to pull out a small, unlit torch. Are you kidding me? I gawk as she brings a piece of wood, no larger than my palm from the bag, shakes her head, and reaches for another. You carry one of those around with you? Obviously, Cat digs into her bag again. The fact that you don't says that you haven't been appropriately scared of the dark yet. Shit, I can't find the fire rune Marin made. You all trade runes? Vissia stares in open shock. And you call yourselves a family. Of course we share. Whoever can make it does. Then we all trade so everyone is equally equipped. Cat shakes her head and stands, muttering a curse. I can't find it. That's brilliant, I admit. Why didn't you tell us? You're used to hoarding power, she says with a dismissive shrug, not sharing it. Now, unless someone has an idea for fire, got it. I yank off my gloves, then stuff them into one pocket and pull my conduit from the other, beckoning a trickle of my power to rise. It tingles, then burns as it flows down my hand, through my fingers, and into the conduit. The tendrils of energy light our immediate surroundings. That's so awesome, Vissia smiles. Can all of you do that? No, it just hums for most of us. Glad to see you'll have all the light you need, sarcasm drips from Kat's voice. Take it, I order Sloane. I'd rather live, she puts her hands up. If I thought it was going to kill you, I'd hand it to Kat. I hold the conduit out to her. Kat snorts, but I think there was a note of laughter there. Good point. Sloane takes the conduit, and I concentrate on keeping the energy connected. Back up three steps. Good, another two, I tell her, and my fingers tremble as she does, 
stretching my signet. Wow, Visia whispers. Stick the torch into the energy cat. You think it's safe? She asks. I have no clue, but I'm game to try if you are. I keep focused on the conduit, on the flow of energy, on the heat I keep checked by controlling the door to Tern's power. Kira clicks her tongue in a series of sounds I've become accustomed to, but have no hope of ever understanding. Fine, I'll do it, Cat mutters, then lowers the torch until it catches fire. I immediately drop my hand, cutting off the power, and I send a prayer of thanks to Dune that it worked. Felix is probably going to have my head on a pike tomorrow at lessons. I'll take it. Thanks, Sloane. Sloane hands the conduit back, like it might explode. Damn, Kat says, glancing from the torch to the conduit to me. I hate that you're so... Badass? Sloane suggests, smiling in a way that reminds me of her brother. Powerful, Kat admits, looking away before slipping her pack back on, changing hands with the torch instead of passing it off. It's not the power making that possible, I tell her, channeling into the conduit so it lights up again and marching into the darkness. It's the control. Yeah, well, I kind of loathe that too, she mutters, catching up to walk at my side. A rare moment of honesty. I'll take it. We move into the cave, which seems to widen with every step we take. They paired us because I'm supposedly the most powerful rider in the squad, I tell her, ignoring her muttered response. But you're better at runes. We might not complement each other, but we complement each other. I smile despite the darkness we're walking into. Get it? With an E instead of the I? Cat looks at me like I've just grown a third arm, and the torch starts to flicker. There's a breeze. Are you telling scribe jokes? Sloan asks, a couple of steps behind us, Visia at her side. Jacinia would think it's funny. Visia offers like she's trying to save me. Jacinia is a scribe, Sloan notes. The cave opens up about 20 feet in, a vast tunnel forking to the left. Apparently, there's a much easier way to get into this cave, Cat mutters. It's part of a network that runs through this range, I explain. Should we split up? Visia asks. No, all three of us respond at the same time. Which way do we go? Sloan voices the question we're all wondering. No one answers. Any help? I ask Taren, feeling our bond stretch. He's not far, but definitely not close either. There's an energy signature in that cave. That's all I can tell. I vote right, and if it doesn't work, we'll come back and go left. I look to the others. Cat nods, and we head farther in. So, do you think you'll get a second signet? Visia asks breaking the silence. Two dragons, two signets, right? I don't know, I answer, glancing back at Andarna. I actually figured because she bonded me so young and lost the ability to stop time, the signet of lightning wielding was all that I would be blessed with. But now I wonder. Will I? Why are you asking me? Signets manifest according to the person wielding. Her eyes blink gold, her black scales blending in with the darkness. Second signets only happen when a dragon bonds a rider in the direct familial line as its previous, Sloane says, misunderstanding Visia's question. But there's an equal chance of it causing madness, from what Thort told me. That's why Kruth wasn't punished for bonding Quinn. She's only the great niece of her previous rider. Her signet's more powerful, but not entirely different. Thort shouldn't be telling you matters resolved within the Empyrean. Visia lectures, then does a double take when she glances my way. Gravity shifts. That can't be right, that would mean... Violet, are you okay? Visia asks. I shake my head but say, yes. How do you explain your heart is sinking past the rock floor of the cave? I take a deep breath, flex and unflex my hand as I grip the brightly glowing conduit. 
and Darna growls to my right, and I quickly assure her, I'm fine. But we both know I'm anything but fine. I'm also equally certain now isn't the time to let my mind wander down that path. Holy shit, there it is, Sloane says, forcing me to pay attention as she walks past us to pick up the plain metal chest that's locked into an open position by the rune on the front. It's plain, Visia notes. Are you going to counter the summoning rune? I ask Kath. When she raises one brow, I add, you're better at runes, remember? I am, she nods a genuine smile, curving her mouth for the first time since I met her. I just wanted to see if you'd say it again. Kirillair's wing brushes my shoulder as she walks past us into the darkness, as if Kat needs to be guarded from the unseen. Kat glances between the three of us with an uncertain and unhappy tense set to her mouth, then hands the torch to Visia in what looks like a painful sacrifice. No, not a sacrifice, a gesture of trust. She weaves the unlocking rune with a speed I envy, her hands moving quickly, confidently, as Andarna shifts her weight behind me. What's wrong? The scent of others grows stronger. Wyvern? Every muscle in my body clenches. No, they smell of stolen magic when you get close enough. She lifts her head, taking up three quarters of the tunnel. This smells of dragons. Got it, Kat says, and I turn at the sound of metal clicking shut. The chest is closed and latched. We'd better hurry, I tell them, and Darna smells other dragons, which means the other sections might be closing in on us. I'm not losing this pass, Visia trades Kat, taking the chest and returning the torch. It will give me time to fly home and convince my cousins to leave the border if my aunt and uncle won't. You're going to fly into Navarre? Sloane damn near shouts. It's right on the border. They won't even know. Visia adjusts her grip on the chest and hurries past Andarna. So let's get out of here. Bold choice to go back to Navarre. Cat jogs to catch up to Visia, lighting the way. I respect it. The effort, the consideration for Visia, thaws a small chunk of my heart toward Cat. Maybe she's not horrible to everyone. Just me. It's the only thing to do, Visia starts as we approach the fork in the tunnel. A low growl vibrates the very ground beneath our feet, making all four of us halt, and the hair rises on the back of my neck. What the? Cat starts. Another growl makes the pebbles around my feet bounce, and a full-grown orange dragon comes around the corner, its back scraping the top of the cave as it snaps its head our direction, glaring at us through its only remaining eye. Oh, fuck. Visia shrieks. Turn! I mentally scream, forcing my body past the shock, the fear, the nauseating hopelessness of our situation. The orb falls from my hand, shattering on the ground at the same moment I reach for the women in front of me. But my hand only grasps the leather of Cat's pack. I yank her backward with all my strength, just as Visia is swatted out of the way by a sharp, jagged claw. Cat's body collides with mine, knocking us both to the ground, and the torch falls from her hand as Visia hits the side of the cave with a cracking sound that sickens my stomach. The angle, the impact. Gods, she's, she's dead. Silver one, Tern's voice roars in my head as the dragon blocking our way out focuses his narrowed eye on me and opens his jaw wide. Fetid breath fills the air a second before he curls his tongue and his throat glows orange with rising fire. Solus found us. An excerpt from Colonel Kaori's Field Guide to Dragonkind. I'll say one thing for Dragonfire. It kills quickly. Chapter 54 A dark shape flies at us from the left, sweeping Cat and me into a spinning tangle of limbs and propelling us backward. I grab onto her in the chaos, forcing her body in front of mine as we come to a skidding halt, knowing the shelter of facing my back to Solus won't be enough, but trying anyway. 
She has to live. She's third in line to the throne of Poromil. If she dies in Tyrandor, Corden will hunt Zayden down and execute him. If he survives my death, survive, survive, survive. I push the demand down every mental bond I have just in case we aren't out of range. Zayden's too far, but Taren will hear it. And Andarna, gods, Taren has to get here in time to save her. Kirillair and Sloane fly into us next, swept in by an unseen force, pushing Sloane and me backward toward Solus. But my back hits a hard, rough surface as the cave walls illuminate with the eerie glow of impending fire from a heartbeat before we're overtaken by darkness. Take a breath, and Darna demands. Don't argue! Not darkness, wings. It's her belly at my back, and she's wrapped her wings around us. Breathe in and hold it, I shout, then fill my lungs with sulfur-scented air. Heat blasts, roaring past us in a stream that shakes Andarna's wings, and the temperature soars. I force my eyes closed to keep them from cooking as my skin burns, as though we've been thrown into an oven. How can she survive this? She's fireproof, Taren reminds me, but the panic in his voice doesn't do much to soothe the terror clamping down on my heart. Do not breathe, and Darna demands, and I know it's because I'll singe my lungs if I do, if any of us do. I count my heartbeats. One, two, three. The blast feels like it goes on forever, like it becomes my eternity, like my soul has done exactly what Sloane asked in the first part of the year and gone straight to the depths of hell without being commended to Malik. Eight, nine, on ten it ends, and Andarna's wings fall. Air rushes in, and I wait until I feel its cool brush across my cheek before I drag in a breath, hearing the others do the same. I open my eyes and see Cat lunge in the torchlight across the small space, using her gloved hands to put out the burning tips of the feathers along Kira's far wing. It must have been exposed to the flames. Sloane races to help as Andarna gains her feet, and I narrowly avoid her tail as she faces down Solus. No, he's nearly twice as big as you are. I lift my hands and throw the floodgates open on Tern's power, letting it burn through me as Solus's blast failed to do, until I'm pure fire. But I can't wield him here, not when there's every chance I could hit one of us. And Darna's roar fills the cave, and my heart stops when she goes for Solus's throat. He bats her away like she's nothing but a nuisance, and I muffle a cry as she slides into the wall right over the charred remains of Vicia's bones. I'm fine, and Darna shakes it off as Solus sizes me up. Three minutes, Taren tells me. You will not die today. Three minutes. We can make it three minutes, but time isn't our issue. Taren can't fit through the opening of the cave. He'll have to find whatever entrance Solus used. How the fuck do you kill a dragon? Let me go, Cat shouts. You're, you're draining my power. What the fuck? I chance a look backward, but all I see is Cat disengaging from Sloane's panicked grip. Go for his other eye. Get out of the way, I order Andarna, and this time she listens, scrambling back to my side as I grab two knives from their sheaths and flip them, pinching at the tips for a heartbeat before loosing them. The first misses as he swivels, but the second finds the mark. His bellow of pain is followed by rage, and he stumbles backward into the forked tunnel, leaving a small, precious opening between his head and the wall. Cat and Sloane are closer. They can make it. Get her out, I yell at Cat. Now! Violet! Sloane shouts, but Kira's beak closes softly around her pack, and she hoists her into the air as Cat scrambles to mount. They rush by on the left, making it through just before Solus's claws come out swinging, his talons raking furrows into the stone of the cave. I hit the floor, pain flaring up my shoulders. There's no pop as talons swipe over us, but something bites into my palm. Glass from the conduit. I spread my bleeding fingers wide in the dim light of the dying torch, locating the remnants before it goes out. The top of the metal joint has broken, leaving four jagged prongs and one secured piece of alloy. I don't have fire, and Darna tells me following my thoughts. But I have power. It's about to get really dark in here. It's our only shot, and I'm taking it. You have to run as soon as there's an opening. I'm not leaving you, she stubbornly argues. One minute, Taren announces. How the hell am I going to get close enough to stab the remains of the conduit into him? 
There's no time to tie it to a dagger. And the force of a throw isn't enough to... Solus roars in pain, his head swiveling back toward his shoulder. And through the opening, I see Cat poised in the dim light, knocking another arrow. There's no time to ruminate on her sticking around to save me. I'm already moving, grabbing hold of the dying torch in my empty hand, then running toward the soft spot under Solus's foreleg, where his scales separate a few inches at a time to allow the movement of the joint. He roars again, fire illuminating the cave in a short blast as he aims without sight, hitting the wall in front of him instead of Cat. I race into the deadly space underneath him and change my target when I realize he'll crush me if he falls, charging toward his right shoulder. I shove the prongs of the conduit into the soft joint between his scales as Andarna sinks her teeth between his neck and shoulder, distracting him, and then I wield. Energy sizzles up my arm and into my fingertips where they meet the metal. Control. This is all about control. With one hand raised, wielding the delicate strain of energy, I back away from Solus as quickly as I dare, feeding more and more power into the stream, and then I pour everything. Solus roars, swinging his hind end around. A shape comes swinging for me, and I make out the thicker part of his tail in the dim light, a second before it slams into my stomach, sending me flying and breaking the stream of lightning. I'm airborne, nothing more than a projectile as I fly backward, hitting my ass, then my back, and lastly, my head against the ground with a crack. But I hold my power tight instead of striking, letting it burn me from the inside out. Better me than accidentally hitting Andarna. The only sound is a loud ringing in my ears, and sight only comes in quick flashing blasts. Fire. It flares as I struggle to sit up through the fog of my own heartbeat, revealing Andarna latched onto Solus, hanging on even as he thrashes, slamming her smaller body against the cave wall. No, I think I yell, but the incessant peal of bells in my head blocks it out, and suddenly I'm moving, being dragged backward by a pair of arms. My head falls back, and I recognize those eyes. Liam, I must be dead. She's not clear, someone shouts as the ringing fades slightly. And then another blast of fire shows two more arrows in the bloodied hole that used to be Solace's shoulder. Cat, she's beside me, already drawing another arrow, and her lips move silently. And the eyes above me aren't Liam's. They're Sloane's. We're plunged back into darkness momentarily, and the ringing fades enough to hear Cat's voice clearly. Ninety, one hundred. One hundred and one. Her voice shakes. Light flares again, and I'm dragged backward, and Cat fires, hitting Solus in the same wound. And Darna flies free, taking a chunk of Solus with her as I'm hauled from the returning darkness into the growing light from the mouth of the cave. And Darna! I claw at Sloane's grip, but the harder I fight, the weaker I feel. And the insufferable heat of my power lessens as Sloane starts to scream, letting me fall to the ground. Silver One! I feel the steady beats of air at my back, and no Tairn is there, hovering. But I can't rip my eyes away from the darkness of the cave as I stumble to my feet near the entrance. A dragon screams, then falls horrifyingly silent. She isn't. She can't be. She lives, Tairn promises but I don't breathe until I reach mentally and find my bond with Andarna gleaming and strong. I drained you, Sloane holds up trembling hands, staring at them like they don't belong to her. I drained you, she grasps my shoulders, yanking my focus from the dark as my head swims. For fuck's sake, Sloane, give her a second. She just hit her head. Cat barks, still aiming into the darkness as we stand in the glaring light, but not firing an arrow without a target. Are my eyes red? Sloane shakes me. Or maybe she's shaking and simply holding on to me. Are they red? I swear I didn't reach Violet. I didn't take anything from you on purpose. Oh, gods, am I turning venom? She is as Naolin was, Taryn says. You're not turning... I take her hands from my shoulders and stare into the darkness as footsteps sound, talons clicking along the rock. I'm not. Your signet manifested, I whisper, my eyes straining to see into the cave opening. You're a siphon, 
and Darna walks into the light. But it's not the blood covering her mouth that catches my attention. It's the blood dripping from the poisoned barb on her tail. You killed him. My shoulders dip in relief. You killed Solus. Pride and worry assault me at the same time, but I can't force my shields up before Taren's voice fills my very existence. Slayer. Zayden bursts into our room as the healer finishes checking my eyes, shading my vision, then exposing me to light. Violet, he halts a few feet away from where I sit on the edge of our bed. Cat, what the hell are you doing in here? She saved my life. Making sure she was seen by a healer was the least I could do. Cat answers. She what? Zayden moves forward as the healer stands upright. You heard me. She put herself between the giant orange dragon and me. She rises from her seat, the same chair Zayden sat in while I slept in here for days after Resin, poisoned by the venom's blade. Thank you, Sorengale. She chokes on the words a little before passing by Zayden on her way out. Solus, I start to explain. Oh, I already know. He seethes. Sigail told me. You were in a meeting. I didn't want to bother you. I follow the healer's finger upon direction. Bother me? Shadows flood the floor. The healer notices, blinking quickly. You'll be all right. I don't think you're concussed, but that's quite a lump on the back of your head. And I'll ask that you mind the stitches in your hand. She arches a silver brow at me. Of course, I lift my wrapped left hand. Thank you. She nods, then dismisses herself, disappearing into the hallway. I stare at Zayden, and he stares right back, tension emanating from every line of his body. If you want to fight about the wards, that's fine but I'm not taking the blame for fighting my way out of a cave. He stalks forward, then bends down into my space and kisses me, soft and slow. You're alive, he whispers against my lips. So my heartbeat says. Good. He stands folding his arms. Now we can fight. What the fuck were you thinking, saving Cat? I blink. I'm sorry, you're mad at me? I fight my way out of a cave against a dragon, and you're mad at me? For saving a woman in the line of succession to the throne of Poromil? He reels backward, horror flashing into his eyes a second before anger swamps them. You saved Kat because she's third in line? First, I would have fought to save anyone. You selfless, reckless, he accuses, backing away slowly. And second, her death would have triggered yours, so hell yes, I saved her. My feet hit the ground, and my head swims for a heartbeat, but my pulse steadies as I breathe deeply. Takaris would have had you executed if she died under your care. Unfucking believable he laces his hands on the top of his head. You hate her. And yet, you refuse to raise the wards, no doubt, so her power won't be stripped away. And then you put your life in front of hers for you. All I want is you. He flicks his hands, and shadows shut the door a little harder than necessary, sealing us in behind the sound shield. If she dies, then I'll take the consequences. If they can't channel, I'll take those consequences too. But not you. Never you, God's Violet. I'm doing everything in my power to both respect your freedom and keep you safe, and you're- He shakes his head. I don't even know what you're doing. Keep me safe, I laugh, sarcasm biting into my eyes and making them sting. Is that what you do? I get it all mixed up with just not killing me. There it is. He retreats until his back hits the wall, and then he folds his arms and leans against it, crossing an ankle casually. You finally ready to ask me about the deal I made with your mother? An excerpt from The Journal of Warwick of Lucerus, translated by Cadets Violet Sorengale and Dane Atos. Nothing kills powerful, unshakable love faster than opposing ideologies. 
Chapter 55 My mouth opens, then shuts. You knew that I knew? Of course I knew. He arches a dark brow, as if I'm the problem here. I've just been waiting for you to work up the courage, the trust, whatever you want to call it, to fucking ask me. My hands fist at my sides and I shove my power back behind the archive's door and slam my shields up. Without a conduit, there's every chance I'll set the curtains on fire for the entirely wrong reason. You let me stew in it for months? You didn't ask me. He pushes off the wall but stops himself from taking more than a step. I've been begging you for months to ask me what you want to know, to break down that last insurmountable wall you're keeping between us, but you didn't. Why? He has the nerve to put this on me? You're the one who said you'd never be entirely truthful with me. How am I supposed to know what you will and will not answer? How am I supposed to know what there is to ask? The second you have a question, you ask it. Seems pretty simple. Simple? Brennan is alive. You made a deal with my mother for my life. She put those scars on your back. Tell me, Zayden. Is it only the secrets about my family you want me to dig out of you? You holding anything about Mira? Shit. He shoves a hand through his hair. I didn't want you to know about the scars, that's true. But I would have told you if you'd asked. I asked last year, I challenge, walking toward the windows to look out over the rebuilt city, my anger heating my blood. But not my skin yet, thank the gods. I'm sorry, I can't change last year. And though you've said you understand why I kept you in the dark, I don't think you've actually forgiven me. I... Have I? Wrapping my arms around myself, I watch a riot of ten fly overhead, my mind racing with the deal he made. With him knowing, him testing me with his ridiculous questions. And he still hasn't told me everything about the scars on his back, or what I suspect from the cave about Sigale bonding him. How much more can there be? As for the scars, I said you didn't want to know how I got them. You can't honestly tell me that you're happy knowing, are you? My stomach twists. Of course not, I spin to face him. She cut into you over and over. I shake my head, truly unable to fathom her actions, let alone how he endured it. Yes, he nods, as if it's just a fact, a piece of history. And I didn't offer the information because I knew you'd find some way to blame yourself, just like you've assumed guilt for everything that's gone wrong in the last few months. I stiffen. I have not. You have. He walks forward, stopping at the edge of the bed. And the scars on my back are not your fault. Yes, your life was the unnamed price for the marked ones entering the quadrant. He shrugs. Your mother called in her favor and I gave it. Do you want me to apologize for a deal I made before I knew you, before I loved you? A deal that kept us alive, started the flow of weaponry to the flyers? Because I won't. I'm not sorry. I'm not mad about the deal. How does he not understand? I'm pissed that you kept it from me, that you insist on making me ask for things you should openly share. How the hell am I in love with you when I feel like I barely know you sometimes? Because I let you live long enough for us to fall in love, he says. Without that deal, gods know what I would have done in my need for revenge. Ask me why I don't regret it. Ask me about the first time I saw you. Ask me about the moment I almost killed you despite the deal and decided not to. Ask me why. Ask me something. Fight back like you would have done last year before I broke your trust. Stop being so scared of the answers or waiting for me to give them to you. Demand the truth. I need you to love all of me, not just what you decide to see. How are we still having the same fight five months later? I shake my head. He can tell me or he can choose not to, but I'm done having to guess which questions to ask. Because it wasn't just me who shattered your trust last year. Because you were too pissed about my refusal to answer the superficial questions about the revolution to ask the real ones about us. Because you didn't have a chance to find your feet before you were tortured. 
because I came for you, told you that I love you, and you decided you could admit to loving me, even be with me, but we skipped over the step where you admit to fully trusting me. Take your pick. It's like we're still on that parapet last year, and I'm not the one worried you'll find something unlikable if you dig a little deeper. You are. That's bullshit. I shake my head. And how am I supposed to fully trust you when battle axes are flying out of armoires left and right? He lifts his scarred brow. I'm not sure I understand. It was an analogy I used with Imogen, never mind. I wave him off. About battle axes and armoires? His head tilts as he studies me. I rub the center of my forehead. I basically said, that if a battle axe came flying out of an armoire and almost killed you, you'd want to check out the armoire to make sure it wouldn't happen again. Hmm. He glances out of the corner of his eye to where our uniforms hang side by side, and his brow furrows in thought. I can work with this. I'm sorry? What's in our armoire right now? He crosses his arms over his chest. My mouth opens, shuts then opens again. Uniforms, boots, flight leathers. How many uniforms? Which pairs of boots? Shadows curl along the floor, stretching from beneath our bed to the armoire doors. Do you actually know what's in there? Or do you just trust that I haven't moved your belongings and everything's where you left it? It's an analogy. This is ridiculous. And I open that armoire every single day. I know where things hang because I see them. What about the blanket my mother made me that's tucked back on the top shelf? Two strands of shadow reach for handles and open the armoire doors. I didn't go snooping. I shake my head, my eyes narrowing at him. A corner of his mouth rises. Because you trust me. Analogy. I enunciate every syllable. So, ask the question, Violet, he says softly, in that calm, controlled tone that makes me lift my chin. Humor me. Fine, I grit out through my teeth. Do you happen to have a battle? Shadows surge from the armoire, and I catch the glint of metal, a heartbeat before the bands of darkness hold a dagger to within inches of my chin. I gasp, then lock every muscle. What the fuck, Zayden? Am I going to hurt you? The carpet makes his boot steps nearly silent as he crosses the room, giving me plenty of time to object or retreat, but I don't. I'm going to hurt you if you don't get that away from me. I keep my eyes on him. Would I ever let this knife hurt you? His boots touch the tips of mine, and he leans into my space. Of course not. The shadows slowly take the blade closer to Zayden's throat, and I grab for the hilt, yanking it away and tossing it to the desk before he can accidentally nick himself. His smile flashes, then fades. Hey, violence? What? I snap. There's a knife in the armoire. His hand slides to the nape of my neck, and he leans in, narrowing the world to just the two of us. All you had to do was ask. And even if you weren't aware it was coming, you know I'd never let it hurt you. I'm not the one you don't trust. I scoff. What is that supposed to mean? Love, you're the smartest person I know. If you actually wanted the answers, you'd ask the right questions. His voice softens as his thumb sweeps along my jawline. You knew about the deal. Maybe the question you need to be asking is why you didn't confront me about it. Because I love you. My voice breaks into a mortifying whisper that's almost half as embarrassing as the thoughts I can't keep from spinning in my brain. The thoughts that I've fought to hold at bay ever since my mother told me about the deal she made with him. Heat flushes my cheeks as he holds my stare, and frustration curls my hands into fists. Because I want to think you kept me alive those first few months before threshing because you were intrigued or impressed by me or attracted to me like I was to you, and not because you made a deal with my mother. Because it's horrifying to think that the only reason you fell in love with me is because of her. 
because maybe you're right and I didn't want that particular truth. Since I know there's a thin line between devotion and obsession, between cowardice and self-preservation, and I'm walking it when it comes to you. I love you so fucking much that I ignored every warning signal last year, and now half the time I don't know what side of that line I'm standing on because I'm too busy looking at you to watch my own feet. Because you don't want yourself to know where your feet are, he says softly. My mouth snaps shut. How dare he? Someone pounds on the door. Fuck off, Zayden yells over his shoulder, then sighs as if remembering the sound shield. Let's put your theory to the test. You want me to demand the truth? To ask you something real? I hold his gaze and steal my heart. Please, do, he challenges. What's your second signet? His eyes widen, and the blood drains from his face as his hand falls away. For the first time, I think I've actually managed to shock Zayden Ryerson. I know you have one, I whisper as the pounding continues. You told me that Sigale was bonded to your grandfather, which makes you a direct descendant. If a dragon bonds a family member, it can strengthen a signet. But a direct descendant will either produce a second signet or madness and you seem pretty sane to me. He inhales sharply and forces his features into a mask. I shake my head and scoff. <laughs> so much for asking. I just can't figure out why Sigale was allowed to choose you, how she got away with it, how you both did. The pounding only increases. We have an emergency out here. Brennan? Both of our heads turn toward the door, and Zayden quickly moves to open it. He listens to my brother's hushed words, then looks over his shoulder at me. A horde of wyvern has been spotted flying from Pavis toward the cliffs. Satan says something else to Brennan, then turns to me again. You ready to raise those wards? Or would you like to wait until they're actually at the gates? Fuck. An excerpt from The Journal of Warwick of Lucerus, translated by Cadet Violet Sorengale. It was never our continent. From the very beginning, it was theirs, and we were simply allowed to live here. Chapter 56 Dragons, Brennan says as we skip the path that leads to the wardstone chamber and instead climb the one that leads to the top of the hill with the other members of the assembly, Zayden and Rhiannon, walking up behind us in the afternoon light. The wind howls as storm clouds roll in above us. Even the weather holds a sense of urgency. And if I'm wrong, if I've missed a symbol, a meaning, we'll be fighting for our lives in the next few hours. But I can feel the distinct, powerful hum of the wardstone from here. So that must mean I have part of it right. The time Dane, Zayden, and I have put in imbuing the wardstone has paid off. It's not creating wards on its own, of course, but it's at least holding power. The chaos inside Ryerson House bleeds onto the trail that leads to the valley as riders and flyers alike hike for the flight field, armed to the teeth with swords, battle axes, daggers, and bows. My own daggers are sheathed, all but the two I left in the cave with Solace's body and my pack is strapped to my back. Most third and second years are headed to the outposts along the Navarian border. And then there's me. I'll be with Zayden since Taren and Sigil can fly faster than the rest of the riot to confront the approaching horde. The last thing we want is to let them get to Eurasia. If we hurry and the translation is accurate, we might get the wards working just as the horde reaches the height of the cliffs, I try not to focus on what will happen if I've translated wrong again, my heart racing in my chest as we hurry up the path. I glance over my shoulder at Zayden, his jaw clenched, eyes not quite meeting mine. Maybe he and I keep having the same fight, because we never get to actually finish it. What in Malik's name could his signet be if he went that pale? Dragons, I repeat to Brennan pulling my attention back to my brother and handing the journal over on the page I'd mistranslated originally. That line, 
I point with a gloved finger. It's more loosely interpreted as political power, not physical, which would be a lower placement on the symbol. Dane caught that one. The stone needs a representative of each den, which is exactly why Rhiannon is trekking up the path behind us with a stone silent Zayden. We need Fierge. And it took reading the entire beginning to know that once a dragon fires a ward stone, their fire can't be used on any other. And reading the entire end to know they created two ward stones. But it doesn't say why they never activated this one. It's dragon fire that triggers the embedded runes, and they obviously had enough dragons, so why wouldn't they protect more of Navarre if they could? My entire body aches from today's attack, especially my head and shoulders, and I fight to lock the pain away so we can get this done. It won't matter if I'm hurting if we're dead in the next few hours. Gently, I probe the swollen knot on the back of my head and wince. Let me mend it, Brennan says, worry creasing his forehead as he looks up from the journal. We don't have time right now. Later. I shake my head and tug my hood up over my head to ward off the cold. He shoots me a disapproving look, but doesn't try to talk me out of my choice. Not only did you translate it, but you went back and did it again when most people would have quit. I'm really impressed, Violet. His mouth curves into a smile. Thanks. I can't help but smile back with a little bit of pride. Dad taught me well, and Markham picked up where he left off. Bet you disappointed the hell out of him when you stayed in the rider's quadrant. I'm definitely his biggest failure. Just a few more steps. But Dad's biggest success. He offers the journal back. I think he'd be proud of all of us. You should keep that. I nod at the journal as we finally reach the top. It needs to be preserved. Anytime you want it, it's yours, he promises, tucking it into his jacket for safekeeping, before heading left toward where Marb stands next to Kath, his tail flicking as Dane waits in front of him, shifting his weight impatiently. Six dragons surround the top of the chamber, standing wing to wing, and I make my way to Tern, who stands beside Sigail, as I would expect. How is Endarna? I ask him, taking my place between his forelegs and peeking over the stone-rimmed edge into the chamber where the wardstone sits a hundred feet below. She's not responding when I reach out. She's been questioned by the elders, and her actions were found justifiable, he answers. But to slay another dragon is a heavy mark upon the soul, even when in defense of yourself or your rider. That's why you only took his eye instead of killing him. I stiffen as Zayden approaches, refusing to look his way as he moves into position with Sigail. I should have ended him then. I will not hesitate when faced with a similar predicament in the future. She now suffers with a burden that should have been mine. I'm proud of her. As am I. Rhiannon stands with Fierge, and Suri does the same with her brown club tail. Let's get this done. Suri shoots a glare my way, obviously still angry that I've hidden my discovery for the past week. I'm definitely not winning any points in the trust department. All six of us exchange glances and quick nods. It is time, Taren says. The dragons inhale as one, and then exhale fire into the chamber in six separate streams, instantly warming the air around us. This is exactly why they built it open to the sky, not as some kind of worship to the stars, but because the dragons needed access for this. I look away, turning my head to the side when the heat triggers my hypersensitive skin, still stinging from Solace's assault. A heartbeat later, a pulse of magic vibrates through me in a wave, dredging my power to the surface with a feeling slightly softer than the one that had rippled out at the emergence of Erasia's first hatchling. The fire ceases, and the blazing heat dissipates into the winter air, leaving us all staring at the stone, at our dragons, at one another. That leveled, anchored sensation I've only felt within the wards at Bezgayeth has returned, and the wild, unleashed magic that's crawled under my skin since leaving Navar seems to sit back, not weaker, but infinitely more tame. I lean over the edge to look, but the stone looks exactly the same as it did before. 
Maybe the fire is more symbolic? I glance over at Dane, and he smiles wider than I've seen in years, nodding to me. My quick grin mirrors his, and my chest swells with excitement. We did it. All the long nights and the cold days spent imbuing, all the squabbles over translation, and even my initial failure are worth it for this moment. Is that it? Brennan asks, looking across the chambers, opening at me. We don't exactly have time to test it, Zayden points upward, where the drifts have already taken to the sky, then locks his gaze with mine. Let's fly. Tern has never flown faster, leaving Segail and Zayden behind as he surges for the cliffs with the best vantage point for spotting Wyvern, the edge of the high plains, usually a two-hour flight for Tern. But this evening, we make it a few minutes under that mark. They're 15 minutes behind us, he tells me as he sails over miles and miles of agricultural fields, gradually descending until we land 50 yards from the edge of the cliffs. Use it to center yourself. Don't tell me you're taking Zayden's side of this argument. I unbuckle from the saddle and wince as I climb out of my seat. I need to stretch my legs. I don't take the lieutenant anywhere, he chuffs, as if I have nothing better to do than listen to your romantic issues. Sorry, didn't mean to jump to conclusions. I navigate his spikes, and he dips his shoulder. Though I do take offense at your insult he notes as I slide down his leg. Insult. My knee protests when my boots collide with the frozen ground, but the wrap holds tight. You doubt your judgment, as if I did not choose you for it. But you weren't listening. Right. Rolling my shoulders, I walk toward the edge of the cliff and summon just enough of my power that my skin warms, even though my breath puffs out in clouds of steam. There's a hum here, too, and I instinctively know that this is where the wards end, 20 feet short of the cliff's edge. This point is a four-hour flight from Eurasia for average dragons, if such a creature exists. Would this be the natural border of Bezgaith's wards if they weren't extended by the outposts? That distance would leave Elsum, Tyrandor, and even most of Caldir unwarded. Gods, we're not even shielding most of Tyrandor if this is the Wardstone's natural range. What's the news? I ask Tern. The nearest riot of three is twenty miles to the north, and the same to the south. No sightings? We don't have the strength Zayden wants in each unit tonight. But we can cover more of the border in groups of three, or in our case, two. Deploying in smaller but closely spaced units gives the stronger dragons a better chance at communicating as well. Every bonded pair has been recalled from the lines across Poromiel to defend the cliffs, but there's no hope of those stationed in Cordon or beyond at the border with the Bravik province making it back in time. Not from the cliffs. But beyond? I look out across the darkening landscape, searching for any sign of gray wings. I'd estimate we have a quarter hour. He huffs a hot breath of steam that billows past me. Prepare yourself. Sigail approaches. Do you think he's right? I ask, folding my arms across my chest as wing beats break the relative silence of the night. I know he thinks he is. That's helpful. Sigail lands close to Tern, and I breathe in my last moments of peace and prepare myself for the battle to come before the actual war reaches us. It isn't long before I hear his familiar footsteps coming my way. No sightings on this side of the cliff, I tell him as he reaches my side, keeping my shields firmly in place. Tern thinks we have fifteen minutes. There's no one else out here. His words are clipped. Right, we're the only pair. I shift my weight, energy tingling in my fingers, slowly filling my cells, saturating me in preparation instead of drowning me as usual. I know that goes against your full riot. That's not what I mean. He shoves his gloves into his pockets, leaving his hands bare and ready to wield, the perfect picture of composure and control. 
There's no one within miles to hear us. My eyebrows shoot up, and I turn toward him in sheer incredulity. I'm sorry, are you suggesting that the reason you didn't answer my question back in Erasia was because you don't trust your own sound shield on our room? There is always someone better at something than you, including wards. He winces. And maybe that wasn't the entire reason. Spare me from whatever bullshit you're about to impart. My stomach twists, and I lower my voice into my best Zayden impression. Ask me, I shake my head. Yet the first real question I pose, you duck out the door like a coward. It never occurred to me that you'd ask about a second signet, he argues. Liar, I whip my gaze forward, studying the sky for movement and fighting the scalding anger that tests the archive's doors of my power. You wouldn't have told me that Sigale bonded your grandfather if you never wanted me to know. Whether it was a conscious or unconscious choice, you made it. You knew I'd figure it out. Was it just another one of your ask-me tests? Because if so, you failed this one, not me. Don't you think I know that? He shouts, the words coming out strangled, like they had to be ripped from his throat. The admission earns him my full attention, but his outburst is quickly smothered by his self-control, and we fall into strained silence as he stares off into the distance. Sometimes I feel like I don't know you. I studied the harsh lines of his face as his jaw flexes. How am I supposed to really love you if I don't know you? I can't, and I think we both know it. How long do you think it takes for someone to fall out of love? He studies the skyline. A day? A month? I'm asking because I don't have any experience with it. What the fuck? I fold my arms to keep from giving in to the impulse to jab him with the sharp point of my elbow. I'm asking, he continues, his throat working as he swallows. Because I think it will take you all of a heartbeat, once you know. Apprehension slides up my spine and knots in my throat as I slightly lower my shields just enough to feel ice-cold terror along my bond with him. What the hell could his signet be that I wouldn't love him? Oh, shit. What if he's like Cat? What if he's been manipulating my emotions this whole time? I swallow back the bile, inching its way up my throat. I would never do something like that, he retorts, sending a sideways wounded glare at me as he continues to watch the sky. Shit. I rub my hands over my face. I didn't mean to say that out loud. He doesn't respond. Just tell me what it is. I reach for him, curling my fingers around the back of his arm. You said that you trust me to stay because even if I don't know your darkest deeds, I know what you're capable of. But I don't if you won't tell me. Somehow we're right back where we were months ago, neither of us fully trusting the other. His mouth opens, but he snaps it shut, as if he was going to talk then thought better of it. Signets have to do with who we are at our core and what we need, I think out loud. If he won't tell me, then I'll figure it out my damn self. You are a master of secrets, hence the shadows. I gesture at the ones curled around his feet. You're deadly with every weapon you pick up, but that's not a signet. My brow furrows. Stop. You're ruthless, which... I guess could have something to do with an ability to shut off your emotions. I shift my weight and study his face, watching for even the most minute sign that I'm on to something, and keep guessing, trusting Taren to spot the wyvern before we do. You're a natural leader. Everyone gravitates toward you, even against their better judgment. The last part comes out as a mutter. You're always in the right place. My eyebrows rise. Are you a distance wielder? I've only read about two riders in all of history who could cross hundreds of miles in a single step. There hasn't been a distance wielder in centuries, and don't you think if I was one, I would have spent every night in your bed? He shakes his head. But what do you need? 
I ponder, ignoring the tense set of his jaw. You need to question everyone to make your own impressions. You need to be a quick judge of character in order to know who to trust and who not to in order to have those smuggling missions at Bezgayeth for years. More than anything, you need control. It's woven into every aspect of your personality. Stop, he demands. I ignore the warning completely, just like I ignored Mira's warning last year to stay away from him. You need to fix. Never mind, if you could mend, you wouldn't have brought me to Erasia. Let's try eliminating signets instead. You can't see the future, or you never would have led us to Athbeen. You can't wield any element, or you would have done so in Resin. I pause as a thought pushes past the others. Who knows? Stop before you go somewhere we can't come back from. Shadows move across the inches that separate us, winding up my calves as if he thinks he's going to have to fight to keep me at his side. Who knows? I repeat, my voice rising with my temper. Not that it matters, there's no one else for miles. And there are no sound seekers in Erasia capable of hearing across miles of distance, like Captain Greeley and General Melgren's personal unit. Hence, why our communication times lag. Do the marked ones know? Does the assembly? Am I the only person close to you who doesn't know, just like last year? My hand falls away from his arm. It's impossible to have a signet that no one has detected, no one has trained. Has he played me for a fool again? The space between my ribs and my heart shrivels and shrinks, my chest threatening to crumple. For fuck's sake, Violet, no one else knows. He turns toward me in a move so fast it would intimidate someone else, but I know he's incapable of hurting me, at least physically. So I merely tilt my chin and stare up into those gold-flecked eyes in blatant challenge. I deserve better than this. Tell me the truth. You've always deserved better than me. And no one knows, he repeats, his voice dropping. Because if they did, I'd be dead. Why would... My lips part, and my pulse jumps as my head starts to swim. He has to have full control. He has to make snap character judgments. He has to intrinsically know who to trust and who not to. In order for the movement to have been as successful as it was within the walls of Bezgayeth, he has to know everything. Zayden's most pressing need is information. Tern shifts, angling his body towards Sigail instead of beside her. Oh, gods. There's only one signet riders are killed for having. Fear churns in my stomach and threatens to bring up what little I've had to eat today. Yes. He nods, his gaze boring into mine. Shit. Did he just... No. I shake my head and take a step backward out of his shadows, but he moves as if he takes the step with me. Yes. It's how I knew I could trust you not to tell anyone about the meeting under the tree last year. He says as I retreat another step, how I seem to know what my opponent has planned on the mat before their next move. How I know exactly what someone needs to hear in order to get them to do what I need done. And how I knew if someone remotely suspected us while we were at Bazgayeth. I shake my head in denial, wishing I'd stopped pushing like he'd demanded me to. He crosses the space between us. It's why I didn't kill Dane in the interrogation chamber, why I let him come with us, because the second his shields wavered, I knew he'd had a true epiphany. How would I know that, Violet? He'd read Dane's mind. Zayden is more dangerous than I ever imagined. You're an intrinsic, I whisper. Even the accusation is a death sentence among riders. I'm a type of intrinsic, he repeats slowly, like it's the first time he's ever said the words. I can read intentions. Maybe I would know what to call it if they didn't kill everyone with even a hint of the signet. My eyebrows jolt upward. Can you read thoughts or not? His jaw flexes. It's more complicated than that. Think of that breath of a second before the actual thought the subconscious motivation you might not even be aware of in your mind, or when instinct drives you to move or you're looking to betray someone. The intention is always there. 
Mostly they come across as pictures. But some people intend in really clear pictures. Tern growls low in his throat and lowers his head at Segal as a rush of something bitter and sick floods our bond. Betrayal. I slam my shields up, blocking him out before I'm lost to his emotions, already struggling with mine. He didn't know. Another rumble of anger vibrates his chest scales, and my heart lurches with pangs of sympathy. Sigail draws back in retreat, shocking me to the core, but holds her head high, exposing her throat to her mate. The same way Zayden just metaphorically exposed his to me. All I have to do is tell someone, anyone, and he's dead. A soft roaring fills my ears. There are some secrets even mates can't share. Zayden says, his eyes locked on mine. But his words are meant for Tern. Some secrets that can't be spoken of, even behind the protection of wards. And yet you know everyone's secrets, don't you? Everyone's intentions. That's why intrinsics aren't allowed to live. The implications of his signet hit me with the force of a battering ram, and I stagger backward like the blow is a physical one. How many times has he read me? How many pre-thoughts has he eavesdropped on? Do I actually love him, or did he just say what I wanted to hear? Do the things I needed in order to... Less than a minute. Zayden whispers as Sigail moves toward him, toward us. That's how long it took for you to fall out of love with me. My gaze flashes to his. Don't read my whatever. Taren stalks toward me, his head low and his teeth bared as he places himself at my back. I didn't. The saddest smile I've ever seen tugs at Zayden's mouth. First, because your shields are up. And secondly, because I didn't have to. It's all over your face. My heart struggles to beat regularly, torn between slowing and sluggishly admitting defeat, and racing, no, rising to fight, in defense of the simple yet agonizing truth that I love him anyway. But how many more blows can that love take? How many more daggers are there in that metaphorical armoire? Gods, I don't know what to think. Nausea washes over me. Has he ever used it on me? Say something, he begs, fear streaking through his eyes. The roaring grows louder, the sound like a thousand soft drops of rain on a roof. My love isn't fickle. I shake my head slowly, keeping my gaze locked on his. So you'd better live, because I'm ready to ask you all the fucking questions. Silver one, mount, Tern bellows, demolishing the barrier of my shields like they're thinner than parchment. Wyvern! Zayden and I both spare a single glance to the edge of the cliffs. My stomach drops as I realize that the approaching gray cloud isn't a storm, and the roaring in my ears is actually wing beats. One heartbeat. That's all I wait. And then I'm turning, moving, sprinting across the frozen ground and racing up the ramp Tern makes of his foreleg to his shoulder. How many? I lower my flight goggles and blast the question down the mental pathway that connects the four of us as I climb into my saddle. Hundreds, Sigail answers. That's unfortunate. I force air through my lungs in measured breaths to keep calm, but my hand still trembles as I buckle the belt across my lap. The second I'm secure, Tern swings his body parallel to the cliffs and launches, throwing my weight back into my seat as he climbs rapidly with heavy, forceful wing beats. When we have enough altitude for air superiority, Tern banks left, flying in a tight circle until we face the flying horde. Then he pushes his wings back against the wind, abruptly halting our momentum and sending my body forward into the pommel as he hovers a hundred feet above the frozen field, leaving twice his body length between us and the cliff's edge. A little warning next time, I use our private bond. Did you fall? He challenges along the same, his wings rising and falling only often enough to keep us relatively in place. 
I decide to keep my retort to myself as Zayden and Segale arrive on our right, keeping a noticeable distance from the edge of Tern's wing. I'm sorry she didn't tell you. We will settle matters of emotion after matters of life. Noted. My stomach twists when I can make out individual shapes in the horde. Then, outright sours as evening sky appears between their wing beats. Thirty seconds, Terran estimates. I release the pommel and turn my palms up, opening the archive's door to Terran's power and letting it fill every cell in my body until the hum of energy I pick up on at the edge of the wards is replaced by the hum of energy that I've become. They're slowing, Zayden remarks as the horde spreads into a grouping I'm terrified to acknowledge looks like a formation. Bile rises in my throat as I count one, two, three, four. I count at least a dozen venin. Seventeen, Terran corrects in a growl. Seventeen dark wielders and a horde that rivals the riot at Eratia against us. We're dead if the words aren't up, if I messed up the translation. You didn't, Zayden replies, sounding infinitely more confident than I feel. Heat flushes my skin as my power seeks an outlet, but I keep it contained ready to be wielded as three wyvern break away from the grouping and fly closer. They hover a tail's length beyond the edge of the cliffs, their scales dull and gray, holes peppered through their wings as though they hadn't quite finished forming. They can feel the warts, I manage to say before my stomach abandons my body, plummeting like a rock. The rider on the center wyvern. Then they can die in them, too, Sigale replies. I can only make out vague facial features from this distance, but I know in my very bones it's him. The sage from Resin, the one who's taken up residence in my nightmares. His head turns noticeably from me to Zayden. He was in Resin, I tell him. I know. White hot rage shimmers along the bond. The sage lifts his staff, then swings it like a club pointing toward us. I love you, Zayden says as the wyvern closest to me banks away from the wards, falling into a turning dive, only to gain speed and climb again, leveling out behind the lead too, before flying straight for us. Even if you believe nothing else I ever say, please believe that. Do not speak to her as if death is a possibility, Terran snaps, slamming his own shields around us both, an impenetrable wall of black stone blocking out Zayden and Segale. I breathe deeply, using every ounce of concentration to keep my power contained and my emotions under control as the wyvern accumulates speed and flies past the lead, too. Heading for the wards. Time slows to heartbeats, my breath freezing in my heated chest. Then, the wyvern crosses the invisible barrier, and my heart stops beating altogether as its wings flap once. Twice. Prepare to dive. Tern swivels his head, his jaw opening as the wyvern closes the distance to less than a body length, and I brace for the maneuver. Never mind. The wyvern's wings and head sag, and its body follows suit, as though someone plucked out its life force. And then it falls, propelled only by its previous momentum, passing 40 feet beneath us and crashing into the field below, leaving a deep furrow before stopping. We should check... Its heartbeat ceased. Tern tells me, his attention already redirected to the other two wyvern along the border and the horde behind them. The wards work. The wards work. Relief restarts my heart. The sage swings his staff again and lets out a furious shout, sending the wyvern on the right who meets the same fate a few seconds later, impacting a short distance from the first one. Terran doesn't look when Sigale dives for the carcasses, but he does lower his shields. They're dead, Zayden confirms a moment later, and I glance down to see Felix arriving on his red sword tail. We're safe. I throw out my hands and release the searing energy within me, letting it snap free as I wield. Lightning cracks open the sky, striking a few feet from the remaining wyvern, and I curse under my breath. Close, but I didn't hit him. It's enough for the sage to call off the attack, and though I can't see his eyes from here, I feel the hatred of his stare locking on to me as he looks back before joining the rest of the horde.
That's it? I ask Taryn as he holds position, watching the wyvern become a cloud of gray once again. How anticlimactic. Now what? Now we stay long enough to be sure. And then we go home. We wait another three hours before flying back, long enough for Surrey to arrive and tell us of three similar incidents along the cliffs. We weren't the lucky recipients of a lone horde. It was a coordinated, simultaneous attack. But we survived. The joyous atmosphere is contagious when we walk into Ryerson House a few hours later, accompanied by Felix, and I'm promptly pulled into Rhiannon's hug. You got the wards up! Her flight letters are still cold from the night air, meaning she's just returned too. We got the wards up, I counter before I'm yanked out of her arms and smushed against Riddick's chest, then Sawyer's, as riders and flyers celebrate around us, the noise filling the cavernous space of Ryerson House's foyer, and somehow making the area feel smaller in the best way, less like a fortress and more like a home. We're needed in the assembly chamber right now, Zayden says, leaning past Sloan and raising his voice to be heard over the cacophony. Our eyes lock and I nod, keeping my shields firmly in place to block him out, which feels not only unnatural, but wrong. How ironic to celebrate a monumental victory and still feel like I've lost something precious. There hasn't been a second alone to discuss the fact that if my shields were down, he'd already know how fucked up my head is about the signet he's hidden. I can't imagine walking away from this, from us, but that doesn't mean that we don't have some serious issues we need to discuss. Nor that I'm not pissed as hell that he's given me another reason to doubt my own ability to trust my own judgment. And just because I can't imagine walking away doesn't mean I won't do it if we can't find some healthy ground. I'm quickly learning it's possible to love someone and not want to be with them at the same time. The second we walk into the assembly chamber and a guard shuts the door behind us, the noise outside falls away and eight pairs of eyes turn in our direction. None of them appear as happy as they should be, given what we've just accomplished. Serena and Mira break away from the assembly and walk toward us as Felix calls Zayden over from the dais with an urgent tone. We need to find time to talk, Zayden says quickly and quietly and I know he only says it out loud because I won't let him into my mind. Later, I agree just to end the conversation before Mira and Serena hear us. There isn't enough time in the world to process what he's told me. He walks away as they approach, and I peel my gaze from his back to give my attention to my sister. The tension in her face has power rising within me swiftly, my body preparing for battle. What's wrong? As soon as the attack was over, a missive was delivered to Ulysses, she tells me. He was at the Teria outpost, on the border with Navarre, I finish for her, anxious to get to the heart of the matter. Melgrin has asked us to meet with him tomorrow. He requested whomever represents our movement. No more than two marked ones allowed, along with Violet and Mira Sorengale. She reaches for my hand and squeezes gently. You can say no. You should say no. Why would the commanding general of all Navarian forces ask for a cadet and a lieutenant? My voice trails off, and I glance over to the dais where Brennan is locked in a quiet, heated discussion with the other six. Our mother will be there. And if a fight breaks out, we know it ends in his favor. Otherwise, he would never summon us. He's already seen the outcome. I stick that predicament on the growing list of things I'll have to deal with. There's something else you need to know, Serena says, drawing a dagger and placing it on her outstretched palm. With a flick of the flyer's wrist, the dagger rises a few inches, then spins when she twirls her index finger. It's a simple, lesser magic, something I learned last year. You can still wield. My heart sinks at the wider implications, and my shoulders sag. She nods solemnly. As glad as I am 
to not be stripped of my power. I'm sorry to say there's something wrong with your wards. Fuck. An excerpt from Navarre, an unedited history by Colonel Lewis Markham. The day Augustine Melgren manifested his signet changed warfare for the Kingdom of Navarre forever. Chapter 57 The irony of meeting at Athbeen is not lost on me, nor is the fact that this is the second time I'm visiting the outpost on the edge of the Esbin Mountain Range after finding out Zayden Ryerson has hidden pertinent information from me. I spent last night in the library, which was probably in the best interest of everyone as I continue to muddle through my thoughts. Intentions. What the fuck ever. Today, I'm bleary-eyed and restless, with more questions than answers. But as I glance over at Zayden, landing on Sigale's back, his face tense and drawn, I can recognize that telling me whether or not he wanted to was the ultimate gesture of trust. And this time, I'm not the last to know, I'm the first. Maybe it makes me completely, utterly foolish, but somehow that makes a difference. Even if I haven't had the opportunity to tell him that, or the opportunity to interrogate his ass about how many of my intentions he's read, I'm just not sure how many this times I have in me, no matter how much I love him. Our riot of ten lands in the clearing over the ridgeline from the outpost at noon, a full hour before we're due to meet, and four of the dragons back into the cover of the forest immediately, hiding in the shelter of the enormous evergreen trees that surround the field. The other six stand wing to wing, ready to launch at a moment's notice. You're sure they won't be able to tell they're here? I ask Tern, putting my flight goggles into my pack before sliding down Tern's foreleg. Landing on the frozen ground makes me wince. I'd woken up this morning with a hundred-year-old text stuck to my cheek and a throbbing ache in my neck. Not exactly, but there's no snow at this elevation to carry tracks. Dragons only sense each other mind to mind when we allow it. As long as they stay downwind, the others will know they're here but won't be able to identify how many or who has come. That's not exactly comforting, especially given who insisted on traveling with us. I stretch my arms up at the sun and roll my neck carefully to ease the stiffness in my muscles. After fighting Solus yesterday and accidentally sleeping on a table in the library last night, my body has had it with me, and I can't blame it. You are not a child in need of comfort. True, which only serves to remind me of the enraged adolescent I have waiting for me at home in Eurasia. After telling her there would be no logical way to explain her presence, even if Taryn carried her, which she was adamantly opposed to, and Darna cursed Taryn's entire family line, then blocked us both and went to practice with the elders. Taryn's only response had been a muttered expletive about the moods of adolescence. It doesn't escape my notice that Sigale stands between Tiny and Fawn, Ulysses' cantankerous green sword tail, not next to Taryn, which either explains or is a result of his surly mood this morning. Mom and Dad are fighting, and everyone knows it. Zayden crosses in front of Fan, completely unbothered by her snort of insult at his proximity and peels off his gloves as he approaches me. You didn't come to bed last night. His brow furrows as he makes a quick study of my face, then shoves the gloves into his pocket, and I mirror his emotions just in case we'll need to wield. Then I reinforce my shields. I was in the library with Dane, poring over Warwick's journal to see what I got wrong. We both fell asleep on one of the tables until Jacinia and a few others joined us for more study. I meet his gaze, then look away before I start pelting him with questions or do something even more foolish, like forgive him before getting answers. I thought Jacinia didn't speak old Lucerish. 
He barely glances at the riders who walk by and gather in front of Fan. We've brought three for Mira's unit in addition to members of the assembly. She doesn't, but Sawyer Smitten and the others were determined to help in any way they could. Even Kat, Marin, and Traeger had joined in a show of support. Did you find anything? The dragons raised their heads at a sound coming from the other side of the clearing, and the way they quickly lower them tells me everything I need to know. Early or not, this meeting is about to start. No, I answer, keeping my eyes on the trees and fighting the apprehension, trying to knot in my throat. The breath of life of the six and the one combined, and set the stone ablaze in an iron flame. What did I miss? If I had, you'd know it. Would I? His tone tightens. You would. My gaze jumps to lock with his. I appreciate you not trying to talk me out of coming. I learned my lesson at Corden. He searches my face but doesn't reach for me. Let me in. If only for a second, please, let me in. My chest tightens with every heartbeat as I hold his gaze. Exactly how much of this is mine to forgive? It's his secret. But I can't help wondering how much he's read into my own intentions. That's the part that has me hesitant, no matter how much I love him. Violet. It's the blatant plea in his tone that has me lowering my shields, just enough to feel our bond connect and the resulting relief on his face is palpable. If you decide to tell them what I am as punishment for the crimes I've committed against you, I'll understand. You want to discuss this now, of all times? I lift my eyebrows at him. I wanted to discuss this last night, but apparently you were busy working to save Tyrandor. His attention shifts to the trees, and Taren's shadow races across the brittle prairie grass, winding around us. Are you complaining? Our hands brush as we both turn to face whomever is coming through those trees. About you choosing the safety of my home over fighting with me? He scowls but laces his fingers with mine. No, but Mira approaches from behind Zayden, her stride confident, though two lines of worry are etched between her brows. I squeeze his hand, then let go. I need to know something. I run my hands down my hips, counting the blades sheathed there, all six of them. Did you ever use your signet to glean information to influence my feelings in any way? Never. He shaked his head, but his hands clench at his sides and the muscle in his jaw pops. But I have always lacked a certain element of self-control when it comes to you and our bond makes it way too easy for you to send your intentions without even realizing it. Death would be preferable to the embarrassment that accompanies that revelation. I could torch him if you would like, Tern offers, but you do seem attached. Heat flushes up my neck and stings my cheeks, reminding me of the times my scalp would prickle in his presence. You knew I wanted to kiss you that night by the wall. Gods, I can't even finish the question. The tops of the trees begin to sway. They've brought dragons. Yes, he glances at me, and you have my most sincere apology. Had I known what we would become, he shakes his head. Fuck, I probably still would have done it. Do you still do it? I have to know. No. I stopped the moment you were more to me than the general's daughter, the moment I realized the harm Dane had done, and that I was no better than he was. Except Zayden hadn't brokered the information he'd stolen and been responsible for killing Liam and Soleil. Yet, I've made some kind of peace with Dane, haven't I? Maybe I'm becoming complacent with betrayal because it's fucking everywhere. I'm not going to turn you in, I say quickly, looking up at him as Mira comes within hearing distance. But we'll be fighting about this later. I lift my brows. The muscle in his jaw ticks like he wants to say more, but he only adds, I will make myself available to you.
You ready for this? Mira asks, crossing in front of Zayden to stand beside me. No, I reply to Mira. Are you? No. She rests her hand on the pommel of the short sword sheathed at her hip. But she'll never know that. I want to be you when I grow up. A smile tugs at my lips despite the anxiety quickening my breaths. You'll be better than me, she counters, then looks over the top of my head to talk to Zayden. By the way, you couldn't convince him to stay in Eurasia? I don't wield emotions, and members of the assembly don't take well to being tied down and restrained. He reaches back over his shoulder and draws one of the swords strapped to his back with his left hand, leaving his right free to wield. If you're looking to influence mind work, find a flyer. I barely keep myself from jabbing him in his clever semantics, because the man clearly specializes in mind work. Here we go, Mira mutters as seven figures dressed in black step into the clearing. I palm a dagger in my right hand and crack open the door to the archives, letting power trickle into me. Melgrin walks at the center, his beady eyes shifting down our line of Eurasian riders. I don't need Kat's gift to heighten his anger. He wears rage like it's part of his uniform. I force myself to glance at the other members of their chosen party, only recognizing three, two of whom were mom's aides at one point or another. Colonel Fremont, second on the left, is a very powerful air wielder, I tell Zayden. He can suck the air straight out of your lungs. Thank you. Shadows rise in front of the three of us, curling in blade-like fingers at the level of our knees. Then, my gaze falls on Mom. She walks at Melgren's side, cutting through the field with quick, efficient steps, her attention split between Mira and me. The closer she comes, the more apparent her exhaustion. Deep bruises mark the space under her eyes, contrasting with her paler-than-normal complexion, even though the lines from her flight goggles indicate she's spending time in the sky. Mira tilts her chin and smooths her expression into a mask I envy, and do the best to emulate. The dragons follow, led out of the forest by Melgren's dragon, Coda. The utter nightmare of a black dragon immediately lowers his head as he stalks forward, and his golden eyes narrow at me. No, at Tarn, standing behind me. Fuck, I'd almost forgotten just how big he is, easily five feet taller than Tarn, numerous battle scars marking his chest scales and wings. Mom's dragon, I'm sir, follows prowling toward us at the same time the other five make their appearance, an orange, two reds, and a blue. Taren steps forward and lifts his head to hover over mine, a menacing rumble working its way up his throat. Don't drool on me, I joke, but it falls flat. The Navarian riders walk to the center of the field, and when Ulysses moves, so do we, leaving ten feet of empty field between our lines. Swords and daggers gleam with an easy reach on both sides. And here I was thinking you were dead, Ulysses, Melgrin starts, forcing a smile that's mostly bared teeth. And here I was hoping you were, Ulysses counters, using his height to look down his nose at Melgrin. No such luck, Melgrin replies. What happened to meeting at the outpost? He gestures back toward the trees. We have refreshments waiting if you'd care to- Probably poisoned, Taren adds, but he sounds slightly distracted, as if holding more than one conversation at once, probably because he is. We don't, Zayden interrupts. Speak your peace, Melgrin. Melgrin's gaze jumps to Zayden. We never should have let you into the quadrant. Regrets are truly a bitch, aren't they? Zayden cocks his head. Let's get to it. You may have nothing better to do with your day, but we're busy fighting for our continent. Nothing better, Melgren snaps, his face blotching. Do you know the destruction you caused by dropping those wyvern on the outposts? The lengths we went in order to keep it quiet. The civilians we had to- He stops himself, breathing deeply and straightening his shoulders. 
You almost tore down centuries of work, of tightly woven defensive strategy designed to protect the people within our borders. But only the people within your borders, Mira accuses. Fuck everyone else, right? Mom's eyes flash with barely leashed reprimand. Yes, Melgren turns that unnerving stare on my sister. When you abandon ship in the middle of a hurricane, you save those you can in the dinghy, then cut the hands off anyone else who tries to climb aboard so they don't pull you under. You're a callous asshole, she fires back. Thank you. Are we here for a reason? Zayden asks. You know, besides the evil villain lecture. Sunlight glints off the blade of his sword as he shifts his grip. We let you go, Melgren answers, glancing between Ulysses and Zayden. Let you take half the rider's quadrant cadets without so much as a fight. Let her go. His withering gaze slides over mine, and I lock my muscles to keep from shuddering. After she brutally murdered the vice commandant. Ever stop to think about why? My stomach clenches. I personally try not to think about you. Zayden replies, outright lying, but damn does he pull it off. You can't afford to lose the riders necessary to fight us, Ulysses answers. We're too expensive to keep, especially with the number of riders and the riot who chose to leave you. Perhaps, Melgren tilts his head, or perhaps I let you. My grip tightens on my dagger. Perhaps? The general draws out the word. I knew we'd need you for a coming battle. Highly unlikely. Who would they possibly be fighting behind the warts? I'll meet Malik before I fight for Navarre again, Ulysses snarls. You were always too quick to make important decisions, Melgren says with a sigh, patting his chest. That's why I didn't mourn your loss. Damn, that was harsh. This meeting is over, Ulysses starts, red rising up his neck and splashing onto his cheeks. They're going to overrun us at Samara, Melgren interrupts. Everyone quiets. I struggle to draw my next breath. Surely he didn't mean to say that. I look at mom and my knees weaken at the subtle nod she gives me. Even Mira tenses. I've seen it, Melgren continues. They come for us on solstice, and they win. Shit. He said exactly what he meant. A chill races up my spine as the blood drains from my face. If Samara falls, if any of the outposts do, Wyvern would have un- fettered access to parts of Navarre the ward extensions have protected for the last 600 years. Without the outposts, Vazgaeth's wards would rebound to their natural limits, only a few hours' flight reaching nowhere near the border. How? Ulysses challenges, and the riders from Mira's unit exchange disbelieving looks. Do me a favor, I say to Zayden. Forget feeling guilty about reading my intentions, and please read theirs. Everyone but the major on the right is shielded, but she's scared shitless and intends to do whatever she needs to get us to agree. He answers, shifting so his hand brushes the back of mine. Oh, and she wants to eat after this meeting and argue with your mother over her supposed affection for her daughters. Now put your shields up and block me and everyone else out. Holy shit, no wonder intrinsics aren't allowed to live. Zayden is both a jaw-dropping weapon and a frightening liability. I do as he suggests, only leaving space for Taren and the opaque, glimmering bond I feel with Andarna, even at this distance. How isn't how it works, Melgren folds his arms across his chest, and Coda bares his dripping teeth. All that matters is that we lose on solstice. They lose. If the wards are breached, there's no way to estimate the death toll. Every Navarian civilian between the border and the wardstone's natural limitations will be in mortal 
danger. Silver one? I'm fine. But I'm not. If you've already seen the outcome, then what the hell do you expect us to do about it? Ulysses challenges, lifting his hands as he shrugs. My head turns in his direction, but I bite my tongue before I can reply that he obviously expects us to help. Change the outcome by fighting at our side. Melgren frowns like he's being forced to swallow rotten fruit. In the battle I see, none of you are there. He glances at Zayden. And we're not going to be there. Ulysses shakes his head. We don't fly for you. No, we fly for... Wait, who do we fly for? Not just Eratia or even Tyrandor. And if we're willing to fight to defend the civilians of Poromiel, why wouldn't we fight to defend Navarians, too? No, but you do fly for the Empyrean, Mom interjects. Dragon kind won't stand aside if the hatching grounds in the Vale are compromised. Your mother is presumptuous to speak on behalf of dragon kind, Tern mutters. If the hatching grounds are compromised, losing one outpost won't take down the entire system and half your riot left with us, I remind her. And you're proud of that? What you caused may very well be the reason we lose this battle. The box-framed captain beside Mom snarls, lifting his short sword in my direction. I flip my dagger, pinching the tip in readiness to throw, but shadows jolt forward, knocking the sword from the captain's hand and putting him on his ass. Satan clicks his tongue and wiggles his pointer finger. No, no. I'd hate to lose the spirit of civility, wouldn't you? We were all getting along so nicely. God's damn traitor, the captain spits out, fumbling for his sword before finding his feet. Malik will meet you for your crimes. Mom sheathes the dagger I never saw her draw, her focus flicking between the captain and Zayden. Tried that. He didn't want me, or any of us, remember? Zayden scratches his relic with his empty hand. Enough, Melgren shouts. I don't expect you to ally yourself with us for nothing. Fight for us at Samara, and I have it on King Tari's word that we will respect the independence of your riot and the city you've taken refuge in. The breath freezes in my lungs. Does he know about Eratia? I can't tell. We will not conscript your citizens for our army, nor will we drag your people into a border war you have no chance of winning, Melgren shrugs. If you truly thought that, you would have invaded the second we left. Mira sounds like she's bored. Unless you saw the battles didn't go your way. This is the only offer, Melgren ignores Mira, focusing on Ulysses. If you are not our allies, then you are our enemies. Allies, that's the logical answer. I think we'll sit this one out, Ulysses says dismissively, as though he's rejecting an offer of tea. A kingdom who never comes to the aid of others doesn't deserve aid in their time of need. Personally, I think you all deserve whatever the dark wielders do to you. I blink everything in my body rebelling at the sentiment that civilians deserve to die because their leadership failed them, no matter who that leadership is. And you speak for your rebellion? Melgren's attention slides to Zayden. Or does the heir apparent? Zayden doesn't rise to the bait, nor does he argue against Ulysses' statement. But he's going to, right? The color drains from Mom's face as she looks between Mira and me, past us. And for the first time in my life, I see her wobble, like someone has knocked her off her center. Bootsteps sound behind me, but I can't tear my gaze away from the emotions crossing Mom's face in rapid succession long enough to look to see who it is. And honestly, I don't need to. We rule by committee. Brennan announces, his arm brushing mine as he stops between Mira and me. 
And I think I'm safe in speaking for the quorum when I say that we do not defend kingdoms who sacrifice neighboring civilians. His head turns toward mom and her eyes bulge. Let alone their own children so they can hide safely behind their wards. You will not escape the suffering you force the rest of the continent to endure. Brennan, mom whispers, and the urge to cross the line and hold her upright is almost too strong to fight. For fuck's sake, Brennan, Mira whispers. When all three of your children stand against you, perhaps the time has come for self-reflection. This meeting is officially over, Brennan states, his gaze locked on our mother. Your hatching grounds are not in danger, and our riot has their own to protect now. He places his hand over his heart. I mean this with every fiber of my body. We deny your offer of peace and happily accept war, since it sounds like you won't survive another two weeks to fight it. He pivots and walks away, leaving our mother to stare slack-jawed at his retreating back. Is that all there is to it? With Suri and Kylan in the woods behind us, the assembly truly has a quorum. But Zayden hasn't spoken. Right, Zayden nods, tension straining the muscles of his neck. If I were you, I'd try calling on the allies who helped win the Great War in the first place. Oh, wait. You cut off contact with them centuries ago. I suppose this really is farewell. I glance up at him and quickly school my features to mask my surprise. They're really going to leave them to die. We are going to leave them to die. Wrath shines in Melgren's narrowed eyes. We're done here. Do what you need to say goodbye he says to my mother before leaving the field, walking toward the trees as Coda moves with him, slinking backward and baring his teeth and warning for anyone foolish enough to attack his rider's back. All the Navarian riders beside Mom follow. Brennan, Mom whispers again, her shoulders folding inward as she covers her mouth with her hand. Her eyes water, and the pain I see there makes me look away. Our riders make quick work of mounting, leaving only Zayden, Mira, and me on the field. Why did you want to see Violet and Mira? Zayden asks, his tone devoid of sympathy. He's alive, Mom asks Mira, her voice faint in what I think has to be shock. Obviously, she replies, folding her arms. Mom's gaze shifts to me like I'm going to give her a different answer. He's the one who mended me after I took a venom blade in my side. Her eyes sharpen. You've known for months? It's appalling to be left in the dark, isn't it, Mom? Mira snaps. To feel lied to, perhaps even betrayed by your own family, no less? Mira, I chastise. She sacrificed you too, Violet, Mira reminds me. Maybe she put you into the rider's quadrant to save you from being killed as a scribe once you learned the truth. Or maybe she did it to kill you before you could learn the truth and tear her precious war college to the ground. She glances sideways at me. Which you did, if you remember. Mom straightens her shoulders and lifts her chin pulling herself together with astonishing, enviable speed. I need a word with my daughters, she says to Zayden. He arches his scarred brow, then looks to me for my decision. I nod. If what Melgren says is true and she's called to the front lines, this might be the last time I see her. The thought sickens my stomach. It's one thing to leave her, to cut any and all contact and quite another to leave her to her death. Zayden backs away without another word, only offering his back once he passes by Taren's claw. What do you want? 
Mira asks. I'm not sure that matters at the moment. Mom unbuttons her flight jacket with trembling fingers. But I want most. What I've always wanted is for my children to live. Whatever wards you've raised from the instructions in Warwick's journal will fail. Mira stiffens. Our wards are fine. She lies just as effortlessly as Zayden. They're not. Mom delivers a full lecture with a simple look. Cut open the bodies of the wyvern who died crossing your border yesterday. My lips part. Why ever would you think I'd be ignorant of activities on your border, Violet? Ignorant of where my dot children are? She shakes her head and dresses me down with a quick, cutting glance that makes me instantly feel like I'm five again, before turning to Mira. You remember what the carcasses of the wyvern looked like at Samara, the ones Ryerson so kindly delivered? Mira nods. The stones used to create them were nothing but cold, marked rocks. Stones? Do dark wielders have runes? Yes, I was there, Mira's tone sharpens. If you don't believe me, then check the wyvern you killed yesterday. And then what, I ask. Fix your wards. She pulls a leather notebook from her jacket, and my eyes widen with recognition. If you don't, they'll decline over time to nothing. Your father told me once that his research showed that Warwick never wanted anyone else to hold the power of the wards. He wanted Navarre to eternally hold the upper hand. But Lyra thought the knowledge should be shared. Warwick lied, I whisper. But about what? She hands me the journal I'd been tortured for stealing, then nails my soul to the ground with the intensity of her gaze. You have the heart of a rider, but the mind of a scribe, Violet. I'm trusting you not only to protect yourself, but to protect Mira and... She swallows hard. Brennan. I open the journal long enough to recognize the language as Moranian. My heart sinks for a second but I close the journal, undo the buttons of my jacket, and slide it into my inner pocket. Translating this one will be all on Jacinia. Moranian is one of the dead languages I can't read. She looks longingly over my shoulder, then glances at both Mira and me in turn. You don't have to understand my choices. You simply have to survive. I love you enough to bear the weight of your disappointment. Before either of us responds, she turns on her heel and walks past I'm Sir and disappears into the woods. Think she's full of shit? Mira asks. I think the flyers can wield. Good point. On the flight back to Eurasia, Mira and I break away from formation and head for the nearest wyvern carcass within our borders. Zayden stays true to his lesson-learned proclamation and doesn't argue when we separate from the riot. A half hour and some creative knife work on Mira's part, after locating the pair of wyvern bodies, Mira draws back a polished chunk of what appears to be onyx marked with a complex rune I couldn't even begin to replicate. And the damned thing is humming. Oh, shit. Is this why Wyvern have suddenly reappeared? Did someone give the Venon runes? As if the stone has called to its partner, the carcass twenty feet away shudders, and our heads whip toward the giant golden eye that blinks open. Fuck no, Mira whispers, drawing her sword but I'm already an open gate to Tern's power, and when I throw out my palms, it rips free, unleashed by my panic. Lightning cracks, flashing my vision to white and hitting its mark. The blast knocks Mira and me backward, slamming us against the cold, stiff body of the wyvern behind us. Pain ripples down my spine, but everything seems to be where it's supposed to as my ass hits the ground beside my sister. We both sit in stunned silence, watching the now smoking charred wyvern for signs of movement. You're 
Sure, lightning kills them, Mira asks after a few tense minutes. Certain, I answer. Thank Dune the Dark Wielders didn't stick around longer to see that. The cliffside would be littered with reanimating wyvern. She slowly turns her head to look at me, keeping an eye on the body. No pressure, but if you don't figure out what Warwick lied about, we're all fucked. Right, because I did such a great job the first time, and I don't even know Moranian. I'll have to rely fully on Jacinia to translate and compare the two. I draw a shaky breath. No pressure. An excerpt from The Journal of Warwick of Lucerus, translated by Cadets Violet Sorengale and Dane Atos. The combined hatching grounds at Bezgaith is our generation's greatest asset and our greatest liability. Chapter 58 Stubborn asshole, I mutter, turning just before the auditorium and heading to the sparring gym. Talking to Brennan has gotten me exactly nowhere over the last week, and his quick, effective dismissal of my genuine plea for him to reconsider the Assembly's position on the Samara problem has my blood boiling. I push the doors open a little harder than necessary and find the sparring gym to be as empty as I'd expect at ten at night in the middle of a weekend, and dimly lit by the cool glow of mage lights hovering above each individual mat. Zayden stands on the mat in the very center of the gym, feet apart and arms folded across his chest, wearing sparring gear and that carefully constructed mask of indifference he's known for. I thought you were kidding when I got your note. I close the door behind me, then focus on the lock and turn my hand in midair, channeling just enough power to hear the bolt slide home with a satisfying click. I haven't seen you in a week, and this is where you want to meet? He'd been sent to monitor Drathus right after our return from Athbeen. Figured we'd be fighting. What better place for that than the sparring gym? He stands completely still, waiting for me to come to him. His usual swords are missing, but he has two daggers strapped to his hip. You now have a warded bedroom, I remind him, stepping onto the mat. Though I'm not sure how strong those wards are, given that our method for raising Aratia's wards was obviously flawed. We now have a warded bedroom, he corrects me, his gaze sweeping over me hungrily as I walk forward, stopping only a couple of feet away from him. I can't blame him when I'm doing exactly the same, drinking in every detail of his appearance. Whether or not I'm still pissed about his latest reveal, I've missed him every minute he was gone, just like always. What exactly are we fighting about? The Assembly voting to leave Navarre to fend for itself, or the secret you kept from me again? His jaw flexes. The majority voted once we returned. And though the details of that vote are classified, I'll break regulation and tell you that I lost. Oh, the sharpest edge of my anger dulls. And you'd rather discuss the second issue in here? Where anyone can walk in and hear us? Unless there's a full intrinsic around, no one can hear us like this. He gestures to the empty gym. Extending a hand, he crooks his fingers at me. Come on, I know you're pissed, and no, I don't need the bond between us to catch on to that. It's in every line of your face, the purse of your lips, the tension in your shoulders. I purposefully relax my posture. You're right, you don't need the bond. See? Still pissed. He moves so quickly, I barely have a chance to get my hands up before he sweeps my feet out from underneath me. Shit. He topples with me, bracing my fall with one hand and catching his weight with the other. The wind may not have been knocked out of me, but I'm breathless all the same. My hands brace on his chest, and his face is inches from mine, filling my vision and blocking out the world around us. I'm not sparring with you. 
Why? His brow knits in confusion. You have a better teacher? I have heard that Emeterio is teaching you a variety of new techniques since then and adapt to our fighting styles so quickly. He is, but I'm not sparring with you because I really want to kick your ass. I shake my head, my braid catching slightly on the mat beneath me. Oh, you think you can hurt me? His slow grin makes me narrow my eyes. I shift a hand and whip a dagger from a sheath at my ribs, putting it against the warm skin of his throat, right along the swirling lines of his relic. I don't need to dignify that comment with a response. Fuck him. I make sure my shields are down so he hears it. His eyes flare with something that looks like pride, and he leans into the blade. I retreat, just enough that it doesn't draw blood. Guess we both just proved our point. You're capable of hurting me in ways I'm not sure you've even begun to fathom, Violet. I might be skilled enough to land a death blow, but you alone have the power to fucking destroy me. His hand slides out from behind my back to help bolster his weight. Now, we can talk here, or we can see if Sigail and Tarn are done fighting and fly through this snowstorm to the nearest vacant peak. But make no mistake, we're going to work this out. I slide the blade back into its sheath, then lift my hand to his chest again. On a sparring mat? His heart beats beneath my fingertips, strong and steady, unlike mine, which pounds like a drum. I've had a week to process, a week to wish he was around so I could yell at him, but also a week to ruminate on the logical reasons why he wouldn't have told me. The foremost of them being that he values his life. Sure as hell not in our bedroom. His knee separates mine. We don't fight in there. Since when? That's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard. It's the only private space we have in this entire house. Since right now. I just made that rule. No fighting in our bedroom. That's not how this works. Sure it is. He drops his gaze to my mouth. We make the rules when they come to us. Go ahead, make one. A rule? I draw my leg up, bracing my foot on the ground so I'll have leverage if I want it. But the movement also drags my inner thigh up the side of his hip. And damn if that doesn't instantly summon an ache he's in prime position to ease. Anything. We don't keep secrets. No more ask me, no more tests to see who's in and who's out of this relationship. It's full disclosure between us. I take a steadying breath and map out the golden flecks in his eyes, just in case it's the last time. Or it's nothing. Done. I'm serious. My hand slips up his chest to the juncture of his shoulder and his neck. Even though I know you were right, I wasn't asking the right questions because I was afraid of the answers. And maybe I still am, given the fact that you're never completely open with me. Almost everyone in my life has kept secrets from me because I didn't ask the right questions, didn't look further than face value. And I understand that there will be times you can't tell me everything. That's the nature of what we do as riders. But I need you to stop setting me up for failure by insisting I figure out what there is to ask. Done, he nods. I just, a muscle in his jaw flexes. You just? My fingers slide up the warm column of his neck and into his hair. I need to know you'll be here, that no matter what happens, you'll come back so we can talk it out or fight it out. His gaze drops to my mouth, then skims over my features. My heart clenches and I slide my hand along his chest, around his ribs, to his back. And then I hold on. Done. The lines between his brows smooth. I need you to know that no matter what information I hold, you trust me, love me enough to realize I'd never let it hurt you. I'm not the easiest person to know, but I've learned my lesson, believe me. Even if it's classified, I won't withhold any information that affects your agency. He swallows, 
then balances his weight on one arm and runs the back of his hand down the side of my cheek. I need to know you won't run. That you know you'll never have to. I love you, I whisper. You could throw my entire world into upheaval and I would still love you. You could keep secrets, run a revolution, frustrate the shit out of me, probably ruin me. And I would still love you. I can't make it stop. I don't want to. You're my gravity. Nothing in my world works without you. Gravity, he whispers, a slow, beautiful smile curving his mouth. The one force we can never escape, I tease. Then my smile falls. I mean it, though. I lift my brows at him. You have to let me all the way in. Or all the love in the world won't hold this together. I am a person who needs information to center myself. Done, he whispers. Want to know about my father? My grandfather in Sigale? The rebellion? Maybe something easier. Where's your mother? He startles, but quickly masks the reflex. No one talks about her, I continue. There are no paintings, no references to her being at the Caldeer executions. Nothing. It's like you were hatched and not born. The moment stretches between us. She left when I was young. Their marriage contract said an heir had to survive to the age of ten. And then she was free to go. Which is what she did. I haven't seen or heard from her since. His voice sounds like he dragged it across broken glass. Oh, my hand splays wide on his chest. I'm sorry. Now I feel like shit for asking. I'm not, he shrugs. What else do you want to know? Because I can't do this again. I can't go through months of uncertainty, fighting to get you back, not knowing if I've fucked up the only thing that really matters in my life. His eyes close briefly. Not that I won't, if that's what you need. When did it manifest? I slide my hand up to his neck. The signet. About a month after the shadows did. I'd already seen Carr kill another first year for reading minds. So when it hit, I held my shit together and went to Segale. And when Carr asked if I'd had any other strange abilities emerge, since they knew Segale had bonded one of my relatives, I lied my ass off. And when my ability to control shadows seemed stronger than they'd expected, they had no reason to dig deeper. A corner of his mouth tilts upward. It helps that the rider of record was thought to be a great uncle, not my grandfather. She's really the only one who knows? She is. She made me promise not to tell anyone. She thinks anyone who knows will have me killed or use me as a weapon. Shit, isn't that exactly what I did? The second we were with Melgren, I'd ask, no, he whispers, lifting a hand and brushing the backs of his fingers along my cheek. You asked me for the good of the mission, but you'd never use it for personal gain. He leans in, resting his forehead against mine. Tell me we're all right. Tell me this didn't break us. Promise you won't use it on me again. I hold his gaze and curl my fingers into the fabric of his shirt. I promise, he whispers, then kisses me softly. Now, do you want your presents? Presents? I arch my body up against his. You lost two of your daggers fighting Solus. I had two new ones made. A slow smile spreads across his face. Just have to disarm me, and they're yours. I slide my hand down his chest and do just that. December 19th. I write the date on the next blank sheet of parchment in my notebook, then stare. 
We're two days away from solstice, and still the assembly won't budge. But it's only an eight-hour flight to Samara, so I'm holding on to the hope that we'll do the right thing. Anything in Lyra's journal? Rhiannon asks as she slides into the seat next to me at battle brief. Nearly every head in our squad turns toward me, and the weight of their expectations forms a pit in my stomach. It's the same question every day, and I don't have an answer. I told you guys, once she finishes, I'll let you know. It only took one frustrating day trying to translate and failing before I handed it over to Jacinia. I haul my new conduit out of my pack and set it in my lap. Felix gave them to every second and third year last week, and theirs are out too, the riders imbuing shiny pieces of alloy for daggers with every spare second and ounce of energy they have. But mine has a special edition I asked him for after our battle with Solus, a strap of a bracelet to keep from losing it in combat. It's long enough to let the orb slide into my palm, but keeps it strapped to my arm in case I need to free myself for hand to hand. The flyers have been working on carving shimmering mayor sight arrowheads to fill their quivers as well. Over the last two weeks since our meeting with Melgren, the atmosphere has changed from war college to straight up war. There's a nervous energy in the house that reminds me of the charge in the air just before a storm. All second and third years are being instructed in runes. And even I can admit, Cat is still the best of our year. She's the only one of us who's mastered a tracking rune, capable of tracking someone else's rune. Mind-blowing. Our forge is glowing nonstop to produce weapons, and every rider has been pulled from the coastal outposts and pushed to the border regions, both with Navarre and Poromil. Settle down, Professor Devera orders from the center of the stage as Brennan joins her, and the theater quickly falls quiet. That's better. Riddick puts his feet up on the chair ahead of him, and Rhiannon swats them down, leveling a behave-or-else look at him. What? He grumbles, sitting up straight. You've heard the death roll for the last week. No losses to discuss. As most of you know, we have no new attacks to report. Devera begins, and Riddick shoots Re and I told you so raise of his brows. But what we do have is an updated map we think is over 90% accurate, thanks to flying patrols. She turns toward the giant map of the continent and lifts her hands. Red flags begin moving in an undeniable pattern, pulling away from known strongholds and gathering to the east. Most settle directly across the border from Samara, while a few red flags spread out along our border. They've left Pavis, Riddick notes leaning forward. They've left everywhere in the south, Sawyer adds. And the Tyrish border, too. The north, in the provinces of Signeson and Breivik, is still spattered with red. But not Zolia, Marin sighs a few seats down on the left, and Kat presses her lips in a tight line next to her. They obviously don't know our wards aren't operating at full strength. What can you ascertain from their reported movements? Devera asks, turning back around to face us. Brennan folds his arms in front of his chest and looks down at his feet before lifting his gaze to us. I know that look. He's feeling guilty. Good. They're preparing for the battle Melgrin foresaw a rider from Third Wing calls out. At least the assembly isn't keeping Melgren's request a secret. Just how they individually voted in regard to taking action on it. Agreed, Devera says, nodding in his direction. It's hard to get an accurate count, but we estimate upward of 500 wyvern. She glances at Brennan and, when he doesn't speak, continues. And there are dark wielders among them. A litany of swear words is mumbled throughout the theater. And why is it we're not engaging? Someone from First Wing asks. Because we're spiteful, Quinn says from behind me. What was that, cadet? 
Devera calls her out. Quinn shifts in her seat, but when I glance back, her head is held high. I said because we're spiteful, she repeats louder this time. Nailed it, Reese says under her breath. Brennan clears his throat. We're not engaging because the assembly voted and decided that the casualty rate among riders and flyers would be far too great. A battle this size could annihilate our forces, leaving the rest of the continent undefended. I shake my head at just how familiar that reasoning sounds. Some of us have family in Navarre, Avalyn says, a row in front of me with the other first years in our squad. Are we supposed to just sit back and wait to hear if they die? They should have left, a rider retorts from somewhere in the vicinity of Second Wing. Not everyone has the means to pick up their entire lives and move just because a war is coming, you elitist prick, Avalyn counters, her voice rising. She has a point, and the mutters of agreement throughout the wings rise in volume and pitch. This is not what Battle Brief is for, Devera shouts. We quiet down, but the energy has shifted, and it's not in a positive direction. Let's spin this another way, Brennan says. If you were Melgrin, what would you be doing right now? Shitting myself, Riddick answers. Brennan rubs the bridge of his nose. Other than that? Bolstering the wards, Rhiannon offers. As long as they remain at full power, this is all just bluster on the part of the enemy. Excellent point, Cadet Mateus, Brennan nods. So he has to choose between arming his forces or keeping the power supply concentrated in the armory? That question comes out of first wing. Another excellent point, Brennan agrees. What's the problem with arming the forces? Spreading out the daggers lessens the efficacy as a power supply for the wards, Rhiannon replies. Even if the energy isn't actively being spent killing dark wielders, the wards are still weaker. Right. Brennan looks straight at me. And what would you choose to do, Cadet Sorengale? Besides actually fight to defend innocent civilians? The words are out of my mouth before I can think twice about calling my brother out in public. If you were Melgrin, his head tilts, and from that look, I know I'm going to get the mother of all lectures after this. I study the map for a heartbeat. I'd have pulled every dagger from the coastal outposts to reinforce and boost the power supplies at the border outposts. They're powerless once they cross the wards. Wyvern die, Venon can't channel. That leaves them with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Or artillery, Kat adds. Exactly, I glance at her and nod. As long as the Navarian forces can physically repel the dark wielders, and keep them from scattering the power supply in the armory, then there's no real danger of incursion. And that's exactly my point. But Melgren saw them being defeated, a flyer from Second Wing says. Let's run with that thought, Devera gestures at the map. Should the wards at Samara fall, what would happen? They'd have a direct line to the hatching ground? Someone answers. No, I reply. That portion of the wards would fall back to its natural distance, about a three or four hour flight from Bezgaith, just like ours. The power supplies in the outposts extend the wards. They don't create them. So while a large piece of Navarre would be unprotected, blinking my gaze finds my brother's. He nods. Melgrin was bluffing banking on us not fully understanding how the wards work. He used a scare tactic to get us to agree to fight. Did you want to finish that thought, cadet? Devera asks. My mind spins as my heart lurches into my throat. I stare at the map, at the thin line of the border that remains uncrossed by what appears to be an undefeatable legion of the enemy and a thought so terrifying I can barely reach for it begins to take hold. How old is this information? 
I'm sorry? Devera's brows rise. How long have they been sitting on the border? I clarify, my nails biting into the palms of my hands as I tighten my fists, pushing down the fear threatening to consume me. She glances at Brennan, who replies, They've been there for three days. This morning's report confirmed they haven't moved. Oh, God. We act now, Tern's voice rumbles through my head. I stuff everything into my bag as Devera calls on another rider to answer a question. What are you doing? Re asks in a whisper, and I notice almost every member of my squad has turned to watch. I need to find Zayden. I sling my pack over my shoulders and slip my arms through the straps, preparing to stand. It's not Samara. All right, Rhiannon puts her things away and the rest of the squad follows her lead. We're coming with you. There's no time to argue, so I nod and we all file out, earning us a few shouted protests from Devera. But the sound only blurs into the roaring in my ears as my thoughts spin faster and faster. The hallway is relatively empty, since every cadet is at battle brief, making for a quick exit from the western wing of the house. Where are you? I ask down the bond. In a strategy meeting in the assembly chamber, Zayden answers. Why? I'm headed your way. I need you. We pass the doors to the history classroom and then the great hall. Is anyone going to tell us why we just walked out of battle brief? Kat asks, a few steps behind me. Violet has a look in her eyes, Rhiannon explains, keeping up at my side. The same one she had before the squad battle last year, Sawyer says. She's onto something, and from our experience, you just roll with it, Rhiannon finishes. Zayden walks out of the assembly chamber and heads straight for me, meeting us in the middle of the hallway. What's wrong? It's not Samara we have to worry about. Why? He keeps his eyes on me, despite the shuffling of my squad mates. Because they're sitting there waiting, I explain. They've been waiting for three days. Why? If I knew their thought process, this war would be over, he replies. Melgren says they're overrun on solstice. That's the day after tomorrow. Gods, we have to move quickly. He nods. Wyvern aren't going to take down the wards at Samara. They can't fly past them. Plus, smaller hordes were moved along the full border. I think Samara is just a distraction. I think they're waiting for them all to fall. His eyes flare for a heartbeat. The battle can't take place somewhere else, Sawyer argues. Melgren would see it. Not if we're there, Sloan counters. Melgren can't see the outcome if three of us are there, remember? She holds up her forearm where her relic winds above the edge of her sleeve. Exactly. My fingernails bite into my palms. He can't see the real fight if we're there. He has all his forces concentrating on Samara when they should be at Bezgaith. Zayden finishes my thought, his eyes searching mine. The veil. Yes. Do you want to go back? He asks. Of course we do, Riddick answers. I wasn't asking you. Zayden holds my gaze. Do you want to go? Do I? Navarre has lied to their people, lied to us for 600 years. They would never come to our aid, Sloane says. They've definitely never come to ours, Kat agrees. They've let Peromish civilians die time and again, safely tucked behind their wards, pulling the blindfold over Navarian citizens' lives. The hatching grounds are there, Rhiannon argues. We have our own here, Traeger counters. At least I think it's Traeger, since I can't seem to look away from Zayden. He's the stable ground beneath my feet as my mind spins faster and faster, my squad mates voicing contradicting opinions that match my own thoughts. My family is in Moraine, Avalyn pleads. The voices behind me blur as they truly begin to argue. We'd have to leave almost immediately, Zayden says, his voice cutting through the noise. They lied to us, executed your father, tortured me. I force myself to stop counting their transgressions before they overwhelm my conscience. Yes. I keep thinking about the infantry cadets and the healers and even the scribes. People like Kaori stayed behind, those who just want to defend their homeland. Reaching forward, I grasp onto his arms to hold steady as the argument rages around us, and I get the distinct impression by the increase in volume that we're not the only squad out here anymore. Yes, 
If we don't go, we're no better than they are, leaving their civilians to die, when we might be the very weapons they need. My grip tightens on him. Do you want to fight? He asks, leaning down as the argument lessens around us, everyone waiting to hear what I say next, probably. Say the word, and I'll take it to the assembly. And if they won't support it, we'll go with whomever will. I go wherever you go. The thought of risking my friends, losing them, has my stomach churning. I don't want to put Ternan and Darna into danger. I would rather die than gamble with Zayden's life. But is there really a choice? Going might risk death, but staying risks us becoming just like our enemy. We have to. An excerpt from Tern's Personal Addendum to the Book of Brennan, as quoted by Cadet Violet Sorengale. We do not eat our allies. Chapter 59 I can make it on my own, Andarna argues three hours later as cadets scurry into our hasty and unauthorized formation in the center of the valley. It's an 18-hour flight, I remind her, checking all the joints of her new harness. Thank God she's still only half the size of Sigale now, so Taren can still carry her. I respect your decision to come, but this is the only way. She can only fly for an hour or two before her wing muscle completely cramps. And you think I should be carried like a juvenile? She huffs a breath of steam as I walk underneath her and fit my fingers between her scales and the smooth metal that curves under her shoulders. I think Taren is capable of bearing your weight. You can fly until you tire or hold back the riot, but wearing a harness for quick clipping in is the only way I'm letting you come. I'm not risking you getting left behind if you fall out of formation. I tug at the steel just to be sure it doesn't give like mine did when we flew back to Bezgayeth last summer. I get it, you don't want to be carried. Sometimes I don't want to fly in a saddle, but it's what I need in order to ride. It's your choice. You can come back in the harness, or you can stay behind. Dragons do not answer to humans, she bristles, straightening her posture. No, but they do answer to their elders, Taren grunts, his claws flexing in the green grass beside us. Only to the eldest of our den, she counters, as I walk out from under her, careful not to step on my flight jacket and pack that I've left on the ground. It's too damn hot up here to be dressed for the reality of December. Sure, I'll just go ask Coda really quick, I quip sarcastically, jumping backward when a griffin barrels by at full speed. They might be slower than dragons in the sky, but they're frighteningly fast on the ground. They're also less than happy about being left behind, according to Marin. Try not to get killed before we get there, Vi. I think we might need you. Riddick teases from my left, waiting in front of Atrum, who snaps at the next griffin who races by a little too close. I half expect to see feathers fall from between his teeth when he draws back his head. Perhaps I will be the eldest of my own den. And Darna arches her neck, tracking a flock of birds in the sky. I follow her line of sight and quickly look away when the brightness of the sun stings my eyes, burning into my vision for a second and making her scales look a shiny sky blue before I blink the spots away. I'm still in my middling years, Taryn grumbles. You'll be waiting a while. Really? She shimmies the harness into a more comfortable position. I figured you were decades into your elder era. You certainly act like it. Taryn turns his head slowly, his eyes narrowing on Andarna. You don't act a day over a hundred, I reassure Tern, then offer a smile to Marin as she approaches with Kat. I hate that we can't come, Marin says, swinging her leather rucksack from her shoulders. We're supposed to stick together as a squad, right? You wouldn't be able to wield, I remind her as she crouches, digging through her pack. The second you cross Navarian wards, you'd be defenseless and targeted by riders and venom alike. That's not a great combination. And we'd slow you down. We've heard it, 
Kat folds her arms in front of her chest, surveying the chaos as Fierge lands ahead of us, flaring her wings before touching down near Rhiannon. Doesn't mean we don't feel like shit that you're all rushing off to battle while we study. I'm not so sure about the study part, since I think that's Devera's red club tail up there, Riddick adds, pointing toward the head of the formation. Here, Marin pulls out a small crossbow and leather-capped quiver from her pack, then stands. Hate to tell you this, but you're awful with a longbow. Um, thanks? This will give you a secondary weapon if you run out of daggers. Just pull back the string until it catches here, then knock the arrow in the flight groove. She points to the center of the bow. And pull the lever with your forefinger. It's compact and won't take too much strength to operate. The gesture is so kind that a lump grows in my throat. It's perfect. Thank you. I take the weapon from her, but she pulls the quiver just out of reach. These are all Maosite arrowheads, imbued and ruined to explode on impact. She lifts her dark brows. They're cushioned in the quiver, but do not drop this. Got it. I take the quiver from her, then slip them both into my pack. The assembly won't budge, Zayden says. He's dressed in full flight gear, his sword strapped across his back as he walks with my siblings. Stubborn assholes. Mira's also dressed for flight. Her sword sheathed at her side, but Brennan isn't, and the anger simmering in my brother's narrowed gaze is aimed straight at me. They won't fight even knowing the hatching grounds are at risk, Riddick challenges, heading our way with Sawyer, Imogen, and Quinn. They think we're wrong, Zayden answers. They think that rushing into enemy territory with untrained cadets is a mistake, Brennan snaps. And I agree, you're going to get cadets, including yourself, killed. It's not like we're taking the first years, Rhiannon says, fastening the straps of sheaths around her flight jacket. Which is bullshit, Arik bites out, Sloane and the other first years walking up with him, all wearing flight leathers and determination. We have just as much right to defend the hatching grounds as second and third years. The pleading yet accusatory look he gives me sinks my heart. He has just as much right, maybe more so, to defend Navarra as anyone here. None of you are going, Brennan starts. You'd rather stay here knowing there's every chance mom will die? I step toward my brother, and Mira pivots to my side, facing Brennan. He flinches, his head drawing back like I hit him. She had no trouble sending any of the three of us to our deaths. Brennan's gaze jumps between Mira and me, looking for understanding that neither of us gives him. We don't have time for this, Zayden lectures. If you aren't coming, Brennan, then that's on you. But if we don't leave now, there's a chance we'll be too late to defend Bezgaeth. He turns, pointing a finger at the first years. And absolutely not. Most of you haven't even manifested a signet, and I'm not serving you up with your dragons as another energy source. I've manifested, Sloane protests, grasping the straps of her rucksack. And you're still a first year, Zayden counters. Mateus, get your squad ready to launch, then find your wing leader for further orders. We'll need to fly straight through. I'll take Violet with the- With all due respect- Rhiannon straightens her posture and stares him down. Unlike war games, second squad flame section fourth wing will remain intact. Though you're welcome to join us. Sawyer and Riddick move to my sides. And I know if I fall back, Quinn and Imogen will be there waiting. Zayden lifts his scarred brow at me, and instead of contradicting Rhiannon, I glance at my sister. Same goes for you. You're welcome to join, but I stay with my squad. The wind blows bitterly cold against my face nearly 18 hours later as we cross into the Moraine province and follow the Jacobus River through the winding mountain range that leads to Beskayeth. I've never been so thankful that my body heats when I channel. Everyone else in our party must be frozen to the core. 
It's a testament to General Melgren's certainty about Samara that we aren't stopped by any patrols, because there are none. Even the mid-guard posts are devoid of riders as we fly over in a riot of 50 led by Tarn and Segale. We may have left the first years behind, but we also gained some of the active riders who hadn't been stationed along the cliffside border, like Mira, who's flying with Tiny directly behind me, as if she's scared to let me out of her sight. I'm sir is indeed within the veil. Tiny will relay communications for the squad while you locate your mother. Tarn finishes telling me the plan devised by leadership mid-flight that will allow us to recon, then adjust to whatever we find waiting for us. My assigned task is to get through to my mother. No pressure or anything. When we reach the upcoming bend in the river, you'll release your harness from mine. Tarn tells Andarna, fly to the Vale and stay there. An adolescent black dragon will raise human suspicion at Bazgayeth. Hide among our kind until it's over. What if you need me, like last time? I can stay hidden right at your side. My heart clenches at the memory of how she'd appeared on the battlefield, even after I'd begged her to stay hidden. She'd risked her life to help us and nearly lost it in the process. Stay with the Feathertails. They'll need all your protection if the wards fall. And report anything the second it feels off. If we're too late, then gods help us all. At the bend in the river, Andarna detaches and flies alongside us until the beats of her smaller wings can't keep up, then dives toward the ice-crusted river beneath us. The veil, I remind her. I will be where I am needed, she counters, banking left, leaving the trail of the river in favor of the snow-capped ridgeline that leads back behind the flight field and up into the veil. That didn't sound like she intends on listening, I tell Tarn, watching her until she fades from view. I warned you what adolescents are like. He tucks his wings and dives, leaving my stomach behind as we drop a thousand feet in altitude in a matter of breaths, then levels out once we're only a hundred feet above the tall oak trees that line the river, approaching Bezgayeth from the south. Everything looks as it should in the dying evening light identical to when we left six weeks ago, simply covered in a fresh coat of snow. I look over my shoulder to see half the riot, first, second, and third wings, break off, heading toward the flight field. As long as everyone sticks to the plan, the next quarter will land in the courtyard of the quadrant while the rest of us continue onto the main campus. Can you sense anything off? I ask as the walls of the rider's quadrant come into view. Only half the windows in the dormitory are lit from within. An ache settles in my chest. No matter what cruelty transpired here, there's an enormous part of me that considers this place home. It's where I studied, where I climbed trees with Dane, and where my father taught me the wonder of the archives. It's where I fell in love with Zayden and learned just how much had been omitted from those very archives. The wards are still up. We've made our presence known to the Empyrean, and I can definitely sense their displeasure, if that's what you mean. We cross over the courtyard, and tail and claw sections peel off the formation, with Devera in the lead, causing untold damage to the masonry as they land wherever they'll fit along the walls. But Grime is in residence, and she's reaching out to her mate, who is at Samara to contact Coda. At what point will you and Sigale be able to cover distances like that? We pass the parapet in nothing more than a heartbeat, and then Tarn banks left. Years. Grime and Maze have been mated for many decades. He races over the bell tower of the main college of Bezgayeth, then flares his wings and beats them backward, halting our momentum to the sound of alarmed cries from the watchmen in the four towers, shouting down their warnings. There are people down there, I tell him as he sinks gracefully into the main campus's courtyard. They'll move. Sure enough, people scurry, scattering out of his way as he lands. Should you change your mind, I'll simply claw through the roof to reach you. I unbuckle quickly, unstrap the bag of daggers I was assigned to carry. Each of us has one, and climb out of the saddle. I'll be all right, I promise, 
working to his shoulder without so much as removing my flight goggles or tightening the straps on my pack. Speed matters, since only one dragon can land here at a time. I'll be alone until Segail follows. My muscles protest the sudden movement after hours of riding, but I make it to his shoulder. Then slide down the familiar ridges of his scales until my feet touch ground at Bezgaith. The second I'm clear, slipping the strap of my bag to my shoulder, Tern launches skyward. He's strong but also heavy, and his talons barely clear the roof line of the infantry quadrant as he flies off. Officers stand in stunned silence against the walls, staring at me with blatant shock. And I open the archive's doors just a crack to fill my body with enough energy to wield just in case one of them decides to make a move. Hands up, I scan the threats around me, taking note of the one captain in navy blue reaching for his sword. I retreat toward the wall beside the stairs leading up to the administration building until I feel frozen stone against my back. Sigail lands an instant later, momentarily obscuring my view of my would-be enemies, and Zayden dismounts, shadows in one hand and a sword in the other as he echoes my previous movements, giving only me his back as he retreats to my side. When Sigail launches from the courtyard, Tiny sweeps down, taking her place in perfectly timed coordination. Movement up the stairs catches my attention, and I pivot, putting myself between Zayden and my mother as she descends with slow, deliberate steps, her hand on the hilt of her sheathed short sword, Nolan a few steps behind her. Here we go. Shadows stream around me, racing across the cobblestones and stopping at the first step just as my mother reaches it. Her sigh is pure annoyance, and twin bruises lie in half circles beneath the eyes she narrows at us. Mom, power crackles, lifting the loose tendrils of my hair as I glance back at the man who helped hold me prisoner. Really, Violet, you couldn't use the front door? She glances at Mira, and then her gaze turns upward as Kath descends. Her face falls, but she holds her posture rigid as ever. He's not with us, Mira says, holding her sword pointed at the captain who's been working his way out. In fact, he's pretty pissed we came. Mom's head tilts slightly in a movement I know means she's talking to I'm, sir. Seems we've been fully invaded. We're not here to fight you. We're here to fight for you, I tell her. You might not believe me, but your wards are in danger. Our wards are perfectly fine, as I'm sure you can feel. Mom crosses her arms as Dane joins us. Oh, for fuck's sake. She calls across the courtyard. Hollin, open the damned gates before one of these dragons takes off the roof. She looks pointedly at the shadows blocking her path. They lift, retreating to the tips of my boots. Let the others know the gates are opening, I tell Taryn. I will position myself accordingly. A full minute later, the guards throw open the gates, revealing the rest of our squad dismounting. Trust me, Mom, the battle you're expecting isn't at Samara, it's here. I explain my line of thinking in the few minutes it takes for my squad mates to reach us. Someone is going to take down your wards. Not possible, cadet. She shakes her head as night descends in true around us. They're heavily guarded every moment of every day. The biggest threat to the wards would be you. Let us check, Zayden says at my back. You know your daughters would never strip Navarre of its protection. I know exactly who my daughters are, and the answer is no. Her dismissal is curt. You're lucky to be alive crossing enemy airspace. Consider retaining your lives a personal gift. I think not, Mira's gaze sweeps the courtyard. This courtyard should be full at this hour with soldiers returning from mess, and yet I only count five soldiers, one captain and four cadets, and no, I'm not counting the healers in the corner. You've sent every available body to Samara, haven't you? The temperature in the courtyard plummets from freezing to nearly unbreathable. The guards behind you have signets and mind work, mother. In fact, I'd bet money that the most powerful writers on campus are you and who? Professor Carr? Mira moves forward fearlessly, 
Our forces can render aid or conquer. It's your choice. Mom's nostrils flare as ten seconds pass. If you won't take them to the wards, Dane says from somewhere behind me. I will. My father showed me where they are last year. Which is precisely why he's with our squad. Who do you want to be? The general who saves Besgaeth, or the one who loses it to the very cadets who rejected your lies? I lift my chin. Black really does suit you, Violet. It might be the nicest thing she's ever said to me. Like Captain Soren Gale said, it's your choice. We're wasting time, I retort. With night fallen, it's officially solstice. Mom's gaze jumps to Mira, then slides back to me. By all means, let's inspect the wards. My shoulders dip in relief, but I keep my power at the ready as we climb the steps into the administration building, swallowing the knot of apprehension in my throat as we approach Nolan. Violet, he starts. Just the sound of his voice makes bile rise in my throat. Stay the fuck away from Violet, and I'll consider letting you live, if only to mend riders, if there's a battle coming. Zayden warns the mender as we pass him near the entryway. Mage lights glow above our heads as we walk into the familiar halls, a pair of healers scurrying by, coming from the direction of the mess hall where another group of cadets in pale blue peer out of the doorway. Crod is worried, Tern remarks, his voice tense. What would Garrick's dragon be worried about? Zayden asks on the pathway shared by all four of us. Runes, Sigail answers. That's right. The brown scorpion tail found the lure in Resin because he's highly sensitive to them. Basgaeth was built on runes, I remind them. This is different. He senses the same energy that he detected in Resin. Tern's tone shifts. His rider officially has control of the dormitory with Devera. Garrick's in place. Mom leads us down the hallway and into the northwest turret, then descends the spiral staircase that reminds me so much of its southern counterpart that my breath catches at the scent of earth. Drip, drip, drip. I hear the sound in my mind as clearly as if it were real, as if I were back in that interrogation chamber. Zayden's hand takes mine, lacing his fingers through my own. You all right? He asks. Shadows wrapping around our joined hands, their touch as soft as velvet. For a second, I debate playing it off. But I was the one who demanded full disclosure, so it only seems fair that I give it. It smells like the interrogation chamber. We'll set that room on fire before we leave, he promises. At the base of the stairwell is nothing, just a circular room paved with the foundation stones. Mom looks to Dane, and he walks past her, examining the pattern, then pushing on a rectangular stone at his shoulder height. It gives and stone scrapes stone as a door swings open in the masonry, revealing a mage-lit tunnel so cramped it would give even the bravest person claustrophobia. Just like the archives, I tell Zayden. Mom orders her accompanying soldiers to stand guard. In return, Rhiannon orders Sawyer and Imogen to guard them as we walk into the tunnel. Mom goes first. What happened to being guarded? Zayden asks, walking ahead of me. Mira's at my back. The wards are guarded, she says, turning sideways when the tunnel narrows even farther. Wouldn't you find it suspicious if guards were stationed at the bottom of an empty stairwell, she challenges. Sometimes the best defense is simple camouflage. I walk sideways, breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth, and try to pretend I'm somewhere, anywhere, else. We're going to have fun, you and I. Varish's words slide over me and my heart rate jumps. Zayden's shadows expand from our hands to my waist, and the pressure there feels like his arm is around me, making it bearable to get through the passage for the twenty feet it takes to open up wide again. The tunnel runs for what looks like another fifty yards before ending at a glowing blue archway, and the hum of energy from what I assume is the ward stone vibrates my very bones, tenfold the intensity of the one at Erasia. See? It's gar- Mom's words die, 
and we see them the same moment she does. Two bodies in black uniforms lie on the ground, pools of their blood slowly expanding toward each other. Their eyes are open, but they're glazed and vacant, freshly dead. My heart lurches as the shadows fall away with Zayden's hand as we both reach for weapons. Oh, shit, Riddick whispers as the others file through the bottleneck behind us, drawing swords, daggers, and battle axes. Metal slides against metal as Mom pulls her sword, then breaks into a run, sprinting down the tunnel. No chance you'd stay here if I, Zayden starts. None, I say over my shoulder, already racing after my mother down the long expanse. The vague sound of barked orders echoes off the tunnel walls as Mira catches up quickly, then passes me to run at my mother's side while Zayden keeps pace with me. Do you know where the ward chamber opens to the sky? I ask Taren as my boots pound the stone floor of the corridor. It has to, if it's constructed anything like Eurasia. According to you, I cannot supply fire to more than one. He pauses as though taking stock of my situation. On my way. No! Mom's shout sends chills down my spine as she and Mira make it to the chamber ahead of us, both charging left, weapons high. The rest of us reach the chamber, and before I can assess the situation, Zayden's shadows jerk me off my feet and into his chest as he spins us backward, pressing my spine against the wall of the archway as the points of an orange's scorpion tail swing through the very place I'd been standing. There's a fucking dragon in there? Are you? His eyes fly wide. Didn't get me, I assure him. He nods, relief shifting my gaze from worried to alert, and we both turn into the entrance, quickly joined by Riddick, Rhiannon, and Dane. My mouth drops, and power charges through my veins so potent my hands buzz. The wardstone is twice as large as the one in Eurasia, as in the chamber that houses it. But unlike Eurasia's, the rings and runes carved into it are interrupted by a diamond pattern. And unlike our wards in Eurasia, this ward stone is on fire, lit on top by black flames that sputter and flare as a dragon emerges from behind the left side of the stone, driving Mom and Mira back toward us. Not just any dragon. Bade. Get out of there, Tern orders as Bade lowers her head, and I get a single glimpse of her eyes, opaque instead of golden. Before Mom charges toward her nose, lifting her sword to swing, Bade knocks her aside with a single swipe of her head, and Mom flies into the stone wall of the chamber, cracking her head before falling into a heap. Zayden throws his hand out, and shadows stream past, grasping both Mira and Mom, pulling them back to us as Bade roars, steam and spit flying from her mouth. She stalks forward, her talons clicking on the floor as she maneuvers around the stone, revealing Jack. Barlow in his seat on Bade's back. The smile he gives me twists my stomach. You're right on time, Soren Gale. Anytime you want to show up would be very appreciated, I tell Tern as Zayden's shadows release Mira at my side, but drag my mother's unconscious body back through the archway. I can't wield in here, not without endangering everyone. Besides, the charge of the stone would draw every strike to it. It's not exactly an easy location to get to, Tern growls in reply. What the hell are you doing, Barlow? Dane snaps. What I promised, he answers, glee shining in his eyes. Zayden sends another stream of shadows, this one shooting toward Barlow, and Bade drops her jaw, her eerie eyes flashing as fire glows up her throat. Zayden! I yell as Riddick pushes past me, past all of us, and throws his arms forward, palms out. Get down! Riddick shouts, and I glimpse a wall of ice rising before us as Zayden pulls me into the shelter of his body and crouches. The chamber glows orange for a heartbeat, then two, as fire rages against the stone walls. Riddick screams as the blast dies. The second the fire ceases, we're on our feet to face Barlow and Bade, but the dragon has disappeared behind the ward stone again. I've got him! Rhiannon rushes forward and hooks her arm under Riddick's, then hauls him back from where only a puddle marks where the wall of ice had stood. Nothing prepares me for the sight of Riddick's burned hands, blistered and bleeding. We'll take the left, Zayden says, glancing at me. Taking right, Dane agrees, shooting a look at Mira, who nods. Satan and I run to the left, and I flip the dagger in my hand, pinching it by the tip in readiness to throw as we round the corner. What the fuck? 
Fade is up on her back legs, her front claws grasping the top of the flaming ward stone, and Barlow isn't in his seat. It takes a precious second we don't have to spot him holding on to the top of Bade's neck, clutching one of her horns. Not even Zayden is fast enough to stop the downward plunge of Jack's short sword between the scales alongside Bade's neck. The dragon's cry shakes the foundation of the chamber and stops abruptly when Jack pushes the blade all the way through the front of her throat. Jack's head swings in our direction, and he wields an outward-facing palm, throwing a shield that deflects Zayden's shadows as blood sprays from Bade's throat onto the ward stone. The black flames extinguish an instant before Bade collapses, her weight pitching forward. The ward stone tips and Jack fumbles to hold on, giving me the perfect opportunity to flick my wrist and release the dagger. I hear a satisfying cry as Zayden grabs hold of my waist, throwing up a wall of shadow that blocks out the chamber around us, but doesn't shield us from the noise of the stone crashing, cracking. The humming stops. The wards have fallen. An excerpt from Magic, A Universal Study for Writers by Colonel Emazine Ruthorn. At its core, magic demands balance. Whatever you take will be recouped. And it is not the wielder who determines the price. Chapter 60 Zayden drops the shadows, and we both turn at the same time to survey the damage. My heart seizes, and I reach out for Zayden's hand reflexively. The ward stone lies in two pieces on the ground, and there isn't a flame in sight. Holy Dune, Novar is defenseless. There's no seeing over Bade's body to check on Mira, so I whip my gaze to the right, meeting Rhiannon's wide eyes where she stands at the front of the archway, protecting Riddick and my mother. Jack stumbles backward from the blow of my dagger, a dazed but elated look twisting his face as he wrenches it from his shoulder and drops it to the floor. He only has minutes, I whisper to Zayden. Barlow has just killed his own dragon. It's unfathomable, impossible. And yet Bade is most certainly dead as Jack falls to his knees and laughs up at the sky fifty feet above us. Mira appears, moving silently around Bade's corpse, and Zayden gives her a subtle shake of his head when she lifts her sword. She keeps it poised for attack, but doesn't continue forward. You know you're about to join your dragon, don't you? Zayden asks, his voice low as shadows move in riotous swirls at our feet. What are you doing? I palm another dagger, getting whatever information we can. The utter calmness of his tone is unnerving. That's the thing, Barlow says, his blonde hair covering his forehead as he falls forward onto a hand. I'm not. They have us thinking we're the inferior species. But did you see how easily I controlled her? How easily the energy she bonded us with is replaced? His eyes slide shut as his fingers splay on the stone. Jack, don't do this! Nolan storms past Rion and his features slackening when he takes in the destruction around him. You, you're better than this. You can choose. My chest tightens. The way he said that is almost like he expected this. Because he did, Zayden answers, his gaze locked on Jack. He wants to mend him. He's been trying to mend him since May. He's too weak to shield his intentions now. Mend what? The injuries from the fall? Zayden's brow furrows in concentration. Jack's turned venom. Somehow he managed it within the wards. I think I might be sick. There is no choice, Jack shouts. And if there was, I made mine the second I saw her. He shoots a glare my way. Bond the most powerful dragon available at threshing. Why should they determine our potential when we're capable of reaching for fate all on our own? Oh, God, his eyes have been bloodshot for so long. When did it happen? Before the fall, it had to have been before I wielded that first time back in the gym that day. 
and I've thrown the wrong dagger. Bade, Taren growls, and I glance up to see his silhouette block out the stars far above us. I'm so sorry. Magic requires balance, Nolan argues. It does not give without a price. Does it? Jack inhales, and the stones around him turn from a dark slate gray to a dusky beige. Do you understand how much power is beneath your feet? One block pales, then another, and another. Satan, I know. Shadows shoot forward, knocking Jack backward and driving him across the floor before lifting him from the ground, pinning him in midair with an X across his torso. When did you turn? Zayden asks. Wouldn't you like to know? Jack fights the binding, but Zayden closes his fist and the shadows snap even tighter. I know you're going to tell me. Zayden walks forward, because I have nothing to lose by killing you. So tell me when. Earn yourself a little goodwill. Before his challenge against me, I answer when Jack refuses to. He forced power into my body. I just didn't recognize it for what it is. How? The wards do not block all power like the dragons want you to think they do. We can still feed from the ground, still channel enough to survive, enough to fool them. We might not be at full strength, capable of wielding greater magic under your protections. But make no mistake, we are already among you, and now we're free. Jack gestures at Bade, his glare alternating between Zayden and me. I'll never know why it's you he wants. What the fuck makes you so special? This changes everything, Tern urges. You have no idea what's coming for you. Jack grasps at the shadows, his feet kicking against only air, but Zayden wraps another band around his throat and he stills. They're faster than you think they are. He's coming with a horde of greens. They all are. Might take them a minute to read the map. Zayden's tone shifts to taunting, and you'll be long gone before they arrive. We need to keep him alive for questioning as long as possible. I shift my weight carefully to avoid Jack's attention. And what's your solution for that? Zayden asks. We have to cut him off from his power. My gaze swings wide, and I see Nolan creeping up on the left. He's kept him under control, all these- The serum, I tell Zayden. He must be why they developed the signet-blocking serum. Motion near Mira makes me glance her way as Dane edges past her. They don't need a map, not when I showed them the way. While you were busy smuggling weapons out, we were busy smuggling them in. Jack's motions grow weaker, his breaths more labored, just as Liam's had been. This whole place will be ours in a matter of hours. He splays his palms wide and reaches the wall, then shudders as color leeches from the stone. My heart jolts. We're underground. Zayden pulls his alloy-hilted dagger and strides forward, but Dane gets there faster. Not yet! Dane grabs hold of Jack's head and closes his eyes as stone after stone loses its color. One, two, three. I start to count heartbeats as the desiccation expands. On the fourth beat, Jack wrenches his hands from the wall and grasps Dane's forearms. Zayden! It's a request and we both know it, but he doesn't act. Dane begins to tremble. Zayden! I shout. Jack's draining him! Power ripples up from my fingertips, ready to strike. Only when Dane screams in pain does Zayden take the final step and slam the hilt of the dagger against Jack's temple, knocking him unconscious. I rush to Dane as he stumbles backward, ripping at his flight jacket, tugging it off and shoving the fabric of his uniform up his arms to reveal a matching set of gray handprints burned into his skin in the same place where Jack grabbed him. Are you all right? God, the skin is crinkling. I think so. Dane runs his hands down his arms in turn, then flexes his fingers in appraisal. Hurts like a fucking ice burn. I'm assuming you know what to do with him, seeing as you've been doing it since May. Zayden shoots Nolan a withering look. Nolan nods, reaching Jack and pouring a vial of serum into his mouth. Zayden withdraws his shadows, allowing Jack to crumble to the floor, then leans over and cuts away Jack's first wing patch. How many riders are here? Dane asks Nolan, who stares at Jack with a mix of disbelief and horror. Suddenly I understand why he was always so exhausted this year. He wasn't mending a soul in the figurative sense, but the literal. How many riders, Nolan? Dane snaps. The mender lifts his tired gaze. 
119 cadets. My mother answers, holding her hand to her bleeding head. Ten leadership. The rest have all been sent to Midland Posts and Samara. She glances at me. Plus the ones you brought. I saw his memories. It's not enough. Dane shakes his head. Well, it has to be, Mira counters. Gather everyone. They're faster than dragons, Dane says to my mother. We have ten hours, maybe less. Then, we're all dead. A half hour later, nearly every seat in battle brief is full, and the lines are clearly drawn between those of us who chose to fight for poor O'Meal and those who chose to stay to defend Navarre. The Eurasian cadets hold the right side of the terraced classroom, and for the first time, I don't pull out pen and paper to take notes when my mother and Devera take the stage with Dane. The nervous energy in the room reminds me of those moments on top of the turret in Athbeen, where we decided to fight in Resson. Except there's no choice to make today. We're here. This battle began in the Wardstone Chamber, and we've already lost. We just happen to still be breathing. Grime relayed to Tern that Melgrin and his forces won't arrive until after the approaching horde does. And word came in about an hour ago that there are other wyvern flying in a second wave. As if the first won't be enough to destroy us. Glancing over my shoulder toward the top seats, I see Zayden standing next to Bodhi with his arms folded across his chest, listening to whatever Garrick tells him. A painful ache erupts in my heart. How can we only have hours left? As if he senses the weight of my gaze, he looks at me, then winks, like we're not facing certain annihilation. Like we've transported ourselves back to last year, and this is just another battle brief. How are the hands? Sawyer asks Riddick, as leadership confers about something on stage. Nolan mended them right after he took care of General Sorngill. Riddick flexes his fingers, showing off unblemished skin. Dane? He asks me. Nothing he can do for him. I shake my head. Not sure if it's because it's an unmendable wound or because Nolan's too exhausted from trying to mend Jack over and over. Fucking Jack, Re mutters. Fucking Jack, I agree. Devera starts the briefing. Intel reports a thousand wyvern headed this way. The good news? They didn't even bother stopping at Samara, which means casualties are low. The bad news? They don't seem to be stopping anywhere, which means we won't get a delay. Dane steps forward and clears his throat. How many of you have mastered a tracking rune? Not a single hand rises among the Eurasian cadets, including Rees and mine. The Basgaith cadets look like Dane is speaking Crovelish up there. Right. Dane shoves his hand into his hair, and his face falls before he masks it. That complicates things. Dark wielders know exactly where we are because according to Barlow's memories, he planted lures all over the college and up the path to the veil. Guess Dane's done keeping his signet classified. My lips part. That's the energy Crod picked up on when we arrived. The same energy that summoned the venom to Resson. Destroying the lures is our best chance of buying time, or at least throwing off further waves. I saw where Barlow put most of the lure boxes, but not all of them. Dane continues as footsteps sound in the doorway. Every head turns as infantry cadets pour in wearing uncertain, anxious faces. I spot Calvin, the leader of the platoon we were paired with for maneuvers, gawking at the space, his gaze landing and remaining on the map of Navarre. He's wearing the same insignia as the rest of us, leading me to believe they've only sent their quadrant's leadership. The infantry quadrant will spend the next few hours trying to hunt them down for us while also preparing themselves. Dane's voice drops off, and he swallows. Devera takes mercy on him, stepping forward. You'll be working within your squads tonight. Remember that wyvern are the distraction and the weapon. You take down one of the venom, and you kill the wyvern they've created. No one takes on a dark wielder alone. That's how you get killed. Work together, rely on each other, complement each other's signets, just like it's the squad battle. Except it's real battle, Rhiannon says under her breath, where real cadets will really die. 
Remember that Venin will mimic your fighting style, so change it up if you have no choice but hand to hand. Devera continues, the lines of her mouth tense with worry and perhaps a little dread. The Basgaith cadets murmur among themselves and shift in their seats. I'll bet you all the daggers we've brought with us that they didn't teach them how to fight Venin. Sawyer shakes his head, drumming his fingertips along the desk. First years who haven't manifested. I expect you packed and ready to fly should we fall. Healers are stalking the infirmary and are preparing. Scribes are in the process of evacuating with our most important texts. Devera glances at my mother. Of course they are. I can only wonder which texts they'll consider valuable enough to save, and which they'll conveniently leave behind to burn. Mom looks up to my right where Mira stands with a few of her friends, then drops her gaze to me. The assignments given tonight have been decided with the best interest of Bezgaith and the Vale in mind. There are incredibly powerful signets among you. Gifted riders. She looks in the first row where Emeterio sits and even combat masters. But I will not lie to you. That's a first, I mumble, and Rhiannon scoffs softly under her breath. We are outnumbered, Mom continues. We are underpowered. However, the odds may be against us, but the gods are with us. Whether you left after threshing or stayed, we are all Navarian riders, bonded for the purpose of defending dragonkind in the darkest hour. And this is it. The darkest hour on the longest night of the year. My stomach churns as I fight off the spiraling weight of hopelessness. I want you to leave for Eurasia, I tell Andarna. Get out before they arrive. Hide where you can and make your way back to Brennan. I will be where I am needed, and it is with you, she counters. Every argument I could make to keep her alive doesn't matter, and we both know it. Humans do not give dragons orders. If she's determined to die with Tern and me, there's nothing I can do about it. I press my lips between my teeth and bite down to ward off the sting that comes to my eyes. My fingernails bite into my palms as Mom assigns the active riders to cadet squads, splitting the experience among the group. Garrick is assigned to first squad flame section and Heaton to first squad claw section, while Emery is assigned to a squad in first wing. Captain Sorengale, Mom looks up at Mira. You'll be with second squad flame section fourth wing. Our entire squad looks over at Mira, and my eyes widen at the fear that flares in her eyes. Anger simmers along my bond with Zayden. Fuck that. With all due respect, General Sorengale, Mira replies, rolling her shoulders back. If we're to truly use our signets to their best advantage, then I should be paired with you as a last line of defense, since I can now shield without the wards. Mom's eyebrows rise in surprise, and my gaze jumps between them, like I'm watching a sporting match. Mira swallows, then locks eyes with me. And Lieutenant Ryerson should be placed into second squad, as his signet has previously proven in battle to complement Cadet Sorengales. She looks at me like we're sitting across the dining room table from each other, and not in the midst of a pre-battle briefing. As much as I would love to be her shield, he gives us the highest probability of keeping our most effective weapon alive. A tense second passes as I look to our mother. So be it. Mom nods, then finishes the unit changes. The heat along the bond recedes, and my posture sags in relief. At least we'll be together. We get both of you? Riddick offers a smile. Maybe we have a shot of lasting an hour. My money's on two, Sawyer chimes in with a nod. Both of you shut up before I knock your heads together, Imogen warns from a seat behind us. Anything less than four hours is unacceptable. How long did Bresson last? One? And there were ten riders and seven flyers against four venom. Now that that's settled, Mom says as Kaori steps onto the floor, throwing up an illusion in the form of a top-down map of Bezgaith and the surrounding area. We're dividing Bezgaith, the Vale, and surrounding areas into a grid of sectors. 
Kaori flicks his fingers and grid lines appear on the map. Each squad will be responsible for a sector of airspace, while infantry covers the ground. Mom continues, nodding to Kaori. Squad insignia appear on different grids, and it takes me a second to locate ours on the side of the veil, paired with a squad from First Wing. No patches are inside the space, but there are plenty of unbonded dragons, no doubt ready to defend their hatching grounds. Memorize these grids, because you're not going to have time to pull out a map when you're up there. If it's in your airspace, you kill it. If it crosses into another squad's airspace, you let them kill it. Avoid leaving your airspace at all costs, or it will turn into a disorganized melee. And that leaves us with inevitable weak grids. We'll reassign you as necessary as casualties are reported. Not if they're reported. The grid behind the main campus, where the ward chamber is located, is horrifyingly bare, as though they've already surrendered the space. This is wrong. I whisper, we should be defending the ward stone. The broken one? Sawyer questions quietly. Say it, Rhiannon urges. You have a better chance of living through it, Riddick mutters, shifting in his seat. I clear my throat. It's a mistake to abandon the ward stone. My mother levels a disapproving look on me, and the temperature drops a few degrees. Why is it that only my daughters speak out of turn? We get it from our mother, Mira snipes in a dry tone, and that lethal look pivots to her. It's a mistake, I push on. We don't know what power remains in the stone, and it was placed in that exact location, because it's over the strongest natural flow of power, according to Warwick. Hmm. It's not my mother looking my way this time. It's General Sorengale. Your opinion is noted. Hope surges in my chest. So you'll assign a squad? Absolutely not. Your opinion, as noted as it is, is wrong. She dismisses me without another word, without the reasoning we would have been given had this been a battle brief, leaving me half my original size shrinking in my chair. A wave of warmth floods the bond, but it doesn't dim the chill from her rejection. You have your orders for the morning, Mom says. Riders, find the nearest bed and sleep for as many hours as you can. Most of you who left Bazgayeth will find your rooms have not been commandeered, and most still contain your bedding. We need you rested to be effective. She looks over the briefing room like it might be the last time she sees us. Every minute we hold out gives us a shot at reinforcements making it back. Every second counts. Make no mistake, we will hold out as long as possible. I glance up at the clock. It's not even eight yet, which means I can keep my mantra for the next few hours. I will not die today. I can't say the same about tomorrow. The stars still wink in the night sky as Zayden and I dress in the relative silence of my room. Turns out the remaining cadets had left all but the wing leader's quarters untouched. As if we'd see the error of our ways and return. What few hours of sleep we'd gotten had been sporadic at best, leaving me at less than full strength and a little dizzy. But at least I wasn't plagued with nightmares. Or maybe my imagination really is that overactive. Zayden kisses a path down my spine, his lips brushing every inch of skin as he laces me into my armor over the crossbody wrap on my left shoulder that stabilizes the aching joint. My eyes slide shut when he reaches my lower back, and the desire he'd more than sated last night flares anew, flushing my skin. A few simple kisses are all it ever takes, and my body is instantly attuned to his. Keep doing that, and you'll be taking this right off, I warn him, glancing down over my shoulder. Was that a threat or a promise? His eyes darken as he stands and ties me in, tucking the laces so they don't come loose. Because I have no problem spending our last quiet minutes this morning tangled up in you. He slides his hand over the curve of my hip, as he moves to face me, trailing his fingers along the waistband of my flight leathers, then dipping them between the buttons and my stomach. 
We can't do this. Can't hide away and pretend war isn't coming for us. Can't ignore that more than a dozen lures haven't been destroyed. Or even found, when just one was enough to lead the venom to Resin. And we've only found half of what Jack left around campus. Can't deny that the last reports from the few riders brave enough to stay at the Midland Forts along the route from Samara relayed that attack is imminent in the next couple of hours. But gods, do I want to? We can't. Regret saturates the words, and yet I can't stop myself from winding my arms around his neck. No matter how much I would rather lock the door and let the rest of the world burn around us, we can. He lifts a hand to the back of my neck and tugs me closer, until our bodies meet from thigh to breast. Say the word, and we'll fly. I stare up into his eyes, marking each fleck of gold, just in case I won't get another chance to. You could never live with yourself if we abandoned our friends. Maybe. His brow knits for less than a second, so quick I almost miss it as he leans into my space. But I know I can't live without you. So trust me when I say there's a very real, very loud part of me screaming to carry you out of here and fly for Eurasia. I know the feeling all too well. So before I dare to give it voice, I rise up on my toes and kiss him. At the first touch of our mouths, heat ignites between us, and he grabs a hold of my ass, lifting me. I sense that we're moving, turning as I part my lips for his tongue and throw all logical thought out the door. My ass hits the desk, and I hold tighter, kiss him harder as he slants his mouth over mine again and again, taking everything I offer and giving it right back. This isn't the slow exploration we'd shared last night, lingering on every touch, knowing it might be the last time. It's frantic and wild, hot and desperate. My hand spears into his hair, holding him closer, like I still have Andarna's ability to stop time, like I can hold us in this moment if I just keep kissing him. He groans into my mouth, and his fingers work the buttons on my pants at the same moment I reach for his. We'll be quick, I promise between soul-consuming kisses, flicking open the first button. Quick, he repeats, sliding a hand down my stomach and into my pants. Isn't usually what you beg me for. His fingers brush. Someone knocks. We both freeze, panting hard against each other's mouths. No, no, no. Don't stop. If this minute is all we have left, then I want it. Gods, if he would just move his hand a fraction of an inch lower. His eyes search mine. And then he takes my mouth like the outcome of this kiss will decide the battle we're facing. I know you're in there, Rhiannon barks through the door, and the knock changes to a pound. Stop ignoring me before this becomes the most awkward situation known to Navarre. Five minutes, I beg as Zayden's mouth slides down my neck. Now, a deep, familiar voice demands, and Zayden puts a step between us, muttering a curse under his breath. There's no way, is there? But just in case there is, my hands fall from Zayden's pants and quickly redo the button on mine before I hop off the desk and rush to the door, sparing a second to check that Zayden's clothes are in place, too. Disengage your body parts or whatever you're doing. I unlock my door with a flick of my hand and yank it open to find not only every second and third year flyer in our squad, but a few of our first years, including Sloane, and Brennan. Without thought for regulation or decorum, I fling myself into his arms and he catches me, pulling me tight against his chest. You came. I left you and Mira here to fight this on your own once before, and I'll never do it again. I knew I'd fucked up as soon as you left, but griffins don't fly as quickly as dragons. He squeezes harder for a second, then lets me down. Tell me where I can be of use. Are those? Flyers? Every head turns down the hall as my mother approaches, with two of her aides. But her steps falter when her gaze shifts toward my brother. Brennan? I'm not here for you. He dismisses her without another word in her direction. Mateus is going to send the flyers to hunt the lures. They are faster on the ground and better with runes anyway. 
We are, Kat agrees with a casual shrug, assessing the hallway like she's searching for structural weaknesses, which she probably is. And we don't abandon our drifts. We'll fight. I might not like her, but damn do I respect her. Finding those lures will give us precious time to... I grab onto Brennan's arms, and a spark of hope lights within my chest. Have you ever encountered something you can't mend? Magic, he answers. I can't mend a relic or anything. Probably not a rune either. If he can do it, we'll just have to hold on long enough for Coda to arrive. What about a wardstone? Brennan's eyebrows shoot up, and I glance past him to Rhiannon. We have to guard the chamber. At least let him try. Re nods, then turns to my mother, who's still staring at Brennan like he's a hallucination. General Sorengale, Second Squad Flame Section Fourth Wing, officially requests permission to guard the airspace above the Wardstone Chamber. Mom doesn't take her eyes off Brennan. Granted. An excerpt from Major Edvard Tiller's Unaccredited Study of the Venon, Property of the Library of Corden. Though there is some debate, it is greatly believed that turning venom heightens one of the dark wielder's senses. It is this scholar's belief that the one responsible for the death of King Grethwild developed keener eyesight, for not even the best of his majesty's royal flyers could see through the darkness the venom hid within to slay our beloved king. Chapter 61 Dawn is still an hour away, as the riders in our squad stand on the ridgeline above the main campus of Bizgayath, our dragons lined up behind us. The horizon holds a vague outline, the promise of light, but it winks in and out of my vision as the skyline shifts. The wavering shape on constant approach growing larger with every minute, Hundreds of feet below, in front of the gates of Bezgaith, my mother waits upon Imser, with her personal squad, including Mira and Tiny, slightly behind her. She's in front of us all, her three children, and the place she's sacrificed us, and her very soul for. They're coming, Tern tells me his posture stiff while the others shift their weight or dig their talons into the snow-covered, decomposed granite of the mountainside. Squads from third and fourth wings stand in formation up and down the mountains around us. But both first and second wings, half our forces, now that we're back with the Bazgayath cadets, have been sent to the edge of the veil while our squad guards the airspace above the hundred yards between the back of main campus and the steep ridgeline we stand on, including the very well-hidden entrance to the ward chamber hundreds of feet below, where Brennan is working. Sloan, Arik, and the other first years are with him under the guise of fetching whatever he needs, but reordered them to Brennan's side mostly to keep them safe. I know. I glance over my shoulder at where Andarna nips at her harness between Tern and Sigale. She showed up an hour ago and refused to leave. Is this how it felt in Resin? Rhiannon asks from my right, her hands nervously flitting over her sheaths and scabbard. How are you feeling? I ask. So scared, I'm pretty sure either my heart's gonna give out or I'm about to shit myself. Riddick answers from her other side. I was going to say horrifyingly scared, but sure, that works too, Rhiannon nods. Yes, that's exactly how it felt. I do the customary checks again, not that I'd have time to get back to my room if I left anything. Zayden retrieved the dagger I'd put in Jack's shoulder, which gives me a full twelve, plus two alloy-hilted ones, and the handheld crossbow strapped at my right thigh. I'm fully armed thanks to the daggers we brought with us and the forge here at Bezgayath, every cadet is armed. Does it ever get easier? Going into battle? Sawyer asks beside Riddick, peering down at the college, 
Infantry has been deployed into every courtyard, every hallway, and every entrance, the last line of a very fragile defense. No, Zayden answers from my left. You just get better at hiding it. Everyone clear on the plan? Riders answer to Ree, flyers answer to Bregan, Quinn recites to our squad from down the line to the left. When they arrive. The flyers are still hunting down the boxes. Without the lures, maybe the wyvern would have waited until daylight. Maybe it would have taken them longer to get a feel for where the hatching grounds are. Maybe destroying the lures will deter the next horde that inevitably follows. But a thousand maybes won't change what we're facing now. We stay in our sector, Imogen says from Quinn's side, braiding the longer pink strands of her hair to keep it out of her eyes. Should a wyvern leave our airspace, we let it become another squad's responsibility, so that we don't accidentally leave our sector unguarded. We maintain our airspace at all costs. Rhiannon is on dagger duty, Riddick says, rubbing his hands together even though it's uncharacteristically warm this morning. I can't even see my breath. She'll fetch and distribute should any venom fall from their wyvern and take our dagger with them. Any reason you can't just drag them all down with all that shadow power? Sawyer glances Zayden's way like there's any possible chance he hasn't already considered that. The look mirrored by Ree and Riddick. Other than the reason that I almost burned out holding 40 of them back in a narrow space like a valley, and there are what looks to be 10 times that amount on an open plain, Zayden counters, arching his scarred brow. Right. That, Sawyer nods to himself. Getting caught up in the wyvern is a mistake. I warn them as the downslope breeze becomes noticeable wind. But it too lacks the icy chill of December. Yes, they'll try to kill us, but don't let them distract you from their creator. Kill the venom who created them, and those wyvern will fall. In our experience, they stick close to their creations during a battle. You know your pairs? Ree asks, glancing down the line. Everyone nods. Our goal is always two against one in our favor. Mount up, Rhiannon orders. I turn quickly and gather her into a hug, and she grabs for Sawyer and Riddick, yanking them in too. Don't freeze, I tell them. No matter what happens, just keep moving and stay in the air. They can kill you if they drain the ground you're standing on. No one dies today. No one dies today, Riddick repeats and Sawyer nods as we break apart. Did you see Jacinia? Re asks Sawyer. My eyebrows rise. She's here? Flew in with Marin, Sawyer says, his head bobbing. Guess griffins are a little more easygoing in that department than dragons. She's in the archives, comparing Warwick's journal to Lyra's to see if she can figure out why the wards in Erasia are faulty. Once you said you were scared the wards would fall here... She started worrying we wouldn't be able to get them back up without knowing what went wrong in Erasia. Turns out she's right. She shouldn't be at Bazgayeth. I shake my head and my heart races to a gallop. She's completely defenseless down there. She was worried she'd figure out the difference between the journals and be too far away to help. And if Brennan mends that stone, she's our only chance at raising the wards here successfully. Sawyer replies, backing away to follow Riddick to their dragons. She has just as much a right to risk her life as we do, Re reminds me over her shoulder, heading toward Fierge. Now warm up those wielding hands, or do whatever it is you need to do to set this place on fire. I turn to Endarna while Zayden finishes talking to Quinn and Imogen. Promise me you'll stay hidden. I can hide. She backs up a step, and I blink. It's almost as if she's faded straight into the darkness. Benefit of being a black dragon, Taren chuffs. We're born for the night. I follow Endarna and scratch the scales between her nostrils when she lowers her head. Stay put. Marb is below you, keeping watch over Brennan. If the tide of the battle turns, he'll watch after you. But you have to go, promise me. 
I will stand, I will keep watch, but I will not leave you this time. She huffs a breath that scents lightly of sulfur, and my heart sinks. She's seen too much for someone her age. It was easier when you were a juvenile. I give her one last scratch. Every dragon in our squad knows to take care of her if Tarn and I fall. But only she can make the choice to let go. I didn't listen then, either. Good point. It's almost time, Tarn announces, and my heartbeat accelerates as I turn toward the rising sun, a strip of orange illuminating not only the horizon, but the massive cloud of wyvern that's nearly here. Another gust of warm wind blows, and the stars wink out above us as dark clouds billow from over the mountains, charging the air with an energy that calls to my own. Zayden meets me between Taren and Segale, a scenario that reminds me entirely too much of Resin. He reaches for me, his warm hand cupping the back of my neck. I love you. The world does not exist for me beyond you. Leaning down, he rests his forehead against mine. I couldn't tell you that the last time we flew into a fight, and I should have. I love you too. I grasp his waist and force a smile. Do me a favor and don't die. I don't want to live without you. There are so many of them and so few of us. We don't die today. If only we all felt that kind of certainty, I try to joke. You keep your focus on the enemy and your life. He kisses me hard and quick. Even Malik himself couldn't keep me from you. I pull back at the first splatter on my head. Rain? Zayden looks up. In December? Warmth. Rain. The charge in the air. It's my mother. A slow smile spreads across my face. It's her way of imbuing her favorite weapon. Me. Remind me to thank her afterward. He pulls me into another quick kiss, then turns away without another word, mounting Segale at a run. I glance up at the sky and breathe deeply to carry the pressure my mother has just put on me. The storm will help me, but if the rain increases, it will cost us the help of the griffins. They can't fly in anything much heavier than a drizzle. They'll guard the ground and ferry the wounded, Tern says as he lowers his shoulder. I walk up his foreleg rain splattering against his scales. Settling into the saddle, I buckle the strap across my thighs and check to be sure the quiver Marin gave me is securely fastened to the left side of the saddle, with an easy reach. I don't want to risk my shoulder slipping out by strapping it to my back. Then I grab the conduit from my pocket and slip the new steel bracelet attached to the top of it over my wrist. Only then, when I'm certain I'm as prepared as I can be, when power flows through my veins with a heat that doesn't quite burn, do I look forward to the approaching enemy. My heartbeat stutters. Gods, they're everywhere. They're horde larger than any riot I've ever seen. Flying at multiple altitudes, most equal with our position. The sea of gray wings, straining necks, and gaping jaws devours the sunrise. We've grossly underestimated their numbers, and knowing there's another wave following this, my throat tightens as I glance down the line of my squad. There's no chance all of us are getting out of this alive, if any of us do. But we just have to hold out long enough for Brennan to mend the wardstone. If we can raise the wards, even if Jacinia doesn't find what we missed in Eratia, we can stun the wyvern long enough to kill them. Within a few breaths, the wyvern are close enough that I can make out which of them bears a rider. And then I reach two dozen in the count. I stop for the sake of my own sanity. Terror slides up my spine, and I breathe deeply to force it back down. I'm no good to Terran and Andarna, to anyone in my squad, if I give in to panic and I'll be even worse, a liability if I don't keep fully in control. They'll be within range in only minutes. Maybe we should have ridden out, engaged them over the plains. I can't help but second-guess our plan as fear tightens my chest and speeds my heart rate. There are too many of them. They could have flanked and surrounded us easily. Here, 
We know every canyon, every peak, and they cannot circumvent us, Tarn answers. They'll have to go through us. They're spreading out, Tarn says, his head swiveling. Their formation indicates they'll engage all our forces, instead of targeting the veil as we'd planned for. My stomach plummets. We've allocated ourselves poorly. Then we'll just have to be sure they never reach the veil, won't we? You'll only have a clear firing field for a matter of seconds, Tarn reminds me. I know. Once the dragons engage, I'm just as likely to strike one of our own as I am a wyvern. This first strike counts for everything. I lift my hands and open the archive's door to a steady but manageable flow of power, savoring the quick sizzle along my skin that comes with the rush of energy. Tell I'm sir I need mom to move that cloud. Yes, Tern says, following my stream of thoughts to its conclusion before I even voice them. I let the conduit rest against my forearm and concentrate on the cloud above us, blinking the steady fall of rain from my eyes. The dragons beside us begin to shift their weight, their shoulders rolling in preparation to launch, but Tern remains as still as the mountain we stand on. I spare a single glance over my shoulder for Andarna, but where are you? The battle hasn't even started yet, and she's already left her position. Hiding, like I promised. She peeks out from a cluster of boulders. Get ready, Tern orders as the clouds roll overhead at a supernatural speed, rushing toward the enemy. I focus on the horde, without an outlet. Power builds within me, so hot I start to think I might breathe fire. And I let it gather, let it burn, let it threaten to consume me. Violet, Zayden says. Not yet, I answer. They'll be on us in seconds, but it has to be the right second. Sweat beads on my forehead. Violet, my mother's storm overtakes the wyvern at the highest altitude, and I release the torrent of scalding power, aiming it skyward. Lightning cracks, jolting upward from the very ground of the ridge beneath ours in a blast of light so powerful, it stings my eyes as it strikes into the cloud. I drop my arms as the bodies fall. Maybe this will be easier than... Never mind. The wyvern's tactics adjust within seconds, just like the riders who control them, and they fly under the cloud cover, swerving to dodge plummeting carcasses of their horde. Holy shit! Riddick shouts as wyvern crash into the four roads that lead to Bazgayeth, their bodies leaving deep furrows in the ground. That won't work again. So I slide the orb into my palm and summon power once more, drawing a faster, more concentrated stream as I target the nearest rider-bearing wyvern. Fire whips through me as I wield, missing that wyvern, but hitting another. Shit. Focus on the next strike, not the last, Tern says. Hold, Zayden shouts, keeping the field clear long enough for me to fire off another strike. I lift my hands again, giving Tern's power dominion over my bones and muscles, then draw another strike to wield. Energy tears through me, and instead of flaring my palms, I concentrate on the intent of my fingers, just like Felix taught me, drawing them downward with a strike, directing it to the target as though I am the composer, and the lightning is my orchestra. It strikes true, the wyvern and rider falling in separate, lifeless descents. A handful of other wyvern fall from the sky with the death of that dark wielder. But there's no time for relief or joy at the accomplishment when there are countless more. And they are here. My mother's squad launches to attack the first wave that intrudes upon their assigned sector. I'm Sir rips the throat from one wyvern before I lose sight of my mother and Mira as the horde passes through their sector and into the next. Focus on your sector, Tern orders, and I rip my gaze from the area I'd last seen my family. Second by second, each of the squads around and below us launch to defend their sectors, and when the first menacing gray snout crosses our line, the end of Bazgayeth's structures and the beginning of the mountain, I brace. Tern rears back, then hurdles forward, beating his wings as he runs for the edge of the ridge line, then flying off it. I yank my goggles over my eyes at the first sting of wind, then quickly shove them back up when rain makes the glass impossible to see through. That one's ours, Tern tells me, flying directly for the fastest of the horde to enter our airspace. Quinn and Imogen bank left, heading toward other targets, and I see the rest of the squad in my peripherals, but I keep my focus on the wyvern Tern has claimed as we fly toward a head-on collision. I grasp the conduit with one hand and lift my other as the space between us narrows to heartbeats. There's no need to reach for power. It's already there, both racing through my veins and charging the sky overhead. 
energy sizzles at the ends of my fingertips. And just as I am to wield, the riderless wyvern drops his jaw and breathes out a stream of green fire. My heart lurches into my throat as the flames barrel toward us, and Tern rolls left, narrowly missing the blaze. I throw my weight right to keep level as we pass the wyvern, keeping my focus on the creature, and then strike, drawing lightning from the cloud above. It hits the wyvern just above the tail. I didn't calculate my strike closely enough to account for speed, but the charge is more than enough to drop it. Below, Tern growls, plunging into a dive. I blink furiously into the wind, noting three wyvern trying to get through at lower altitude. I can't strike here. I chance hitting someone above if I draw from the sky. They're too far to pull from myself, and if I miss from the ground up, hold on. I throw both hands on the pommel and do just that, spotting the rider on the center wyvern as we drop hundreds of feet in seconds, power a constant buzz in my ears. Tern strikes from above, flying directly into the wyvern on the left, and the impact whips my body forward as he sinks his teeth into the neck of the beast, dragging it down under us as we continue to fall. The wyvern screeches and I reach for one of my alloy-hilted blades, pivoting in my seat to watch Tern's back and squinting into the rain as two massive shapes give chase. They're coming! A sickening crack sounds beneath us, and Tern releases the wyvern, its neck broken as it falls the last hundred feet to the terrain below low, somewhere behind the administration building. Banking right, Tern begins to climb with hard beats of his wings. But there's no way we'll have the high ground in time. They're less than 50 feet away, and at the angle of the remaining two wyvern's descent, we'll have seconds before Tern becomes a chew toy. I check beneath us. We're clear, then grasp onto the conduit and take a steadying breath to calm the racing beat of my heart and the wild rush of adrenaline in my veins. Control. I need complete control. There's only time for one strike. I release power, drawing it upward with my blade, and lightning streaks into the sky, hitting the closest wyvern in the chest. Yes! I shout as the creature tumbles from the sky, but my joy is short-lived as its counterpart, complete with dark wielder, surges forward, opening its jaws to reveal rotten teeth and a green glow in its throat. Turn! The warning is barely past my lips when a band of shadow winds around the wyvern's throat and jerks it backward like a rabid dog at the end of a leash, its teeth missing the tip of Tern's wing by mere feet as we continue to fly upward. Sigale has claimed that one. We'll have to find our own, he tells me, climbing faster than ever into the driving rain. I use precious seconds to scan our surroundings. Every sector is overwhelmed, ours included. Only flashes of color appear through the swarm of gray as we soar toward the conflict above us. But the majority of the wyverns still hover in the distance, held back on the edge of the thunderstorm. They only sent the first wave, Tern explains, probably to probe for weaknesses. Falling toward us, Itram has his claws raked into the belly of a wyvern and I catch a glimpse of Riddick as they spiral past, Imogen and her orange dagger tail glain on their heels. Riddick, I shout at Tern. Focus on your mission or the plan falls apart. Trust the others to do theirs. He flies straight through the mayhem of Grey, bursting into the airspace above it before he levels out. He's right, we have a job to do, but trusting my friends to do their part feels a lot like ignoring them, too. Rain soaks my scalp and runs off my leathers as I survey the battlefield beneath us, forcing my breath in through my nose and out through my mouth to lower my heart rate. This isn't the melee of Resin. This is a coordinated defense, and I need to focus so I can do my part. Fierge is locked in close combat with a green fire. A blast of blue fire erupts from its mouth. Make that blue fire wyvern, and my heart clenches when Re narrowly misses the fire stream by leaping from Fierge's back to Kruth's. Quinn grabs hold of her forearm as the green scorpion tail stabs hard with her tail, and I rip my gaze away when I realize they have it under control and there's nothing I can do. But Sawyer is outmatched fifty feet below as Slee goes head to head with three wyvern, one of whom bears a rider. I grip the conduit, then flood my body with another wave of power and lift my hand. Don't miss, Tern warns. I focus on the wyvern farthest from Slee just in case, then wield, drawing the power to my target with full focus and intention. Energy rips through me, and lightning strikes from the cloud above, white hot and fatal to the wyvern below. The rider looks up and locks eyes with me for a heartbeat before the pair dives, falling out of the battle. 
My stomach sours. There's only one reason to go to ground. To feed. Zayden, on it, he assures me. And when Atrim and Glane arrive to help Sawyer and Sleeg, I turn my attention to the other sectors. Three, Tear notes, using the hands of the clock like we'd discussed. And I look right, where Wyvern overrun a squad in third wing. The body of a dragon lies beneath them on the mountainside, but I look away before I take note of who they've lost. If I focus on tomorrow's death roll, I'll be on it. Hold as steady as you can. I throw open the floodgates of his power as he banks right, flying toward their sector but not into it, and I wield, heat prickling my skin as I take down one wyvern. Then I aim again for another and another. Again and again I wield in targeted, precise strikes for the sectors around us, hitting two-thirds of my targets but never striking a dragon, which I count as the ultimate win. Rain sizzles as it hits my skin, but I don't dare remove my flight jacket from where my daggers are strapped to it. So I put the heat, the pain, into my mental box and slam the lid shut on it, forcing my mind to ignore the agonizing burn and wield again. Twelve! I face forward and find the target, missing twice before I hit it. There are no venom left in our sector. But my hand trembles on the conduit as Tern locates another wyvern, another threat, and I pull lightning from the sky so quickly that I no longer feel like I direct the storm. I am the storm. You tire, Tern warns. Fuck exhaustion. People are dying. A quick glance over the sunrise lit battlefield reveals more and more spots of color among the gray carcasses littered on the ground. But I only stop quickly enough to note my squad is still fighting, handling each wyvern that crosses into our sector with teamwork and efficiency. Nine, Tern rumbles, but doesn't argue with me as he rolls left, keeping us above the battle. As I wield for the next squad, taking only the targets I'm certain of hitting without endangering our own riders. Beneath me, shadows streak into our sectors as Zayden does the same. God, the heat is going to cook me alive. Even the wind and rain aren't enough to cool the inferno growing inside my chest. I slip the conduit's bracelet from my wrist, then wedge it between my thighs long enough to strip my flight jacket off and slide it under the strap of my saddle, leaving me six daggers short. But they're in easy reach, and the other two are the only ones that matter any... Twelve! Taren shouts, and I whip my head toward the plains to see another wave of wyverns soaring over my mother's sector, dangerously close to the clouds, but not in them, leaving me unable to strike, given who's under them. My heart stutters as they pass my mother without stopping, then barrel through the next without engaging. Flying on top of the battle has given me the needed vantage point to wield, but it's also made us an undeniable target, and they're coming for us. I shove my hand through the strap of the bracelet so I don't lose the conduit. We should lead them away. We will follow the plan. Tern dives, and my weight lifts against the straps of the saddle as we plunge toward my squad. The second squad dragons turn their heads toward the oncoming threat, all of us rising or falling into formation. Prepare! There are three venin on this assassination mission, their blue tunics standing out in stark contrast to the gray, bleary-eyed wyvern they ride. We've got ten seconds, maybe. One. Riddick waves his hands at my right, holding a dagger that's been snapped in two. Shit. If his only remaining blade is broken, I blink when the pieces disappear. He wasn't waving at me. Two, snapping my head to the left, I find the pieces already in Rhiannon's hands as Fierge dives to where Sleeg hovers beneath. Three, Fierge flies alongside Sleeg and Rhiannon tosses the pieces. Four, to Sawyer's credit, he catches them. Five, Sigail rises to take Fierge's place, and I lock eyes with Zayden only long enough to see that he's unharmed. Blood drips from Sigail's mouth and runs in rain-driven rivulets down the side of Zayden's face, but I instinctively know it's not his and focus on the imminent threat. Six, breathe. I have to breathe through the firestorm in my chest or I'll burn out. It's not that I don't recognize the signs, the trembling, the heat, the fatigue. It's just that they don't matter. Everyone I love is on this field. Seven. They're almost on us. And I look down at the ward chamber, where Marb stands watch with a blue club tail I don't recognize and a vague shape I hope is Andarna. And when a flash of sunlight reflects on the dagger in Sawyer's hand, it disappears again. Fierge already on the move. Eight. Dajalair is frustrated by the unflyable conditions, Tern relays as Fierge rises alongside Atrum. Nine. 
Tell them they're more efficient guarding the courtyard and incoming wounded than struggling with waterlogged wings, I note. They'd be a liability up here right now, not an asset. The dagger changes hands and Riddick is once again armed. I grin at how seamlessly we work as a team, then face the coming tidal wave. Ten. You're beginning to think, Tern starts. Like Brennan, I suggest as the wyvern enter our airspace. Like Tern, Sigale answers, surging toward the enemy, her neck outstretched as shadows streak from under her, grasping a wyvern at the jugular and dragging it with them as Sigale drops away from formation. Tern lunges toward another, throwing me back into the saddle as he takes the wyvern head on. I jolt forward upon impact, blood spraying as Tern's jaw locks on the throat of the wyvern. Its screech rattles my brain as their claws grapple between them, forcing us into a vertical position that's nearly impossible to maintain, even with Tern's wings beating this hard. A flash of blue is all the warning I need to palm an alloy-hilted dagger and drop the conduit against my forearm to reach for my buckle, preparing to release it. I've seen this play out before. I know this role. And this time, I'm not coming away with a stab wound. Can you level out? My heart jolts as the dark wielder jumps from the wyvern's neck to Tern's, ignoring the menacing roar that vibrates Tern's scales as he holds the wyvern in a death grip. Stay in your saddle, he demands but rolls us horizontal. The venom grabs a horn and holds on, his eerie red-rimmed eyes never leaving mine during the maneuver, or the seconds after when we fall into a rapid descent, the wyvern's weight pulling us downward. No spider-webbed veins, he's just an assim, and I can handle him. You're the one he wants, the dark wielder announces, shoving his wet, stringy, blonde hair out of his eyes and striding down Tern's neck as I yank at the belt with my left hand, but the buckle doesn't give. He looks so young, but so did Jack. Tern releases the wyvern, his shoulders bunching to push off the dying creature, but it snaps at his neck, and Tern retaliates with a stronger bite, bleeding the life out of it as we fall and fall and fall. You're sage? I wrench on the leather, but the belt is stuck, and so am I. Fuck. I flip the dagger to its tip, catching the water slick blade between my thumb and forefinger, and flick my wrist, firing the dagger toward him when he reaches the spikes between Tern's shoulders. He catches the blade, and pure panic floods my bloodstream as I pull my spare. You'll meet them all soon enough, he promises, raising my own blade as he marches toward me. A green blur comes at us from the right, and we both look as Rhiannon jumps from Fierge to Tern, landing in front of my saddle in a crouch. An excerpt from Chapter 3, The Tactical Guide to Defeating Dragons by Colonel Elijah Jobin. The easiest way to defeat a dragon is to kill its rider though the creature will most likely survive the blow. It will be stunned long enough to be felled. Chapter 62 No, no, no. This is too familiar. Losing Liam was... I can't lose Re. I just can't. She surges forward as the wyvern screams, our rate of descent so fast that blood appears to fall upward. I yank on my belt again, but the leather is swollen with rain, wedged tight, and I watch, my heart launching into my throat as she engages the dark wielder in a series of moves that would have had me on the mat. He knocks her blade loose with a backhand to her wrist, and it flies from her hand as he kicks her. She skids backward along Tern's rain-slick scales, and I reach for her, wrapping my left arm around her waist to steady her and pressing my dagger into her palm with my right hand. She looks over her shoulder and nods at me, gaining her feet when he's almost on us. I force myself to look away as their blades clash and mountains rise, alerting me to how low our altitude is as I unstrap the crossbow at my thigh, then quickly open the quiver strapped at my left and slip the arrow into the flight groove. At this range, the wind and rain shouldn't matter. I need you to roll this fucker off you in three, I start. Re! I shout out loud, taking aim. Two! She glances back, then throws her body flat between Tern's shoulders, and I reach forward, grasping her ankle and pulling the lever without hesitation. One! The arrow hits true, striking the venom in the sternum as Tern banks hard right. The dark wielder falls, but the sound of an explosion comes from behind us as I grip Re's ankle, ignoring the screaming protest of my shoulder as the rap fights to keep the joint in 
place. Re holds fast to Terran spikes, and he levels to horizontal quickly, pumping his wings to climb as she works backward toward me, then turns, wrapping her arms around me in a tight hug. I hold on to her still clutching the crossbow and breathe deeply as Fierge mirrors Terran's wing beats just beneath us, keeping pace. She's all right. They're both all right. This isn't Resin, and I didn't just lose my best friend. You reckless, irresponsible, I yell. You're welcome, she shouts, rain streaming down her face when she pulls away and hands back my blade. Fix your saddle. I'll retrieve the dagger from the ground, she stands, then gives me a flash of a smile before jumping from Taryn's shoulder. I track her fall, breathing a sigh of relief when she lands effortlessly on Fierge. My saddle is stuck, I tell Taryn as we climb back to the battle. Good, maybe you'll stay in it. Sunlight glints off Quinn's labrys as she swings the double-sided battle axe from Kruth's back into the shoulder joint of a wyvern, trying its best to sink its teeth into Glane. Melgrin is ten minutes out, but only two of his aides could keep up, and there's a general consensus that most of the dark wielders are holding back for a second wave. Tern passes Kruth, and I look up into a sea of gray and barely suppress the urge to vomit. There have to be at least six riderless wyvern up there. How long can we keep this up? Pivoting in my saddle, I note Zayden beneath us on Sigil, dragging Wyvern by the throat into the side of the mountain, one by one at speed, as they dive toward them. Sigil's outnumbered. If she wants help, she'll ask for. A pain-filled roar joins the cacophony above, and my chest tightens. And Darna? I reach out, my gaze sweeping the blurred mountainside as we fly upward. I'm quite annoyingly safe and hidden, she responds. Atrum! Tern bellows and my stomach sinks. Riddick. Tern sweeps right, avoiding the plummeting body of a wyvern. But there's another above us with its teeth locked onto Atrum's hindquarters, and three more closing in for the kill. Sawyer and Sleeg fly from the opposite side of our sector, tracking to intercept at the same time, but everyone else is beneath us. I sheath my dagger at my hip, then load the crossbow and strap that at my thigh as we surge upward. Taren's roar shakes his entire body as we approach, and I hold on to the pummel, bracing for the jarring collision. But he flies past as Sawyer and Sleeg reach the fray, then swings his massive tail into the trio of approaching wyvern. I pivot as much as the saddle will let me at the crunching sound of bone shattering. A wyvern falls from the fight, half its head bashed in. One down, three to go. Taren pulls the steepest turn I've ever experienced on his back, and my vision dims at the edge as he brings us nearly vertical before tipping his wing left and falling into a dive. I blink furiously into the wind and rain as we fly to Atrum and Riddick's aid. Riddick's doing all he can from Atrum's back to dislodge the wyvern, stabbing his sword into its snout, but the damn thing won't let go. Slee gets there first, slashing out at the wyvern with his sword tail and cutting into a foreleg. When it doesn't let go, he picks pivots to close his jaw over its neck, but unlike Tern, he isn't strong enough to snap a neck with a bite and loses precious seconds, leaving himself exposed to the remaining pair of wyvern. We're not going to make it in time. The pair changes course, veering from Atrum at the last second and aiming for Sleeg. We're almost there, but everything happens so fucking fast. It's as if the rest of the world slows down. In one heartbeat, the closest wyvern opens its jaws. In the second, it blasts green fire across Sleeg and Sawyer dives backward out of the seat, narrowly avoiding being burned to death and rolling down Sleek's spine with a smoking boot. In the third, it completes its assault, snapping at Sleek's exposed side. Sawyer kicks at the gaping jaws to save his dragon from the bite, but in the next, he takes it himself, his leg disappearing between the wyvern's massive teeth. Sawyer! Riddick yells. Sawyer's scream rips into my soul, and I nearly echo it when the wyvern's jaw locks with an audible click as Tern slows his descent directly overhead, only a dozen feet above Atrum, as the remaining wyvern ducks under the fight. Tern's weight shifts, and I know he's chosen an angle of attack and is about to dive, but in this position, there's only time to save Sawyer or Sleeg, not both. Sawyer bellows in pain as the wyvern half drags him off Sleeg, wrenching away its ugly gray head before snapping again. My stomach twists and my breath threatens to seize. Fuck, there's nothing left below Sawyer's knee. He's losing blood and his grip. 
No, I am not going to stand by and watch another one of my friends die. I refuse. Grasping the dagger in my left hand and the crossbow in my right, I slice through the leather strap of my belt as Terran dips his right wing, giving me the perfect angle for one single second. Forgive me. Don't you dare. Kill the other one quickly for both our sakes. I'm already moving, sheathing my dagger and lunging from the saddle, gaining one, two, three running steps before I leap. And Narna, Zayden, my sister, Brennan, they all flash through my mind as my arms swing through the fall, finding only air, but it's my mother's face I see in my mind when I land on Atrum's back, the soles of my boots finding purchase at the edge of one of his spine scales. Silver one! How's that for a running landing? Holy shit, I made it! Riddick must think the same because he stares at me in pure shock for a good second before he yanks his sword free of the wyvern's nose, then moves to plunge it again as I start running toward him. I can't get the fucking thing off him. My heart pounds as hard as my feet as Terran completes the dive to my right, a patch of black filling my peripheral vision. Ignoring the self-preservation instinct that tells me this is a bad idea, I race to Riddick and shove the crossbow into his hands. Fire it once I'm on sleek and get back in your seat. Once you're what? I don't pause to answer the question, too busy running onto the nose of the goddamn wyvern that's currently having part of its throat ripped out by Sleeg. I run up the slope between the shrieking wyvern's eyes as it sinks its teeth deeper into Atrum, then onto the flat of its head between its horns as Sleeg tears his jaw away. I'm going to throttle you myself once, Terran growls, and I hear the distinct sound of bone crunching in the distance. I get you on the ground. I nearly roll my ankle on a spike halfway down the wyvern's gyrating neck and catch myself as Sleeg swings his head back to the wyvern, attacking his rider. But Sawyer's grip along his spine scales is too tenuous for Sleeg to maneuver quickly. The dragon can't defend his rider without losing him. He lets loose a skull-shaking roar as the wyvern takes another snap at Sawyer, swinging his tail with no effect. Hurry, Vi! Riddick yells. Sleeg! I shout, breaking the cardinal rule of all riders. Let me help him! The red swivels its head toward me, pinning me with furious golden eyes. And I nod, praying to Dune he understands that he holds still. And then, leap from the wyvern's neck, my feet kicking for distance. I land just above Sleeg's eyes and wrap my left arm around one of his horns, using it to both stop my momentum and hold my balance as his head swings toward the wyvern attacking Sawyer, snapping at the wyvern and coming up short. Now, Riddick! Using Sleeg's horn for leverage, I hurtle down his neck as an explosion sounds behind me, heat flaring along my back. Sawyer scoots himself across Sleeg's spine, and I run faster, passing the seat. If he falls to that side, there's nothing Terran can do. We're too close to the ridgeline below. Where are you? I ask Taryn as Sawyer's eyes meet mine in a double take. I ignore the snaps and snarls above me and keep moving. Where I'm supposed to be, unlike you, he bites out, just as his gargantuan frame turns in the sky ahead of me, dropping the lifeless body of the fourth wyvern from his jaws. Good, now do me a favor. I charge past Sleeg's wings and alongside the enormous gnashing teeth of the wyvern, poised to devour Sawyer. Which would be? Terran asks, already flying toward us. Violet? Sawyer's eyes widen with shock as blood pumps out of his leg in sickening rhythmic spurts. He needs a healer, now. I hit my knees, sliding the last few feet and slamming into Sawyer, knocking him farther down Sleeg's spine toward the dragon's hindquarters. Wrapping my arms around Sawyer, I clasp my hands behind his back. Hold on! I shout as we slide over countless red scales, seconds away from the edge. Sleeg banks away from the ridgeline, giving us a few hundred much-needed feet of altitude for the inevitable fall, and tips us over. Silver one! Sawyer's arms close around me as we tumble off Sleeg's back and fall into the open air. Catch me! Wind tears at my hair, my face, my leathers, but I hold onto Sawyer as we drop in total free fall. I can save him. He doesn't have to die today. He won't! One. Two, three, four. I count my heartbeats as we clear the ridgeline. What are you doing? Zayden roars, and there's a faint familiar brush of velvet at the base of my neck, as if Zayden's power has been extended to its limits. Our fall slows, but not by much as a dark wing blocks out the sky. What the hell does it look like I'm...
The breath is knocked from my lungs as an iron vice closes around us, halting our fall with a whipping change of momentum. Tern, what part of stay in your saddle did you not understand? Tern bellows, holding us in the precarious grip of his claw and banking left toward Basgayeth. You couldn't be in two places at once, I argue, fighting to draw breath as Sawyer goes limp above me, his chin falling against my shoulder. You had to kill the fourth wyvern, and Sleeg wouldn't defend himself if it meant losing Sawyer, so I took Sawyer. And you just hoped I'd catch you? He flares his wings, slowing our speed to a glide. As if you wouldn't! Air flows into my lungs in a trickle, then a stream. He scoffs, then changes the subject with, your brother has mended the stone into one piece, but does not feel hopeful. My heart rises just to fall. Well, that's great. Why, can it not be imbued? Marb is not keen on details. Tern lands on three claws in the small field between the back of the school and the cliff, gently opening the one that holds us. What the fuck does that mean? Icy slush greets me as rain continues to fall, and I push Sawyer to his back and roll to my knees, putting my fingers to the pulse of his pale, freckled neck. Somebody help us! I scream, my voice echoing off the stone walls of the administration building. The sluggish beat of his pulse jolts my own. He's losing too much blood too quickly, and there's no help in sight, though it's obvious we're not the first wounded to have landed here. I will call for aid. Tern replies, you can't have him, I tell Malik, shifting to kneel in the scarlet snow. You took Liam, you may not have Sawyer. Sawyer, I wrench the buckle on the belted sheath around my left thigh, and mercifully, it gives. Knives and all, I wrap it over the wrecked leather beneath Sawyer's knee. Inches above raggedly torn flesh, thread the leather through the buckle, and pull as hard as I can, crying out when pain sings through my left shoulder. You have to wake up. Open your eyes. The bitter taste of fear floods my mouth as I force the metal prong through a smooth section of leather by sheer will. Please, I beg him, my voice breaking as my fingers search for his pulse at his wrist, then his neck, leaving crimson fingerprints on his bloodless skin. Please, Sawyer, please. We said we'd all live until graduation, remember? Aid comes, Taryn announces. I remember, Sawyer whispers, his eyes fluttering open. Oh, thank the gods. I smile down at him, my lower lip trembling uncontrollably. Hold on. Violet, Marin calls from across the field, and I look up to see her on Daja's back. The griffin sprinting forward through the rain, covering the distance quickly with Cat and Bragan on foot a bit behind. Tern's head snaps upward toward the battlefield. Sigale, go! If she's in danger, so is Zayden. And given the giant tendrils of shadow emanating from within a wall of gray on the edge of our sector, Tern crouches then springs upward, launching with heavy beats of his wings against the morning sky as Daja reaches us, dragging a litter behind her. What happened? Marin slides from Daja's back, her tan leather streaked with blood. Wyvern took his leg. I glance between them as Bragan and Cat arrive. Are you all right? It's not ours, Bragan says, crouching on the other side of Sawyer. You're going to be all right, he assures him. Just need to get you to the healers. He slides his arms under Sawyer, then lifts and carries him to Daja. The healers, because mending isn't an option, not without his leg. We've been ferrying the wounded. Marin says over her shoulder, rushing back to Daja as Cat helps Bragan lower Sawyer to the litter. Thank you. I sit back on my heels and look to the sky, letting the strength of my bond with Zayden assure me that he's well, instead of possibly distracting him by asking. Don't thank us, Marin says, mounting quickly and settling between Daja's shoulders, before taking off for the healer's quadrant, Bragan following after her. You look like shit. Cat crouches in front of me, her braid as sodden as mine, and she looks me over. I heard what you did up there. Well, Kira saw, and she told me. That took guts. You would have done the same. Exhaustion sweeps in, my shoulders drooping as adrenaline fades. I would have run faster. She slips one of her alloy-hilted daggers free and hands it to me. Looks like you're missing one. I have another. Thank you. I take it like the peace offering it is. I'll look after Sawyer, she promises as she stands. And don't you dare thank me for that. She calls back over her shoulder, walking toward the southwest tower without another word. 
The conduit falls along my forearm as I wipe the rain from my eyes. I'd completely forgotten the damn thing was even there. Glancing left, then right, I note the scattered wyvern bodies and one green club tail that makes my heart stumble. Tiny is alive, Taren promises, already flying back to me. They are holding the last wave back, and your mother, behind you. I stumble to my feet and whip around to face the cliff and the venon who stands about 20 feet away, watching me with a curious look on a heart-shaped face that had at some point been undeniably beautiful. My stomach twists and my grip tightens around the dagger Cat left me. Cat, I don't want to draw attention to the retreating flyer if the venon doesn't already see her. There's no point running, the dark wielder says, walking forward, slowly as if I'm no more of a threat than a butterfly. We both know I'll drain the very ground underneath you. And then this all will have been for nothing. She throws her arms out, gesturing to the mayhem around us. Soren Gale, Cat yells, and I hear the sloshing sound of her running toward me. Run, Cat! I shout, glancing up at Taren and spotting him mid-dive about a minute out. But the footsteps don't slow. The dark wielder's eyes flare as she spots Cat, and she drops to a knee, splaying her hand out over the icy ground. Stop! I yell, my heart lurching into my throat and lodging there. This is so much worse than my nightmare. Even if I could run, there's no telling what she'd do to Cat. Flicking my wrist, I grasp the conduit in my left hand and lift my right, dagger and all, throwing open the doors to Taren's power I'd never fully closed. Slush melts at my feet and steam lifts from my skin as Cat reaches my side. You have to get out of here. Shut up. She pulls a dagger from her thigh sheath. Oh, you are a powerful one, aren't you? The dark wielder cocks her head to the side, a slow insidious smile curving her mouth as she rises, studying me. The lightning wielder. Thunder booms in the cloud above us as energy gathers in my veins, hot and crackling. I don't have to run. I can wield. Her, I don't care about. She glances at Cat. But you, I'm under orders not to kill. So let's not make this difficult. Me? What the hell? She takes a step forward and I release a strike, hitting the ground right in front of her, stopping her in her tracks. You'll be so much fun for him to wield. The nightmare comes back full force, the sage's words tumbling over me, just enough to make my hand tremble. A wild look comes over her narrow set eyes. And I will be his favorite for delivering you. I will be more than just an assam soon. Her words flow faster and faster. I will be given the veil when this is over. Delivering me? You can kill her at any time now, Cat reminds me, her gaze locked on the dark wielder. I want to know what the hell she means about delivering me, I murmur under my breath. You will turn for something much more dangerous. Wasn't that what he said in the nightmare? It will be me, me, the venom shoves her shaking hand into her scraggly red hair. Cat's doing this, heightening the woman's greed, spinning her out on her own emotions. I have to admit it's a pretty badass ability when she's not using it on me. Enough, Win. A dark wielder in leathers the same color as the pulsing veins beside his eyes appears from the left, walking around the body of the fallen green and throwing out his hand. Cat flies backward with a shout, slamming into the ground behind me. Shit, no more time for curiosity. I wield, heat erupting from every inch of my skin as I draw the strike from the cloud above, hitting Win instantly. She falls where she stood, her eyes open and vague, smoke rising from her corpse. Fascinating. The new one strides for me, closing his fist. The conduit flares with intolerable heat. I drop it, watching in horror as it disintegrates, leaving nothing at the end of the bracelet. He flips his hand, palm upward, and I'm lifted off my feet, suspended in midair, completely immobilized, just like the dream. But that isn't the sage. My throat closes. I can't lift a hand to wield or even yell for Cat to run while she can. This isn't a dream. There's no waking up from this. Stay calm, Taren orders nearly on us, but not close enough. I'm on my way, Zayden shouts as the venom steps over the body of his counterpart, like she's a feature of the landscape and continues toward me. They won't make it in time. 
I won't either, which means I've killed us all. But Andorna can live. She just has to hold on, has to choose to survive. He's almost here, so let's move this along, shall we? The dark wielder says, less than a dozen feet away now. The horde tires of hovering, waiting for permission to attack. A shape moves in the cliff behind the dark wielder. No, not a shape. A part of the cliff itself, a giant boulder? A boulder with slivers of golden eyes. It springs forward from the cliff like a projectile, expanding, changing colors, sprouting wings and claws, and black scales. An excerpt from The Journal of Lyra of Moraine, translated by Cadet Jacinia Neilwart. I am alone in thinking the knowledge of wards, the protections they provide, should not solely benefit Navarre. And it has cost me everything. Chapter 63 the dark wielder turns, but he isn't fast enough. Andarna lands directly in front of him, then opens her mouth and breathes fire down upon him, roasting the dark wielder before she snaps her jaws down and rips his head straight off his body. I fall into the melting slush at the same time his corpse does, and she spits out the decapitated smoking head, then huffs a hot breath of sulfur-laced steam. What the actual fuck? You, I scramble to my feet and stumble toward her. You just, I breathe fire, she preens, flaring her wings. Did you just eat him? Cat stands but keeps her distance. You do not speak to dragons, you do not ride, human. And Darna snaps her teeth in Cat's direction. You looked like a part of the cliff. I stare at Andarna like I've never seen her before. Maybe I never have. I told you I could hide. She blinks at me. I open my mouth and shut it, searching for words where there are none. That wasn't hiding. Her scales are as black as Tern's now. Maybe I'm seeing things? Tern lands to the right, sending slush flying, then looks over our small battlefield with quick appraisal. You made quick work of it. She did. I point to Endarna as Sigale and Sleeg land behind Tern. You breathe fire, Tern acknowledges, a note of pride in his voice. I breathe fire, Endarna extends her neck to the fullest. Melgrin orders us to the Vale. Terran's eyes narrow and his head swivels towards Sigale. They're pulling the whole squad to the Vale? I glance upward, noting there are only two wyvern left in our sector. The Horde tires of hovering, waiting for permission to attack. That's what the Dark Wielder said. The final wave hasn't struck yet. Not the whole squad, just us, Zayden clarifies, walking around Tern. Tiny tendrils of steam rise where rain meets the exposed skin of his arms. He looks as tired as I feel, and there's a laceration on his forearm. But the lack of any other visible damage makes my shoulders dip in relief. They haven't sent their last wave yet, and Sawyer and Atrum are already wounded. Moving the two of us leaves the squad and Brennan and the wardstone too exposed. I shake my head. We can't let that happen. Brennan's our best chance at surviving this. Exactly, Zayden says as he reaches my side. You're all right? His arm winds around my shoulders as he presses a hard kiss on my temple. They're holding their own up there while this wave recedes. We need to argue our point quickly. I'm all right, I promise. Let's go. They're out front. We'll meet you there, Tern says. Go to Marb, I tell Andarna pushing on my left shoulder and rotating the joint to try and ease the sharp, pulsing pain deep within the joint. I will be where you need me, she huffs. Fine, as long as that's with Marb, I lift my eyebrows. At a dragon. She flicks her tail twice, then walks off. But at least she's headed in the direction of the wardstone chamber, safely below. 
The hulls of Vesgaith teem with chaos as we pass by a line of griffins and enter the guarded side door beneath the bell tower. My stomach drops. Wounded infantry and riders sit against the wall near this level's entrance to the infirmary in various states of injury, but mostly burns, their cries of pain filling the stone corridor as second- and third-year healers race from patient to patient. They ran out of beds twenty minutes ago, Cat tells us quietly. Infantry is the heaviest hit so far. They usually are, Zayden notes keeping his gaze focused across the hall on the door that leads to the courtyard and off the dozens of wounded to our right. We stop abruptly as a platoon of infantry races by. The insignia on their collars show them as first years. Violet, Cat grabs hold of my elbow, and I turn toward her, pausing as Zayden pushes open the door. Tell your mother we'll fight in the air if she can stop the rain, and if not, deploy us like the infantry. We have more experience fighting Venon than almost anyone here, and griffins are exceptionally quick on the ground. There's only sheer determination in her brown eyes, so I nod. I'll tell her. She drops her hand and Zayden and I walk into the courtyard. It's pure fucking mayhem as we make our way through the lines of squads in dark blue being briefed by trembling second ears. It's as though their ranks have broken, and they're cobbling together units with whoever hasn't been injured. Once we reach the center, we have a clear view of the leadership meeting going on just in front of the open gate. At least they could shut the damn gate, one of the infantry cadets shouts at Zayden and me as we pass. Shutting the gate isn't going to help you, Zayden replies, pointing left to the dead body of a wyvern poking through the partially demolished roof line. Even if they were on foot, the five seconds it will take for them to get through isn't worth losing the necessary egress. I shoot the second year a sympathetic look and follow Zayden out. You could be a little nicer, softer, he counters, kinder. How the hell is that going to help them? He's not wrong. Hey, a second year in dark blue says from a squad on the right, her gaze flicking over my shoulder. I'm sorry, but he's right. Shutting the gate isn't going to help. I say it as gently as I can. That's not why I stopped you. She points behind me. There's a scribe chasing you down. I turn to see Jacinia jogging toward me in the rain, her hand hidden beneath her robes. She's keeping the journal dry. See if you can talk her into getting somewhere safe, Zayden suggests. In the meantime, I'll start picking the fight without you. He walks into the 30-foot-thick archway that serves as Bazgayeth's gate, crossing under the first portcullis and continuing on, immediately gaining the attention of my mother, General Melgren, and three of his aides standing at the edge of the second portcullis. The tails of their dragons swing just past them, forming a wall half the height of the fortress itself, even more in the case of Coda. You should be, I start signing to Jacinia, then drop my hands when I realize there's nowhere safe for her to be. She grasps my elbow with her free hand and pulls me into the archway, under the portcullis. Leaving the journal within the robes, she pulls her other hand free to sign. I think I found the difference between the two, but I think Lyra's journal is the lie. What did you find? I sign, keeping my back turned toward Melgren and raising my shields, blocking everyone out, even Tern and Andarna. I think it's a seven. She lifts her brows at me. But it can't be. I don't understand. I shake my head. Seven what? That's the only difference between the two journals. I thought at first maybe it meant runes, that we'd mistranslated that part, since there are seven runes on the wardstone in Eurasia, she signs, two lines furrowing in her forehead. But I've checked and double-checked. Show me. She nods, then pulls Lyra's journal free and flips to the middle, tapping a symbol in the middle of the page and handing it to me, freeing her hands. That symbol there, it's a seven. But Warwick says six, remember? My heart sinks, and I nod slowly. She has to be wrong. This reads the breath of life of the seven combined and set the stone ablaze in an iron flame. Shoulders drooping, I sigh. Seven dragons is impossible. There are only six dens. Black, blue, green, orange, 
brown, and red. I hand her the journal. And maybe it's not a seven, maybe you mistranslated? She shakes her head, flipping to the very first page of the journal, then gives it back. Here, she taps the symbols, then lifts her hands. Here is recorded the story of Lyra of the first six. She taps the six, then turns the pages to the previous spot in the middle. Seven. My lips part. Shit, shit, shit. They're close, she signs. But that's a seven. And there are seven circles on the ward stone in Eurasia. Seven runes, seven. She repeats the last word, as if I could have possibly misunderstood. Seven. Thoughts spin in my head too quickly to grab a hold of just one. This journal has to be... Wrong, she signs when I remain silent. I close the book and hand it to her. Thank you. You should go to the infirmary. Sawyer is there. And if we... She shoves the journal into her robes and begins signing before I finish. Why is Sawyer in the infirmary? Her eyes fly wide. A wyvern took his leg. She inhales swiftly. Go. If we evacuate the wounded, Marin said she'd watch over him. So if we evacuate, that's the safest place for you to be. She'll get you both out. Jacinia nods. Be safe. You too. She picks up her robes and sprints across the courtyard, cutting toward the southernmost door. My head swims as I turn toward leadership gathered at the end of the archway and begin walking. Could it mean a griffin? Is that what it meant by six and the one? No. If a griffin contributed to the wards, flyer magic would work within the boundaries. But there aren't seven breeds of dragon. I stumble, catching myself with a hand along the stone wall while my brain trips down the path that makes the only sense. Even if that path is ludicrous. But holy shit. I immediately shut the thoughts down before anyone connected to me can break through my shields and catch me thinking them. Absolutely not, Zayden snaps at Melgrin, who stands between two of his aides. I put myself in the middle of my mother and Zayden. You think cadets will be able to defend all this? Colonel Panchek gesticulates wildly at the air as a green club tail. My heart seizes as Tiny takes down the last remaining wyvern in their sector. The gray carcass tumbles from the sky and lands somewhere to the northeast, behind the line of dragons. What are you doing here? Mom asks me as my gaze drifts upward to the line of wyvern hovering in the distance. Up until now, we've been wounded, but they're undeniably the kill shot. And in the center of their line rests a gaping hole, as if they're waiting for someone. She's never far from him, Melgrin quips. Those wyvern are waiting just like the dark wielder implied, and my stomach churns at the thought of who they're waiting for. We're not taking Tern and Segale to defend the Vale, Zayden announces, folding his arms over his chest. They already have first and second wings, plus every unbonded dragon. Segale and Tern land to the right, near the tower that leads to Parapet, and all I can do is hope Andarna isn't hiding over there with them, since I don't dare lower my shields to check. For the first time, I'm the one holding what might be the ultimate secret. You're the reason I can't plan effectively, General Melgren snaps at Zayden. You're the reason I didn't even see this battle occurring. He tries to look down his hawkish nose at Zayden, but he's at least an inch shorter. You're welcome for flying to your aid. Zayden replies, earning a sneer. The veil is the only thing that matters, Mom interrupts, shifting slightly so her shoulder is between Melgrin and me. The archives are already sealed. The rest of the fortress can be rebuilt. You're going to abandon it, Zayden says softly, using that cold, menacing tone that used to scare the shit out of me. From the way Panchik steps back, it hasn't lost its edge. Their silence is damning. My gaze jumps from face to face, looking for someone, anyone to argue. They can launch that line at any moment, Melgrin points to the waiting horde. We have over 60 injured pairs, be it dragon or rider that's wounded. That horde right there will take us as spread out as we are now. 
Then why not move every cadet to the Vale? Zayden challenges. Melgren narrows his beady eyes. You might lead a revolution, Ryerson, but you know nothing about winning a war. At least he called it a revolution and not a rebellion. You're using them as a distraction, Zayden drops his arms. A delaying tactic. They'll die while those in the Vale have time to prepare. Prepare for what, exactly? My jaw drops. You can't do that. I pivot, putting myself in front of Mom. You won't need to. Brennan has mended the Wardstone. Even Brennan can't mend magic cadet Sorengale. There's no give, no room to stray from the course in her eyes. No, I admit, but he doesn't have to. If the stone is mended, it could hold power. We could still raise the wards. I know how. A curious caress of shimmering shadow slides down my shields, but I don't let him in. You weren't entirely successful in erasure, were you? She asks, lowering her voice so only I hear. Could isn't good enough. That part is for a wider audience, and the rebuke heats my cheeks. I can do it, I whisper back just as quietly then raise my voice to be heard. If you put Zayden and me in the veil, you leave the ward stone unprotected. And that is the only solution to keep everyone on this field alive today. You don't know if it works after being mended, she says slowly, like there's any chance I might misunderstand her. And even if it did, their leader has arrived, Taren tells me. And by the way, every rider's face pivots skyward, including mine. He's not the only dragon who's noticed. There, in the center of the horde, now flies a wyvern slightly larger than the others, bearing a rider in royal blue. The pitch of my stomach says that if he comes closer, I'll recognize his dark, thinning hair and the annoying purse of his lips, even if logic argues that I won't, that it's just a fucking dream. My heart rate soars as fear soaks into my skin, colder than the rain and melting snow around us. As you can see, Mom says, tearing her gaze from the horde. It's too late for wards now. It's not, I argue. Cadet, Mom starts. I can get them up, I promise, putting myself in her way when she tries to sidestep me. If they can hold power, then I can get the wards up. Cadet, Mom snaps, her cheeks turning ruddy. At least see if the stone can hold power before you sentence all of us to death, I push. Violet, Mom shouts. Listen to me, I yell right back. For once in your life, listen to what I'm telling you. She draws her head back. I forge on. For once in my life, trust me. Have faith in me. I can get the wards up. There it is, the slight narrowing of her eyes that says I have her attention. If we raise the wards, every wyvern on this field is dead. Every dark wielder is powerless, I swallow thinking of Jack. Nearly powerless. Name one other weapon capable of managing that feat. Just go down there with me and see if it will hold power. Help me imbue it, I plead with my mother. If it won't hold power, then I'll do whatever you want. But I can do this, General. I know how. Enough of this. We're wasting time, Melgren waves me off, then walks toward Coda, his aides following after. Wait, my mother calls out, and my heart stops. I'm sorry, General, Melgren snaps, pausing to face us just outside the archway. This is my school, Mom lifts her chin. I said, wait. It's my army, he barks, and there is no waiting. Technically, half of it is your army. Zayden says, his gaze pinned on the wyvern horde. The other half is mine. And seeing that you had no problem having my father executed, I have no problem leaving you to die if you refuse her help. Melgren stares at Zayden, the color slowly draining from his face. That's what I thought. Zayden sticks out his hand. You want to walk with me, Violet? Something in his tone, maybe it's resignation, makes me twine my fingers with his, following him as he walks out of the archway past Melgren and toward the dragons. Where are you going? They're about to attack, Melgren starts. I'm buying her the time she needs, 
Zayden answers, and my stomach sinks. And they won't attack. Not yet. They're still waiting. What the fuck for? Melgren snaps. Zayden's hand tightens around mine. Me. An excerpt from Recovered Correspondence of Cadet Liam Mari to Sloan Mari. You're going to love Violet. She's smart and stubborn. Reminds me a lot of you, actually. You just have to remember when you meet her, she's not her mother. Chapter 64 What do you mean they're waiting for you? I ask once we're in front of Coda, facing an open battlefield littered with the corpses of wyvern and dragons alike. A pulsing ache of dread erupts in my chest. There's already been so much death, and we haven't yet faced the worst of their forces. From the look of that line, they've held almost all of their dark wielders back. That's one of their teachers, Zayden says, his eyes locked on the venon riding front and center. The one who escaped Resson. He was at the cliffs, too. I fight to keep my voice as calm as possible despite the palpitations of my heart. I need to get those words up now. They're the best chance we have of getting out of here alive. But each dragon can only contribute their fire to one wardstone, which means... He thought we'd be at Samara. Figured we'd do the honorable thing and answer Milgren's call. How do you know that? My brow furrows. Do us both a favor and don't ask. Taren and Sigail prowl out past Imser, monitoring the threats both on the ground and in the sky as they head this way. Heart pounding, I glance between them and the slowly lowering figure of the sage a hundred yards away. He's coming to the ground. Shit, I have to be quick. If you had to choose to correctly raise the wards here at Bezgaith or ours at, I can't say it, not here, what would you choose? Zayden's brow knits as he tears his gaze from the sage to look at me. You have to choose. I only have the resources to fully raise the wards here or there. There's a blatant plea in my tone. I could never take that choice from you. He's already given so much. He flinches, then glances toward the hovering horde and the theatrically slow descent of the sage on his wyvern, before bringing his eyes back to mine quickly. You ward wherever you are, which is here. But you're home. It's softer than a whisper. You are my home. And if we all die here today, then the knowledge dies with us. Ward Bezgaith. You're sure? My heart beats like the second hand of a clock, taking down what time we have left. I'm sure. I nod and slip my hand from his and pivot, facing down the biggest dragon on the continent. I need to talk to you. Holy fuck, Violet. Zayden turns, putting himself at my side as Coda slowly lowers his head, tilting toward the end to glare at me with narrowed golden eyes, because even level, I won't come past his nostrils. You know what you're doing? If I don't, we're all dead. And I'd better be quick because Taren is almost here. I can feel him dismantling my shields. No rider can keep their dragon out for long if they want in. Coda's nostrils flare and his lip curls above very sharp, very long, very close teeth. You know, it comes out like the accusation it is. And you didn't tell your rider because dragon kind protects dragon kind. A blast of steam hits me in the face, and Zayden swears under his breath, shadows curling at his feet. Yes, I figured it out. I've already used Terran's fire on the second ward stone. So if I power the stone at Bezgaith, will you come? I ask my fingernails cutting into my palms to keep from shaking. This is the one dragon on the continent besides Sigil, who doesn't fear Tern on one level or another. You don't need him as the black dragon for Bezgaith, Zayden argues. You have Andarna. Will you come? I hold Coda's menacing glare. We're all dead if you don't. The Imperium will end. He huffs another breath of steam, softer this time then dips his chin in a curt nod, lifting his head as Taren approaches from the left and Melgren appears on the far side of Coda's foreleg. 
You court death? Taryn asks, pushing past my shields. I needed to confirm a secret that isn't mine to share, I answer. Please don't push. Taryn's talons flex in the icy slush beside me. I turn to Zayden. I don't want to leave you, and I have about a million questions as to why you think they're coming for you, but if I don't, every fiber of my being rebels at the notion of leaving him. Leaning in, he lifts his hand to the nape of my neck. You and I both know you can't raise the wards and stay to fight. When we were in Resson, I held them back while you fought. I trusted you to handle yourself. Now, trust me to handle myself while you get the wards up before more people die. End this. He kisses me hard and quick, then looks at me like this will be the last time he ever sees me. I love you. Oh, gods. No, I refuse to accept the goodbye in his tone. You will stay alive, I order Zayden, then glance to the waiting horde, the figure of the sage who is nearly to the ground, taking his time, as if this is all a game he's already won, and finally to Tern. Stay with him. Tern growls, raising his lip over his fangs. Stay with him for me. Don't you dare let him die. Turning on my heel, I break into a run without saying goodbye to Zayden. Farewells aren't needed when I'll see him shortly, because there's no chance I'm going to fail. The Flyers want to fight, I say to Melgrin. Let them. I pretend I haven't been in battle for the last two hours, haven't wielded to exhaustion, haven't pushed my body to the breaking point, and run. Cut the storm so the griffins can fly! I shout at my mother as I pass by, sprinting under the archway. Fuck her permission or her understanding. If the wardstone can hold power, I'll imbue it on my own. My arms pump and I force my legs to move, despite the jarring pain in my knees. I run through the courtyard, dodging infantry squads, and I run up the central steps. I run through the open door and down the hall with a pounding heart and burning lungs. I run like I've been training for it since Resson. I run because I couldn't save Liam, couldn't save Soleil, but I can save the rest of them. I can save him. And if I give myself even a moment to linger on the possibilities of what he might be facing, I'll turn around and run straight back to Zayden. Taking the spiral steps at breakneck speed has me dizzy when I reach the bottom of the southwest tower, and I don't waste my gasped breaths on our first year standing guard at the doorway as I sprint through into the tunnel that smells like varish and pain. Move! I shout at Lynx and Baylor, because I remember their names. Avalon, Sloane, Auric, Kai the Flyer. I know all the first year's names. They dive to opposite sides, and I force my body sideways, shuffling through the narrowest part of the tunnel. My chest tightens, and I think of Zayden. Zayden, and the scent of thunderstorms and books. That's all I let in as I force my way through the passage. And as soon as it opens up, so do I, pushing myself harder than I ever have racing down the rest of the tunnel and into the ward chamber lit by morning sunlight. Only then do I skid to a halt and brace my hands on my knees, breathing deeply to keep from puking. Does it work? I ask, looking up at the stone that is miraculously in one piece and standing where it should be. Damn, Soren Gale, I don't think I've ever seen you run that fast. Arik lifts his brows. Here, Brennan stumbles out from next to Arik, his reddish-brown waves damp with sweat, and the first year catches him, slinging his arm over his shoulder to keep my brother standing. It took everything I had to mend it. Will it hold power? I ask, forcing myself to stand through the nausea. Try, Brennan suggests. If it doesn't, this was all for nothing. Every second counts as I step up to the stone. It looks exactly how it did when we arrived last night, with the exception of the powerful hum of energy and the flames. Looks just like ours did before we imbued and fired it, Brennan observes. Right, except this stone was actually on fire when we got here, I tell him, lifting my hand to the black iron. Iron doesn't catch fire, Brennan argues. Tell that to the ward stone, I counter. Without a conduit, this is harder than I imagined but I have to know. Opening up the archive's door again, I welcome Tern's power in a focused trickle, just like Felix taught me. But instead of powering the conduit, I rest my fingertips on the wardstone and let it flow. How long did it take for three to imbue the wardstone at home? Brennan asks. 
weeks, I answer, my fingers tingling painfully, like they've just had circulation restored after a lengthy period of numbness, and I watch with more than a little satisfaction when energy streams past the tips. I pull my hand back an inch, just enough to see the white-blue strands connect my fingertips to the stone, and then I increase the power. Heat prickles my skin, and I push myself to the edge to imbue, which isn't as far as I'd like it to be after hours of wielding. Sweat pops on my forehead, and my skin flushes red. We don't have weeks, Brennan says softly, as though talking to himself. I know. Roars sound in the distance, and I look up through the chamber's opening to the sky so far above us. My throat closes at the sight of gray clashing with green, with orange. My squad is up there fighting without me. Zayden is battling at the gates. We're out of time. I cut my power, then rest my palm on the stone. There's a tiny vibration, like the ripple of water after a pebble has been skipped into a vast lake. We don't have enough pebbles. It can hold power, but we don't have enough riders who can imbue down here. I'll have Marb put the word out, Brennan says, and we both look skyward when a flash of red is quickly followed by one of gray. We need every rider who can make it. But who the hell is going to stop fighting and risk the battle on a hunch? My heart careens. It looks exactly like what my mother warned us not to let happen. A full-on melee. A dark shape moves at the top edge of the chamber, and I lower my shields for the first time since speaking to Jacinia. Get down here, I say to Endarna, walking around to the back of the stone, so no one coming to help imbue will see her. I am not fond of pits. Now, there's no room for argument in my tone. I put my hand on the stone and call my power to rise while she descends, blackening out the sun momentarily on her way down, where no one else can see. Power flows out of me in a steady drip, buzzing the ends of my fingertips as I feed it into the stone. She lands, sticking to the shadows the morning light doesn't yet touch. Why didn't you tell me? Her golden eyes blink in the darkness. Tell you what? I know. I shake my head at her. I should have known earlier. The second I saw you after Resson. I knew something was different about the sheen of your scales, but I figured I'd never been around an adolescent, so what would I know? Different. She cocks her head to the side and steps out of the darkness, her scales shifting from midnight black to a shimmering, deep purple. That's exactly how I've always felt. It's why you feel like you don't fit in with the other adolescents, I note, my hands shaking as I hold the power steady, giving the stone what I can until others arrive to help. It's why you were allowed to bond. Gods, you told me yourself, but I thought you were just being... An adolescent, she challenges, flaring her nostrils. Nodding, I try to ignore the sounds of battle high above so I can concentrate on saving us, even as anger barrels down the bond from Tarn and Fury. I can't think about what Zayden's doing. I should have listened when you said you were the head of your own den. That's why no one could fight your right of benefaction last year. Why the Empyrean allowed a juvenile to bond. Say it. Don't just guess, she demands. Even a slow breath won't calm my racing heart. Your scales aren't really black. No. Even now, her scales are changing, taking on the grayish hue of the stone around us. But he is. And I so badly want to be just like him. Tern, it's not hard to guess. He doesn't know. Only the elders do. She lowers her head, resting it on the ground in front of me. They revere him. He is strong and loyal and fierce. You are all those things, too. I wobble under the strain of wielding, but keep my balance, keep the power flowing into the stone. You didn't have to hide. You could have told me. If you didn't figure it out, you weren't worthy of knowing, she huffs. I waited 650 years to hatch. Waited until your 18th summer when I heard our elders talk of the weakling daughter of their general, the girl 
forecasted to become the head of the scribes. And I knew you would have the mind of a scribe and the heart of a rider. You would be mine. She leans into my hand. You are as unique as I am. We want the same things. You couldn't have known I would be a rider. And yet, here we are. A thousand questions go through my head, none of which we have the time for. So I give her exactly what I wanted. To be seen for who and what she is. You are not a black dragon, or any of the six that we know of. You're a seventh breed. Yes, her eyes widen in excitement. I suck in a quick, steadying breath. I want you to tell me everything, but our friends are dying, so I need to ask if you are willing to breathe fire for the stone. Sweat pops on my forehead as my temperature rises, and yet I pull more and more power, my arm trembling with the effort to keep it leashed, keep it trickling instead of striking. It is why I was left behind, she cocks her head to the other side. At least, from what I remember, it has been centuries. Nice to see you, Cam. Your father's been looking for you. I hear Mom's voice from the other side of the stone. I'm a bonded rider. There's nothing he can- Don't really care. It holds power. Mom? What the hell could she be doing here? She should be on the battlefield. Fly, I order Andarna, my voice weakening. I don't trust her to see you. It holds power, Brennan replies. Andarna hesitates, then launches, flying for the top of the chamber. My fingers scrape across the stone as I slowly make my way around the side. You are pushing the limits, Tern warns, distress tightening his tone. I have no choice. Taking a few staggered steps, I reach for Zayden lightly. Not to distract, but just to feel. His shields are up, blocking me completely out. He fights, Tern says, and my vision darkens momentarily before clearing again. With a view of the battlefield, I'm seeing through his eyes just like I had in Darna's last year. A swath of gray blocks out the world a second before the sky appears again, red flowing against the clouds in a stream, and then Tern glances beneath him, watching the wyvern fall with a burst of satisfaction before he scans the ground, spotting Zayden near the edge of the ravine. My heart beats erratically as I watch the sage easily block each of Zayden's shadows with blasts of blue daggers of fire, then stops completely when the dappled sunlight catches on two blades embedded in the ground behind the staff-wielding venom. Zayden must have thrown his daggers and missed. I know he carries a third, but will he get to it? Because the sage isn't losing territory, he's gaining on Zayden, coming closer step by step, backing Zayden against the edge of the ravine. Green fire streams from overhead, and Tern jerks his attention upward to Segale, and the three wyvern moving in to attack, one blasting cherry red fire. Oh, gods, there are even more breeds than we know about. Terror floods the pathway, and my vision darkens again, my ears ringing as if I've just been hit. I blink and breathe deeply, forcing air through my throat as it constricts, and the chamber comes back into view, stumbling one step, then another, and another. I drag my hand along the slowly warming stone as I turn the corner to the front of the wardstone chamber, catching sight of Mom, Brennan, and Arik in the middle of a conversation I can't hear over the ringing in my ears. The power not only burns, but scorches my veins, my muscles, my very bones. You're burning out, and Darna warns, her voice pitching high with worry. The next breath I take singes my lungs. Silver one, Tern roars. The wards have to go up. You both have to live. Promise me you'll choose to live. Because I'm starting to realize the price of imbuing this wardstone in time to save everyone I love. And it's my life. My power feels so insignificant to a stone this size. It would take all of Tern's power, his very life, and I won't give that. But I can give enough that the riders who make it can finish the job. I fall to my knees, but I don't lose contact. I pour, 
and poor, opening my archive's door and taking on the full force of Terran's power, shaking with the effort to keep it controlled, focused, constructive instead of violent. Violet? Brennan's voice sounds from far away. Heat surges through me in waves as I push power into the stone, and my world narrows to pain, heat, and my racing heartbeat. Violet! Mom rushes to me, her eyes wide with fear as she reaches for my free hand, then gasps, drawing back a red, blistered palm. The ground rises toward my face, and I throw that hand out to catch myself against the stone floor and keep channeling. So what if my skin sizzles, my fingers redden, my muscles give out, and I surrender to the fire? Nothing matters beyond imbuing this stone, raising the wards that will save my friends, my siblings. Zayden! What's your signet? Mom shouts, but I lack the strength to lift my head. You can't do this! And Darna argues in a shriek. You have your purpose. Even my mental voice is a whisper. Maybe this is mine. Hasn't manifested, Arik answers in a panic. What about the others out there? Mom's voice rises. He starts to answer the ones he knows of, and I tune him out to stay focused on control, on lasting long enough to be the most use. Brennan hits the ground to my left, crouching a few feet away, his lips moving, but I close my eyes and reach for more of the power that's slowly killing me. You will cease, Terran orders. I'm so sorry. The muscles in my arm lock from exhaustion. Finally, now I won't have to hold it in place. I'm entering the final stages of burnout, just like I had on top of the mountain with Varish. You shouldn't have to lose two riders this way. Forcing my eyes open, I stare at the pattern of rock beneath my fingers, and I get it. I finally understand why someone would turn to stealing magic. All of the power in the world is beneath my fingertips, and if I channel, if I take from the earth instead of from Tern, I'll have enough power to save. You must save yourself, Tern demands. I chose you not as my next, but as my last, and should you fall, then I will follow. No! Steam rises from my skin. Let go! And Darna pleads, and the rush of air in the chamber paired with the slight tremble of the ground tells me she's landed. I won't do it! Sloane's shout echoes off the walls and breaks through the haze. Inch by painful inch, I force myself to raise my head just in time to see Brennan's eyes widen and Mom's boot rising toward my shoulder. She makes impact softly, and before I can open my mouth, she kicks with her full strength, sending me sprawling across the chamber floor and breaking my hold on the wardstone. Power flies into the air with the crack of lightning as I hit my back, and a scream tears from my throat, the sound echoed by Brennan as his face fills my vision, and he grasps my hand. Cool relief streaks up my arm, the burn fading, my muscles mending from the strain and releasing. If I don't cut the power, he'll die. He can't mend me that fast over and over, and the next wave of heat pushes forward. I shove the archive's door closed with the last of my mental strength, and the power cuts off. The relief from Tern and Endarna is instant. But all I taste is the sour bite of defeat as I lie there, my brother kneeling next to me as he mends the body I've been so reckless with. And above me, I see a flash of green before the swarm comes into view the sky darkening with beating gray wings. It's the only way, Mom yells, and I turn my head as my muscles knit and my skin cools. You can't imbue something this big in an instant, not without hundreds of riders, which we don't have. If you want to save your friends, you'll do this, she shouts at Sloan, her fingers wrapped around the first year's wrist as she drags her to the ward stone. Mom, I croak, but she doesn't answer. You're a Mari, Mom says to Sloan. Yes. Her bright blue eyes meet mine, wide with uncertainty. I killed your mother. Mom taps on her chest. Mom, I shout. Brennan collapses next to me, pale and sweating, and I haul myself to my knees. I tracked her down and hauled her to her own execution. Remember? Mom says to Sloane, pushing her against the stone. You were there. I made you watch, you and your brother. Liam, Sloane whispers. Mom nods, picking up Sloane's left hand and putting it on the lowest circle of the massive rune carved into the stone. I could have stopped his death, too.
if I'd just paid a little more attention last year to what my own aide was doing. No! I shout, lunging forward. Arik runs in from the side of the ward chamber, not only catching me, but stopping me. Let me go! I can't, he says apologetically. She's right. And if I have to choose between her life and yours, I choose yours. My life or hers. And Darna! I scream. I'm so sorry. I choose your life too. You are mine. I can't let you die. And Darna shifts around my side, moving forward so she's poised to step between my mother and me. Oh, gods. No, Sloan is a siphon. Can you hear them up there? Dying. That's what's happening, Mom says, her tone softer than she's ever used with me. Your friends are dying, Cadet Mari. Tyrandor's heir is fighting for his life, and you can stop it. You can save them all. She picks up her free hand, and to my dread, Sloan doesn't drop the other from the stone. Don't do it, I cry. Sloane, that's my mother. This isn't happening. Maybe Sloane won't listen to me, but she'll listen to Zayden. I throw down my shields. Pain, agonizing, blistering pain soars down the pathway. Hopelessness and helplessness. It hits me from every angle, stealing my breath, overwhelming my senses and my strength. My body sags, my full weight in Arik's arms, as my mind fights to separate Zayden's emotions from mine. He's, I can't think around the pain, can't breathe for the tightness in my chest, can't feel the ground beneath my feet. Zayden's dying, I whisper. Sloane's gaze snaps to mine, and that's all it takes. You don't have to do anything but stand there, my mother promises somewhere in the distance. Your signet will take over for you. Think of yourself as nothing more than a conduit for power. You're simply facilitating mine flowing into the stone. Violet, Sloane whispers. I drag my gaze to hers, but I'm not here, not really. I'm dying on the battlefield, the last of my strength fading, burning, consuming my body. But it will be worth it to save the one I love. Violet, fight! I scream down the bond at all three of them, shouting past blood and vengeance, wrath and fire, the sour taste of wyvern flesh between her teeth. You can do this, Mom says, her voice soothing. Mom! My voice cracks as she laces her fingers with Sloane's. It's all right, Mom says to me, her eyes softening as Sloane's body goes rigid. As soon as my power, I'm Sir's power, lives within the stone, fire it. Raise the wards. There's nothing I wouldn't do to keep you safe. Do you understand? Everything was to get you to this moment when you'd be strong enough. She falls to her knees, but doesn't let go of Sloan. No, no, no. I fight Oryx's arms as my chest threatens to collapse, to crumple in on my heart. Mom blinks in and out of my vision, blurry one second, then clear. I'm so sorry, Oryx whispers. You're everything we dreamed you would be, Mom says quietly, her skin paling even as Sloane's flushes scarlet. All three of you. She looks down at Brennan. And I'll get to see him soon. Our father. My eyes flare as I struggle to break free from Arik. Don't, Brennan begs, shaking his head. Don't do this. He staggers to his feet, stumbling her direction, but doesn't get far before falling. Live well. Her head bobs, and her eyes roll as her skin takes on a waxy pallor that's an obscene contrast to her flight leathers as her chest rises and falls slower in a stuttered, incomplete breath. Brennan crawls toward her. Footsteps sound from behind me, coming at us at a run. No! I scream, tearing my throat, ripping into my soul. A distinct hair-raising hum emanates from the ward stone as Mom falls forward into Brennan's arms.
Sloane staggers backwards, staring at her palms like they belong to someone else, and Arik finally lets me go. I fly forward, hitting my knees in front of where Brennan sits with Mom's body draped across his lap, his hand trembling as he reaches for her face. My fingers find her neck, but there's no pulse, no heat, no life. The only beat I hear are bootsteps racing into the chamber. She's gone. Mom, Brennan whispers, his face crumpling as he looks down at her. What did you do? Mira drops to her knees and pulls Mom's body from Brennan, her hands furiously seeking what mine just had, any sign of a heartbeat. Mom! She shakes her violently, but Mom's head rolls onto her shoulder. Mom! I can't breathe. She's the tide. The storms, the very air, a force too big to be extinguished without ripping the world itself apart to the core. How can she just be gone? I am so sorry, Sloane cries softly. What did you do? Mira yells again, the full force of her wrath turned on Brennan. Satan needs you, and Darna says, but I can't move. Tern and Sigale wait with him. We need to get them out, Arik says, and there are hands. His, I think, on my shoulders, pulling me up off the floor and guiding me backward. Mira follows, hooking her arms under Mom's and dragging her from the chamber. Sloan helps Brennan. And then... We're all in the tunnel. Someone else carries mom. One of the first years? Mira's hands are on my face, searching my eyes, as a shape blocks the entrance to the tunnel. Are you all right? I couldn't stop her. Was that my voice? Or Brennan's? Heat flares, intense enough to suck the oxygen from my lungs, but it doesn't touch us. And Darna is in the doorway, her wings flared to stop the flame that circles the chamber, flowing in from six above, and the one who makes all the difference. A pulse of energy runs through me in a wave. The warts. When Andarna moves, my gaze wanders up the mended ward stone to the iron flame that burns black on top. It's all that's left of my mother. An excerpt from A Recovered Unsent Correspondence of General Lilith Sorengale. Most generals dream of dying in service to their kingdom. But you know me better than that, my love. When I fall, it will be for one reason only to protect our children. Chapter 65 Thud. Thud. The sound echoes down the ward chamber. Wyvern bodies, and Darna tells me, pivoting to peek her head through the doorway. Please forgive me. Her golden eyes blink. Forgive her. She made a choice, I whisper, but the tears falling down my cheeks aren't quite as resigned, nor are the sobs racking Mira's body, and the blank stare on Brennan's face is anything but peaceful as he removes his flight jacket in slow, jerky motions and drapes it over Mom's body. I'm not sure how much time passes as we're ushered down the tunnel and through the narrow passage. The stairs are a blur. You are alive. You will live today. You will wake tomorrow, Tern promises me as I force one foot in front of the other. Zayden, I reach through the bond, but his shields are up. He lives. Thank you, Dune. That's gravity, right? He's enough to keep my feet grounded, to keep the sun rising. He'll put her body in the quadrant, someone tells Brennan. A dragon must have brought Mom's body out of the ward chamber. 
we emerge from the Southwest Tower to the sounds of victory. Cheers and cries of thanks to the gods. Infantry, healers, riders, and flyers alike clog the hallway with their hugs. But we make it through. Mira, Brennan, and I stand in the doorway of the courtyard, watching the celebration break into full force. None of us seem able to move. A face appears in front of mine, brown eyes, brown hair. Dane. Violet? He lifts a blood-soaked arm to reach for me, then thinks twice. Are you- Move! Rhiannon pushes him out of the way, her grin tired and so very beautiful. You got the wards up! She cups my face with both hands. Yes. I manage a nod, my gaze skimming over her face. There are a few tears in the thighs of her leathers that might be stab wounds, but I can't tell. Are you hurt? It's nothing, she assures me. You should have seen it. The wyvern started falling from the sky like dead weights, and the venon panicked and ran. Leadership is hunting them down. Good. That's good, I keep nodding. The others- Riddick is all right. Imogen took a swipe on her side, but she's barely complaining. Uh, Quinn has a busted cheek, but I think it's mostly swelling. And I was just headed to check on Sawyer and the flyers. Want to- She studies my expression. Zayden? Alive, I croak, according to Tern. She glances at Brennan, then Mira, before turning back toward me. Understanding, dawning as her face falls. My mom, I try to explain, but my throat closes. She, the Wardstone didn't have any power, and my mom. Oh, Fi. Re takes the step that separates us and pulls me in a hug. It doesn't matter that I shouldn't, that it's a shameful display of emotion, or that she wouldn't want it. I break down and sob against Rhiannon's shoulder, my breaths coming in heaving gasps. With every tear, I feel my feet gain traction on a spinning world, feel the first waves of shock start to pass. When I look up, Brennan is sitting on the steps that lead into the administration building, looking ready to pass out as he gives orders, and Mira is nowhere to be seen. What do you need? Re asks. I reach out to Zayden, but his shields are still locked up tight, so I drag the backs of my hands across my face and try like hell to pull myself together. I need to lay eyes on Tern and Zayden. In the front, Tern tells me, and I head in that direction, passing the negotiations between Melgrin and Devera, and pausing when I hear him laying out terms for our return. An attack? A horde that big? Bodies dropping all over the kingdom? There's no chance leadership can hide this. It's only a matter of hours before every Navarian citizen knows they've been lied to. No wonder they want us to return. I'm not even sure I want to come back. I make my way through the courtyard and then the archway into the open air. Open. Graveyard. Bodies of wyvern litter the ground with a few colors mixed in. But I don't recognize any of the dragons I pass as I make my way to the looming shapes of Tern and Segal near the edge of the ravine. Are you harmed? I ask him. You would know if I were, he says, his head swiveling as Andarna approaches, her right wing trembling as she flares them just before landing. You two need to catch up. Right now. Taryn turns a golden eye on me. Right now, I repeat. His attention fully shifts to Andarna, and I walk towards Zagale, feeling Zayden beyond where she sits guard. Are you going to let me pass? I ask her, keeping my eyes on hers and not the blood beard she's sporting. You fought well today. Thank you. A reluctant smile tugs at my lips. You did too. Yes, well, I'm expected to. She shifts her forelegs, 
revealing Zayden standing at the edge of the ravine, his back turned toward me. Be careful of your words. That's ironic coming from you, I mutter, but move forward, surveying him. There's a laceration across his upper back, but that's all I see as I walk to his side, keeping my toes a few inches from the edge, where his damn near hang over. What happened? I killed him. His voice is flat, and so is his expression. The noon sun cutting away almost every shadow from his face. Snapped whatever tether he had on me and killed him. His body fell into the ravine. And now I keep watching the river like it's going to pop back up. Even though I know he's miles downstream by now. I'm sorry I wasn't here. I reach for his hand, but he tugs it away. I'm not. You saved us. My mother saved us. My voice cracks. She had Sloan siphon Imser's power and both their life energies into the ward stone. She's gone. His eyes slide closed. I'm so fucking sorry. She killed your father. Why would you be sorry? I swipe at another tear that leaks out. I didn't want her dead, he says softly. I could never want anyone you love dead. Silence falls over us, and it's not the comfortable kind. Melgrin wants us to come back. I throw out there, looking for some reaction. Any reaction. Then we come back, he nods. Horatia's wards are already weakening, and these are intact. Which, you'll explain to me later, right? His gaze flicks sideways at me, but quickly leaves, like I'm painful to look at. I'll explain, I promise. Good, he nods. It's safer for you here. This is where we should be. He drags in a shaky breath and laughs. You won't be as scared under the full wards. My brow furrows. I just fought an entire wyvern army, dark wielders, and raised wards, losing my mother in the process. Please, do tell me what could possibly be scarier than that. You love me, he whispers. You know I do. I grab hold of his hand and my stomach twists when he turns toward me but lowers his eyes. What's out there that I should be scared of, Zayden? What did he tell you? What did you see? What could he know that has him this shaken? Slowly, he drags his gaze up my body, and it feels like it takes years for him to just look at me. When he finally does, I gasp, my hand tightening on his in reflex. No. That single word is all I can think, feel, scream internally as I stare up at the man I'm hopelessly in love with. Me, he whispers, a faint, almost indistinguishable red ring emanating from his gold-flecked onyx irises. You should be scared of me. An excerpt from a missive from Lieutenant Colonel Nolan Colbercy to General Lilith Sorengale. We have tried every method we know of, as you requested. There is no cure. There is only control. Chapter 66 Zayden Every note of Sigil's terror plays down my spine as I hang suspended mere feet above the battlefield, my muscles frozen, my power locked uselessly inside of me. Even if he let me go, I'm not sure I'd have enough strength left to wield. He wore me down for fucking fun. I was never a match for him. None of us are. 
Every nerve in my body screams from the pain of incineration, the heat from wielding too much for too long, burning me alive. But worse than the pain is the defeat. It hurts, doesn't it, nearing burnout? The sage walks a slow circle around me, his blue robes darker at the hem from the melting snow, mere feet from the ravine I had to cross to prove I could cut it in this place. Magic does like everything in balance. Take too much, and she'll consume you for overstepping. I tear at the bonds he has wrapped around me, invisible strings of power that bind me like a trussed chicken. You strike, I block. You throw, I dodge. He sighs, dragging his staff in the dirt behind him, just like my fucking nightmares. Except the sweat dripping down the back of my neck reminds me that this is very much my reality. That Violet is beneath Beskyeth, fighting to raise the wards. That Tern is picking off the wyverns, tearing at Segale above me to keep her from my side. What is it about me that fails the females in my life? So, I'm going to give you one last chance to make the right choice, so we can get this over with, the sage says, stopping in front of me and smiling up at me with those eerie red-rimmed eyes and spider-webbed veins. He retreats a handful of steps, then taps the staff on the ground. Gravity claims me, and I fall, passing my feet and slamming into the ground on my hands and knees. I told you once that you'd turn for love, he says, holding his arms out. And so you shall. You don't know shit about me. I stumble from my feet and fall again, landing on my knees as Segale roars in pure fury overhead. I know more than you think. He lowers his staff and leans on it like a walking stick. Because you're a sage? I spit, grounding my feet on the hillside in Tyrandor and reaching for my power. A sage, he laughs. I am a general. Fire races down my arms and shadows stream from beneath me, wrapping around the arrogant asshole's torso. Satisfaction courses through me in a high better than churm. Generals die the same as soldiers. I fight with my own arms to get them to move, but they don't obey, having gone into muscle failure long before he hefted me into the sky. Do they? He laughs again, wrapped in darkness. Come on, Shadow Wielder. Turn. It's the only way to save her. Fuck you. I throw myself down the bond and feel Violet slipping, burning, intending to... My shadows slip, but the general doesn't move. She's going to sacrifice herself to save me. She intends to die. My heart vaults into my throat, and I taste it again, the same as it was when I sat by her bedside after resting fear. You know what will happen when you fail, the general taunts, flicking at the weak bands of shadow that curl around his throat. I'll step over your dead body and find her. Then I'll wrap my hands around her delicate little neck. Fury surges in my veins, the blast of adrenaline enough to solidify the bands of shadow and yank them tight. But no matter how hard I tug, he won't move. And drain her. I slam one hand onto the ground and clench my other fist my arms shaking with the effort it takes to hold him there as I delve into the depths of Segale's power and let the fire consume me. Hold him, she demands. But I can't. He's too strong and I have nothing left. But I'll be damned if Violet suffers the consequences. He won't get his hands on her, not today, not ever. The slush beneath my palm melts and I feel there's something beneath me. A steady flow of unmistakable power. You cannot, Segale shrieks. I chose you. But Violet chose me too. I reach. My heart stammers and I gasp for air jolting upright in bed. I check the back of my neck, but it's dry. No dripping sweat, no aching muscles, no exhaustion. Just Violet. Sleeping beside me, her cheek resting on the pillow, 
her breaths deep and even thanks to the exhaustion that's left bruises under her eyes, her arm bent as though reaching out for me even in her dreams. I watch her long enough to calm my racing heart, my gaze skimming over every part of her I can see from the silvery lines of her hard-won scars to the silvery half of her hair on the pillow. She's so fucking beautiful I can barely breathe, and I almost lost her. My fingertips trail over the smooth, soft skin of her cheek, spotting the tracks her tears left. She lost her mother today, and while I won't mourn the loss of Lilith Sorengale, I can't stand the pain Violet's suffering. And yet, I'm about to be the biggest cause of it. I love you, I whisper, just because I can. And then I climb from the bed as quietly as possible and dress quickly in the moonlight. Silently, I leave the room then make my way down the hall and to the staircase, surrounding myself in the warmth of my shadows as I descend floor by floor to the tunnels of Basgayeth. I don't bother reaching for Sigil. She's been eerily silent since the battle ended. The doors to the bridge open at my command, as do the ones on the far side when I reach them, keeping myself wrapped in darkness as I pass the overflowing clinic where we'd spent hours waiting for Sawyer to come out of surgery earlier. I sidestep two drunken infantry cadets and keep walking down the tunnel, only turning when I reach the guarded staircase that leads to my target. The guard cracks a yawn and I slip by unnoticed thanks to the increase in my signet, or whatever this is. The last time I walked these stairs, I'd just murdered everyone who stood between me and Violet. It's ironic that's the cell I ended up standing in front of now, peering through the barred window at Jack fucking Barlow. You look good, the second year says, sitting up on the reconstructed bunk and smiling. You here to dose me? Pretty sure I'm not due until tomorrow morning. What's the cure? I fold my arms across my chest. For the serum? He scoffs. The antidote? You know what I fucking mean. Shadows scurry in from the edges of the walls in his cell. Tell me what the cure is, and I won't send for the Ribestar chest that will hold you in the air until you mummify. He stands slowly, cracking his neck before he moves to the center of the room, where the chair they'd tortured Violet in had been bolted. Cures are for diseases. What we have is power. And that, dear Ryerson, is incurable. It's enviable. Bullshit. There's a way to get rid of this, I seethe. His smile grows even wider. Oh, no. There's no cure. You can never give back what's taken. You'll only hunger for more. I'd rather die than become one of you. Fear flavors the words because I feel it. The power beneath the college. The craving to sate the need for it. And yet, you just did. Jack laughs, and the sound curdles my blood. All this time, you've been convincing everyone you're the hero, and now you'll be the villain, especially in her story. Welcome to our fucked up family. Guess we're brothers now. The End This is Rebecca Soler. We hope you've enjoyed this production of Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros, narrated by Rebecca Soler with Teddy Hamilton. Recorded books are available wherever audiobooks are sold. Thank you for listening to Recorded Books. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.